Section 1 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 13 The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 1 An August Morning with Farragut by w h overend american painter painting frontispiece in eighteen sixty four admiral farragut decided to attack the city of mobile and destroy the blockade runners that infested that port early on the morning of august fifth he sailed into the bay mobile was defended by fort morgan and fort gaines several gunboats and the ram tennessee and the entrance to the harbor was closed by torpedoes and piles the union fleet sailed over the torpedoes with the loss of but one ship passed the forts dispersed the confederate vessels and forced the tennessee to surrender after a severe engagement soon after the forts invested by a land force surrendered and the port was effectually closed the desperate character of the battle may be inferred from the spirited orders given by admiral farragut when preparing for the engagement these were as follows strip your vessels and prepare for the conflict send down all your superfluous bars and rigging trice up or remove the whiskers footnote rods extending on either side of the bowsprit to spread the jib End of footnote. put up the splinter nets on the starboard side and barricade the wheel and steersman with sails and hammocks lay chains or sandbags on the deck over the machinery to resist a plunging fire hang the sheet chains over the side or make any other arrangement for security that your ingenuity may suggest it will be the object of the admiral to get as close to the fort as possible before opening fire the ships however will open fire the moment the enemy opens upon us with their chase and other guns as fast as they can be brought to bear use short fuses for the shell and shrapnel and as soon as within three or four hundred yards give them grape if one or more of the vessels be disabled their partners must carry them through if possible but if they cannot then the next astern must render the required assistance the howitzers must keep up a constant fire from the time they can reach with shrapnel until out of its range end of section one this recording is in the public domain Section 2 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The United States, Volume 2, Part 1. The Colonies Win Their Freedom. Historical Note. In the Middle States, affairs were going badly for the Continentals. In September 1777, the British won the Battle of Brandywine and captured Philadelphia. After an unsuccessful attack on the British lines at Germantown, Washington went into winter quarters at Valley Forge, where the army suffered cruelly from cold and hunger. But meanwhile, the capture of Burgoyne's army had shown Europe that the colonies were a worthy foe for the mother country, and in February 1778, France struck a blow at her ancient enemy by recognizing the United States and sending a fleet and army to aid them in their struggle for independence. After the evacuation of Philadelphia by the British in the summer of 1778, the scene of warfare shifted to the southern colonies. Here the British at first met with complete success. In 1779 and 1780, Georgia and South Carolina were overrun by their forces, and in June 1780, the American army under Gates was so badly defeated at the Battle of Camden that for some time after, the only resistance in the South was by partisan bands under such leaders as general marion in the same year benedict arnold's plot to surrender west point to the british was discovered this period was perhaps the darkest of the whole war but with the destruction of a british force at king's mountain by the backwoodsmen of carolina the tide of victory turned against the british gates was replaced by green and after a brilliant campaign the new commander succeeded in driving the british from carolina when the summer of seventeen eighty one arrived cornwallis commander of the british forces in virginia was at yorktown expecting the english ships the only force opposing him was under lafayette 
whom Cornwallis called the boy. Suddenly Washington made one of his unexpected moves and appeared before Yorktown with a large army. At the same time, a strong French fleet cut off all hope of succor from the sea. On the 19th of October, 1781, Cornwallis surrendered and the colonies were free, although it was not until September 3, 1783, that the formal treaty of peace was signed. End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 3. Congress and Valley Forge, 1777 to 1778 by john fisk the army suffered under drawbacks which were immediately traceable to the incapacity of congress just as afterwards in the war of secession the soldiers had often to pay the penalty for the sins of the politicians a single specimen of the ill-timed meddling of congress may serve as an example at one of the most critical moments of the year seventeen seventy seven congress made a complete change in the commissariat which had hitherto been efficiently managed by a single officer, Colonel Joseph Trumbull. Two commissary generals were now appointed, one of whom was to superintend the purchase and the other the issue of supplies, and the subordinate officers of the department were to be accountable, not to their superiors, but directly to Congress. This was done in spite of the earnest opposition of Washington, and the immediate result was just what he expected. Colonel Trumbull, who had been retained as commissary general for purchases being unable to do his work properly without controlling his subordinate officers soon resigned his place the department was filled up with men selected without reference to fitness and straightway fell into hopeless confusion whereby the movements of the armies were grievously crippled for the rest of the season on the twenty second of december washington was actually prevented from executing a most promising movement against general howe because two brigades had become mutinous for want of food. For three days they had gone without bread, and for two days without meat. The quartermaster's department was in no better condition. The dreadful sufferings of Washington's army at Valley Forge have called forth the pity and the admiration of historians. But the point of the story is lost, unless we realize that this misery resulted from gross mismanagement rather than from the poverty of the country. As the poor soldiers marched on the 17th of December to their winter quarters, their route could be traced on the snow by the blood that oozed from bare, frost-bitten feet. Yet at the same moment, says Gordon, hogsheads of shoes, stockings and clothing were lying at different places on the roads and in the woods, perishing for want of teams or of money to pay the teamsters. On the 23rd, Washington informed Congress that he had in camp 2,898 men unfit for duty because they are barefoot and otherwise naked. For want of blankets, many were fain to sit up all night by fires, instead of taking comfortable rest in a natural and common way. Cold and hunger daily added many to the sick list, and in the crowded hospitals, which were for the most part mere log huts or frail wigwams woven of twisted boughs, Men sometimes died for want of straw to put between themselves and the frozen ground on which they lay. In the deficiency of oxen and draught horses, gallant men volunteered to serve as beasts of burden, and yoking themselves to wagons, dragged into camp such meagre supplies as they could obtain for their sick and exhausted comrades. So great was the distress that there were times when, in case of an attack by the enemy, scarcely two thousand men could have been got under arms. When one thinks of these sad consequences wrought by a negligent quartermaster and a deranged commissariat, one is strongly reminded of the remark once made by the eccentric Charles Lee, when with caustic alliteration he described Congress as a stable of stupid cattle that stumbled at every step. End of section 3. This recording is in the public domain. Section 4 
of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Baron Steuben, Drilling the Colonial Troops at Valley Forge, by Edwin A. Abbey, American Artist, 1852. Painting, page 4. In 1777, the French government was seriously contemplating giving aid to the American colonies in their struggle for independence. It was clear that, brave as were the colonial troops, they had little organization or training, and the French sent over Baron von Steuben, one of the most experienced soldiers of Germany, to remedy this lack. Washington's little army was in winter quarters at Valley Forge, cold, hungry, and in need of everything. Drilling troops was the work of a sergeant, the English had always thought, but this honored officer took a musket in his own hands and taught them. Generals, colonels, and captains were fired by the contagion of his example and his tremendous enthusiasm, says John Fisk, and for several months the camp was converted into a training school in which masters and pupils worked with incessant and furious energy. Steuben was struck with the quickness with which the common soldiers learned their lessons. He had a harmlessly choleric temper, which was part of his overflowing vigor, and sometimes, when drilling an awkward squad, he would exhaust his stock of French and German oaths and shout for his aide to come and curse the blockheads in English. Viens, mon ami Walker, he would cry. Viens, mon bon ami. Sacre bleu. God damn the gaucherie of these badauds. Je ne puis plus. I can curse them no more. Yet, in an incredibly short time, as he afterward wrote, these awkward fellows had acquired a military air, had learned how to carry their arms, and knew how to form into columns, deploy, and execute maneuvers with precision. End of section four. This recording is in the public domain. Section five of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 5, The Message of Lydia Dara, 1777, by Elizabeth F. Ellett on the second day of december seventeen seventy seven late in the afternoon an officer in the british uniform ascended the steps of a house in second street philadelphia immediately opposite the quarters occupied by general howe who at that time had full possession of the city the house was plain and neat in its exterior and well known to be tenanted by william and lydia dara members of the society of friends it was the place chosen by the superior officers of the army for private conference whenever it was necessary to hold consultations on subjects of importance and selected perhaps on account of the unobtrusive character of its inmates whose religion inculcated meekness and forbearance and forbade them to practise the arts of war the officer who seemed familiar with the mansion knocked at the door it was opened and in the neatly furnished parlour he met the mistress who spoke to him calling him by name it was the adjutant-general and he appeared in haste to give an order this was to desire that the back room above stairs might be prepared for the reception that evening of himself and his friends who were to meet there and remain late and be sure lydia he concluded that your family are all in bed at an early hour i shall expect you to attend to this request when our guests are ready to leave the house i will myself give you notice that you may let us out and extinguish the fire and candles having delivered this order with an emphatic manner which showed that he relied much on the prudence and discretion of the person he addressed the adjutant-general departed lydia betook herself to getting all things in readiness but the words she had heard especially the injunction to retire early rang in her ears and she could not divest herself of the indefinable feeling 
that something of importance was in agitation while her hands were busy in the duties that devolved upon her her mind was no less actively at work the evening closed in and the officers came to the place of meeting lydia had ordered all her family to bed and herself admitted the guests after which she retired to her own apartment and threw herself without undressing upon the bed but sleep refused to visit her eyelids her vague apprehensions gradually assumed more definite shape she became more and more uneasy till her nervous restlessness amounted to absolute terror unable longer to resist the impulse not of curiosity but surely of a far higher feeling she slid from her bed and taking off her shoes passed noiselessly from her chamber and along the entry approaching cautiously the apartment in which the officers were assembled she applied her ear to the keyhole for a few moments she could distinguish but a word or two amid the murmur of voices yet what she did hear but stimulated her eager desire to learn the important secret of the conclave at length there was profound silence and a voice was heard reading a paper aloud it was an order for the troops to quit the city on the night of the fourth and march out to a secret attack upon the american army then encamped at white marsh lydia had heard enough she retreated softly to her own room and laid herself quietly on the bed in the deep stillness that reigned through the house she could hear the beating of her own heart the heart now throbbing with emotions to which no speech could give utterance it seemed to her that but a few moments had elapsed when there was a knocking at her door she knew well what this signal meant but took no heed it was repeated and more loudly still she gave no answer again and yet more loudly the knocks were repeated and then she rose quickly and opened the door it was the adjutant-general who came to inform her they were ready to depart lydia let them out fastened the house and extinguished the lights and fire again she returned to her chamber and to bed but repose was a stranger for the rest of the night her mind was more disquieted than ever she thought of the danger that threatened the lives of thousands of her countrymen and of the ruin that impended over the whole land something must be done and that immediately to avert this widespread destruction should she awaken her husband and inform him that would be to place him in special jeopardy by rendering him a partaker of her secret and he might too be less wary and prudent than herself no come what might she would encounter the risk alone after a petition for heavenly guidance her resolution was formed and she waited with composure though sleep was impossible till the dawn of day then she waked her husband and informed him flour was wanted for the use of the household and that it was necessary she should go to frankfort to procure it this was no uncommon occurrence and her declining the attendance of the maid-servant excited little surprise taking the bag with her she walked through the snow having stopped first at headquarters obtained access to general howe and secured his written permission to pass the british lines the feelings of a wife and mother one whose religion was that of love and whose life was but a quiet round of domestic duties bound on an enterprise so hazardous and uncertain whether her life might not be the forfeit may be better imagined than described lydia reached frankfort distant four or five miles and deposited her bag at the mill now commenced the dangers of her undertaking for she pressed forward with all haste towards the outposts of the american army her determination was to apprise general washington of the danger she was met on her way by an american officer who had been selected by general washington to gain information respecting the movements of the enemy according to some authorities this was lieutenant colonel craig of the light horse he immediately recognized her and inquired whither she was going in reply she prayed him to alight and walk with her which he did ordering his men to keep in sight 
to him she disclosed the secret after having obtained from him a solemn promise not to betray her individuality since the british might take vengeance on her and her family the officer thanked her for her timely warning and directed her to go to a house near at hand where she might get something to eat but lydia preferred returning at once and did so while the officer made all haste to the commander-in-chief preparations were immediately made to give the enemy a fitting reception with a heart lightened and filled with thankfulness the intrepid woman pursued her way homeward carrying the bag of flour which had served as the ostensible object of her journey none suspected the grave demure quakeress of having snatched from the english their anticipated victory her demeanour was as usual quiet orderly and subdued and she attended to the duties of her family with her wonted composure but her heart beat as late on the appointed night she watched from her window the departure of the army on what secret expedition bound she knew too well she listened breathlessly to the sound of their footsteps and the trampling of horses till it died away in the distance and silence reigned through the city time never appeared to pass so slowly as during the interval which elapsed between the marching out and the return of the british troops when at last the distant roll of the drum proclaimed their approach when the sounds came nearer and nearer and lydia who was watching at the window saw the troops pass in martial order the agony of anxiety she felt was too much for her strength and she retreated from her post not daring to ask a question or manifest the least curiosity as to the event a sudden and loud knocking at her door was not calculated to lessen her apprehensions she felt that the safety of her family depended on her self-possession at this critical moment the visitor was the adjutant-general who summoned her to his apartment with a pale cheek but composed for she placed her trust in a higher power lydia obeyed the summons the officer's face was clouded and his expression stern he locked the door with an air of mystery when lydia entered and motioned her to a seat after a moment of silence he said were any of your family up lydia on the night when i received company in this house no was the unhesitating reply they all retired at eight o'clock it is very strange said the officer amused a few minutes you i know lydia were asleep for i knocked at your door three times before you heard me yet it is certain that we were betrayed i am altogether at a loss to conceive who could have given the information of our intended attack to general washington on arriving near his encampment we found his cannon mounted his troops under arms and so prepared at every point to receive us that we have been compelled to march back without injuring our enemy like a parcel of fools it is not known whether the officer ever discovered to whom he was indebted for the disappointment but the pious quakeress blessed god for her preservation and rejoiced that it was not necessary for her to utter an untruth in her own defence and all who admire examples of courage and patriotism especially those who enjoy the fruit of them must honour the name of lydia dara end of section five this recording is in the public domain section six of the united states read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone molly pitcher seventeen eighty seven by kate brownlee sherwood twas hurry and scurry at monmouth town for lee was beating a wild retreat the british were riding the yankees down and panic was pressing on flying feet galloping down like a hurricane washington rode with his sword swung high mighty as he of the trojan plain fired by a courage from the sky halt and stand by the guns he cried and a bombardier made swift reply 
wheeling his comrades into the tide he fell neath the shot of a foeman nigh molly pitcher sprang to his side fired as she saw her husband do telling the king in his stubborn pride women like men to their homes are true washington rode from the bloody fray up to the gun that a woman manned molly pitcher you save the day he said as he gave her a hero's hand he named her sergeant with manly praise her war-brown face was wet with tears a woman has ever a woman's ways and the army was wild with cheers end of section six this recording is in the public domain Section 7 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 7. The Capture of Major Andre, 1780, by Jared Sparks. Benedict Arnold, a trusted officer in the Continental Army, offered for a large sum of money and a commission in the British Army to betray to the British West Point, the strongest fort on the Hudson River. Major Andre, a young British officer, was sent by the English to meet an agent of Arnold and make the final arrangements. The following extract tells the story of his capture. He was hanged as a spy, but everyone wished that the traitor Arnold could have been in his place the editor. When he, Andre, and Smith, his guide, a loyalist, separated, it seemed to have been understood that Andre would pursue the route through White Plains and thence to New York, but after crossing Pines Bridge he changed his mind and took what was called the Tarrytown Road. He was probably induced to this step by the remarks he had heard the evening before from Captain Boyd, who said the lower party had been far up the Tarrytown Road, and it was dangerous to proceed that way. As the lower party belonged to the British, and Andre would of course be safe in their hands, it was natural for him to infer that he should be among friends sooner in that direction than in the other. A law of the state of New York authorized any person to seize and convert to his own use all cattle or beef that should be driven or removed from the country in the direction of the city beyond a certain line in Westchester County. By military custom, also, the personal effects of prisoners taken by small parties were assigned to the captors as a prize. It happened that on the same morning on which Andre crossed Pines Bridge, seven persons who resided near Hudson River on the neutral ground agreed voluntarily to go out in company armed, watch the road, and intercept any suspicious stragglers or droves of cattle that might be seen passing toward New York. Four of this party were stationed on a hill, where they had a view of the road for a considerable distance. The three others, named John Paulding, David Williams, and Isaac Van Wart, were concealed in the bushes at another place and very near the road. About a half mile north of the village of Tarrytown, and a few hundred yards from the bank of Hudson River, the road crosses a small brook, from each side of which the ground rises into a hill, and it was at that time covered over with trees and underbrush. Eight or ten rods south of this brook, and on the west side of the road, these men were hidden, and at that point Andre was stopped, after having traveled from Pines Bridge without interruption. The particulars of this event I shall here introduce, as they are narrated in the testimony given by Paulding and Williams at Smith's trial, written down at the time by the judge advocate, and preserved in manuscript among other papers. This testimony having been taken only eleven days after the capture of Andre, when every circumstance must have been fresh in the recollection of his captors, it may be regarded as exhibiting a greater exactness in its details than any account hitherto published. In answer to the question of the court, Paulding said, Myself, Isaac Van Wart, and David Williams were lying by the side of the road about half a mile above Tarrytown, and about fifteen miles above Kingsbridge, on Saturday morning between nine and ten o'clock, the 23rd of September. We had lain there about an hour and a half, as near as I can recollect, 
and saw several persons we were acquainted with whom we let pass presently one of the young men who were with me said there comes a gentleman-like looking man who appears to be well dressed and has boots on and you would better step out and stop if you don't know him on that i got up and presented my firelock at the breast of the person and told him to stand and then i asked him which way he was going gentlemen said he i hope you belong to our party i asked him what party he said the lower party upon that i told him i did then he said i am a british officer out of the country on particular business and i hope you will not detain me a minute and to show that he was a british officer he pulled out his watch upon which i told him to dismount he then said my god i must do anything to get along and seemed to make a kind of laugh of it and pulled out general arnold's pass which was to john anderson to pass all guards to white plains and below upon that he dismounted said he gentlemen you'd best let me go or you'll bring yourselves into trouble for your stopping me will detain the general's business and said he was going to dobbs ferry to meet a person there and get intelligence for general arnold upon that i told him i hoped he would not be offended that we did not mean to take anything from him and i told him there were many bad people who were going along the road and i did not know but perhaps he might be one when further questioned paulding replied that he asked the person his name who told him it was john anderson and that when anderson produced general arnold's pass he should have let him go if he had not before called himself a british officer paulding also said that when the person pulled out his watch he understood it as a signal that he was a british officer and that he meant to offer it to him as a present all these particulars were substantially confirmed by david williams whose testimony in regard to the searching of andre being more unique than paulding's is here inserted we took him into the bushes said williams and ordered him to pull off his clothes which he did but on searching him narrowly we could not find any sort of writings we told him to pull off his boots which he seemed to be indifferent about but we got one boot off and searched in that boot and could find nothing but we found there were some papers in the bottom of the stocking next to his foot on which we made him pull his stocking off and found three papers wrapped up mr paulding looked at the contents and said he was a spy we then made him pull off his other boot and there we found three more papers at the bottom of his foot within his stocking upon this we made him dress himself and i asked him what he would give us to let him go he said he would give us any sum of money i asked him whether he would give us his horse saddle bridle watch and one hundred guineas he said yes and told us he would direct them to any place even if it was that very spot so that we could get them i asked him whether he would not give us more he said he would give us any quantity of dry goods or any sum of money and bring it to any place that we might pitch upon so that we might get it mr paulding answered no if you would give us one thousand guineas you should not stir one step i then asked the person who had called himself john anderson if he would not get away if it lay in his power he answered yes i would i told him i did not intend he should while taking him along we asked him a few questions and we stopped under a shade he begged us not to ask him questions and said when he came to any commander he would reveal all he was dressed in a blue overcoat and a tight body coat that was of a kind of claret color though a rather deeper red than claret the buttonholes were laced with gold tinsel and the buttons drawn over with the same kind of lace he had on a round hat and nankeen waistcoat and breeches with a flannel waistcoat and drawers boots and thread stockings the nearest military post was at north castle where lieutenant colonel jameson was stationed with a part of sheldon's regiment of dragoons to that place it was resolved to take the prisoner and within a few hours he was delivered up to jameson with all the papers that had been taken from his boots end of section seven this recording is in the public domain Recording by Colleen McMahon Section 8 of The United States This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan section eight a visit to general marion seventeen eighty one by charles carleton coffin 
General Marion was north of Charleston, not far from the Santee River, when a British officer came with a flag of truce to see him about exchanging prisoners, and was taken into the camp blindfolded. The officer had heard much about Marion, and instead of finding, as he had expected, a man of noble presence in an elegant uniform, he saw a small, thin man in homespun clothes. Around were Marion's soldiers, some of them almost naked, some in British uniforms which they had captured, a motley set with all kinds of weapons, large muskets, rifles, shotguns, swords made by country blacksmiths from mill saws. The business upon which the officer had come was soon settled. Shall I have the honor of your company to dinner? said Marion. The officer saw no preparation for dinner. A fire was burning, but there were no camp kettles, no Dutch ovens, no cooking utensils. Give us our dinner, Tom, said Marion to one of his men. Tom was the cook. He dug open the fire with a stick and poked out a fine mess of sweet potatoes. He pricked the large ones to see if they were done, blew the ashes from them, wiped them on his shirt sleeve, placed the best ones on a piece of bark, and laid them on the log between Marion and the officer. I fear our dinner will not prove so palatable to you as I could wish, but it is the best we have, said Marion. The British officer was a gentleman and ate of the potatoes, but soon began to laugh. I was thinking, he said, what some of my brother officers would say if our government were to give such a bill of fare as this. I suppose this is only an accidental dinner. Not so, for often we don't get even this. Though stinted in provisions, you of course draw double pay. Not a cent, sir. We don't have any pay. We are fighting for our liberty. The officer was astonished. They had a long and friendly talk, and the officer, bidding Marion goodbye, went back to Georgetown. Colonel Watson was in command of the British there. What makes you look so serious? Colonel Watson asked. I have cause to look serious, the officer replied. Has Marion refused to treat? No, sir, but I have seen an American general and his officers, without pay, almost without clothes, living on roots and drinking water, and all for liberty. What chance have we against such men? The officer was so impressed by what he had seen that he could fight no more but disposed of his commission and returned to England. General Green sent Marion and Lee south to get between the British and Charleston and cut off their supplies. They marched to Fort Watson, a strong fortification on the east bank of the Santee River, about 50 miles north of Charleston. It was built of logs, stood on a hill, and was garrisoned by 120 men commanded by Lieutenant McKay. They sent him a message to surrender, but he was a brave officer, and informed them that he intended to defend the fort. He knew that Lord Rawdon would soon be there to aid him with several hundred men. Marion and Lee knew that Lord Rawdon was on the march, and they resolved to capture the fort before he arrived. They saw that there was no well in the fort, and that the garrison had to come out and creep down to the river to obtain water. The riflemen soon stopped that. Then McKay set his men at work digging a well and carried it down to the level of the lake and had a good supply of water. Lee and Marion knew that there was a large amount of supplies inside the fort, for besides what was inside, there were boxes and barrels outside. Some of the militia tried to creep up and get a barrel, but the garrison killed one and wounded another. A brave negro named Billy, with Marion, looked at the supplies, saw that one of the hogsheads was only a few feet from the edge of the bluff, and resolved to try what he could do. He crept very near without being seen. Then, before the British could fire upon him, he was crouched behind the hogshead. The ground was a declivity, and soon the British soldiers saw that the hogshead was in motion. They fired at it, but they could only see some black fingers clasping the chims, and in a few minutes the hogshead disappeared down the hill. Billy obtained an axe, broke open the hogshead, and found that he had captured 150 shirts, 100 knapsacks, 50 blankets, and 6 cloaks. He distributed them to the soldiers, many of whom had no shirts. Marion named the Negro Captain Billy, and everyone treated the brave fellow with great respect. Rawdon was close at hand. Marion and Lee could see the light of his campfires on the hills in the west. Whatever was done must be done quickly. But what could they do? They had no cannon, and even if they had, they could not batter down the fort. But a brighter thought came to Colonel Mahan, to build a tower which would overlook the fortification. As soon as night came, all the axes in the camp were in use. The British could hear the choppers and wondered what was going on. 
but they were astonished in the morning when they saw a tower higher than the fort and a swarm of men on the top firing through loopholes and picking off with their rifles every man who showed his head above the parapet lord rawdon had not come and lieutenant mackay saw that he would soon lose all his men and that he must surrender before noon the americans were in possession of the fort and all its supplies end of section eight this recording is in the public domain recording by colleen mcmahon section nine of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita boutros the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section nine when cornwallis surrendered seventeen eighty one by burton egbert stevenson spring and summer sped by quietly enough with much visiting back and forth but one crisp morning in early october our neighbor of berkeley rode up to our door and plunged at once into the heart of the business which had brought him you know i suppose mrs randolph he began that that old fox cornwallis is caught at last at yorktown and must soon surrender yes thank god said my mother "'Twill be such a sight as may never again be witnessed in America. "'I am going to take my boy to see it, "'and I should be glad to have yours too if you'll let him go.' "'Oh, mother!' I cried. "'She looked at us a moment with frightened eyes. "'Take my boy into the midst of the fighting?' she protested. "'Oh, not so bad as that, madam,' laughed Mr. Harrison. "'We will view it all from a perfectly safe distance. "'I will answer for that. "'May he go?' I think his good humor and courtesy, as much as the passionate pleading in my eyes, won her over. "'Would you like to go, Stuart?' she asked, and I knew from her look that she consented. "'Right, madam,' cried our visitor heartily, as I threw my arms about her. "'You are right not to deny the boy.' My cup of happiness was full to overflowing, and as we rolled away that afternoon in the great Harrison coach, I fear it was only my mother who wept at parting. That was an enchanted journey down the peninsula, and I was almost sorry that it had come to an end when, toward evening of the second day, we rumbled up to Oldham, Mr. Samuel Harrison's place, some few miles above Yorktown on the river such a sight as awaited us the next morning when we were led forth to view the contending armies from the top of a little hill near the bank of the york which the french had evacuated the day before in their advance we could see a great part of their position quite clearly on the right were our troops with the artillery in the centre near the commander's quarters there the french lines began artillery first and then the infantry stretching to the very bank of the river below us away in the distance we could dimly see the british works closely girdling the little town and still beyond this a half dozen british men-of-war lay anchored in the stream far out on the bay we could just discern the white sails of the blockading squadron of french ships mr harrison pointed out to us how our troops were ever creeping nearer and nearer to the british works but he had more important things to do so he left us presently confiding us to the care of old shad and warning us not to leave the hillock where we were stationed we had small wish to do so and we sat for hours looking at the scene until suddenly away on the right the artillery began to thunder the fire ran along the line until every battery american and french alike was pouring shot and shell into the british works as fast as the sweating men could serve the guns the enemy replied but feebly and after a time fell silent altogether a dense cloud of smoke settled over the ramparts and was carried slowly out to sea where it lay banked against the horizon like a great thunder-cloud we ate the lunch that shad had brought for us and spent the afternoon watching the cannonading 
Mr. Harrison came back to us as evening fell, but we tarried where we were with no thought of dinner, for the French battery near the river had opened upon the British ships with red-hot ball, and presently we saw one of them wrapped in a torrent of flame. The fire spread with amazing speed, running along the rigging and to the very tops of the mass, while all around was thunder and lightning from the cannon. Even as we gazed, there came a blinding flash of flame that rent the ship asunder, and ten seconds later a mighty roar, which told us the fire had reached the magazine. The blazing fragments fell back one by one into the river and disappeared. "'Come, boys, we must be going,' said Mr. Harrison at last, and we followed him, awed and silent." Another British ship was set in flames next day, and in the three days that followed we could see our soldiers working like beavers in the trenches, which advanced every hour nearer the enemy. Meanwhile all Virginia had come to see the spectacle, and on the morning of the 17th was gathered in a great throng exultantly watching the work of our batteries, when of a sudden the firing ceased. A murmur of anxiety ran through the crowd. "'What is it? What has happened?' asked everyone, looking fearfully into his neighbor's face. "'Could it be that, after all, the prize was to escape? "'Some thought that the munitions had run out, "'some that the French ships had been driven away, "'and a great force under Clinton landed. "'But presently came word that Cornwallis had had enough "'and asked a parley. What joy there was that night at every board within reach of the good news, and in what mighty bumpers did loyal Virginia drink the health of the first of Virginians and his men. How shall I describe the stirring spectacle which took place next afternoon? To the right of the Hampton Road, the Patriot Army was drawn up, veterans of six years' service, with torn and faded regimentals, while to the left facing them were the French, brilliant as toy soldiers. Down the road for more than a mile stretched this living avenue. Presently there broke forth a great storm of cheering, and I saw the tears rolling unchecked down Mr. Harrison's face as he gazed at a man sitting a white charger, riding slowly along the line. "'Tis the general,' he whispered. "'This is his hour of triumph and reward.' God knows how he has earned it. Near him, on a great bay horse, rode General Rochambeau, gorgeous in white and gold. He was, no doubt, a gallant soldier, and great general, but there was something in the quiet dignity of the other which caught and held the eye, which fired the imagination, which needed no ornament to set it forth. Men and women sobbed aloud as they saw him there that day, and cheered between their sobs like mad things, and thanked the God that had given him to America. Then a great silence fell upon the crowd. There came the beat of a drum from the British line, and the conquered troops marched slowly out of their entrenchments, seven thousand of them and more, their colors cased, their arms reversed. Colors and arms alike were surrendered to the victors, while the regimental bands played a quaint old air, forgot these many years, the world turned upside down. End of section 9 This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of the United States This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 10. George III Acknowledges the Independence of the Colonies. 1782. By Elkanah Watson. Soon after my arrival in England, having won at the insurance office one hundred guineas, on the event of Lord Howe's relieving Gibraltar, and dining the same day with Copley, the distinguished painter, who was a Bostonian by birth, I determined to devote the sum to a splendid portrait of myself. 
the painting was finished in most admirable style except the background which copley and i designed to represent a ship bearing to america the intelligence of the acknowledgment of independence with a sun just rising upon the stripes of the union streaming from her gaff all was complete save the flag which copley did not deem prudent to hoist under present circumstances as his gallery is a constant resort of the royal family and the nobility i dined with the artist on the glorious fifth of december seventeen eighty two after listening with him to the speech of the king formally recognizing the united states of america as in the rank of nations previous to dining and immediately after our return from the house of lords he invited me into his studio and there with a bold hand a master's touch and i believe an american heart attached to the ship the stars and stripes this was i imagine the first american flag hoisted in old england at an early hour on the fifth of december seventeen eighty two in conformity with previous arrangements i was conducted by the earl of ferrers to the very entrance of the house of lords at the door he whispered get as near the throne as you can fear nothing i did so and found myself exactly in front of it elbow to elbow with the celebrated admiral lord howe the lords were promiscuously standing as i entered it was a dark and foggy day and the windows being elevated and constructed in the antiquated style with leaden bars to contain the diamond-cut panes of glass increased the gloom the walls were hung with dark tapestry representing the defeat of the spanish armada i had the pleasure of recognizing in the crowd of spectators copley and west the painter with some american ladies i saw also some dejected american royalists in the group after waiting nearly two hours the approach of the king was announced by a tremendous roar of artillery he entered by a small door on the left of the throne and immediately seated himself upon the chair of state in a graceful attitude with his right foot resting upon a stool he was clothed in royal robes apparently agitated he drew from his pocket the scroll containing his speech the commons were summoned and after the bustle of their entrance had subsided he proceeded to read his speech i was near the king and watched with intense interest every tone of his voice and expression of his countenance after some general and usual remarks he continued i lost no time in giving the necessary orders to prohibit the further prosecution of offensive war upon the continent of north america adopting as my inclination will always lead me to do with decision and effect whatever i collect to be the sense of my parliament and my people i have pointed all my views and measures in europe as in north america to an entire and cordial reconciliation with the colonies finding it indispensable to the attainment of this object i did not hesitate to go to the full length of the powers vested in me and offer to declare them here he paused and was in evident agitation either embarrassed in reading his speech by the darkness of the room or affected by a very natural emotion in a moment he resumed and offer to declare them free and independent states in thus admitting their separation from the crown of these kingdoms i have sacrificed every consideration of my own to the wishes and opinions of my people i make it my humble and ardent prayer to almighty god that great britain may not feel the evils which might result from so great a dismemberment of the empire and that america may be free from the calamities which have formerly proved in the mother country how essential monarchy is to the enjoyment of constitutional liberty religion language 
interests, and affection may, and I hope will, yet prove a bond of permanent union between the two countries. It is remarked that George the Third is celebrated for reading his speeches in a distinct, free, and impressive manner. On this occasion he was evidently embarrassed. He hesitated, choked, and executed the painful duties of the occasion with an ill grace that does not belong to him. I cannot adequately portray my sensations in the progress of this address. Every artery beat high and swelled with my proud American blood. It was impossible not to revert to the opposite shores of the Atlantic, and to review, in my mind's eye, the misery and woe I had myself witnessed in several stages of the contest, and the widespread desolation resulting from the stubbornness of this very king, now so prostrate, but who had turned a deaf ear to our humble and importunate petitions for relief, Yet I believe that George the Third acted under what he felt to be the high and solemn claims of constitutional duty. The great drama was now closed. The Battle of Lexington exhibited its first scene. The Declaration of Independence was a lofty and glorious event in its progress, and the ratification of our independence by the King consummated the spectacle in triumph and exultation. This successful issue of the American Revolution will in all probability influence eventually the destinies of the whole human race. End of section 10. This recording is in the public domain. Section 11 of the United States this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 11. When Washington Resigned His Commission. 1783. By R. M. Devins. For the last time he assembled them, his soldiers, at Newburgh, when he rode out on the field, and gave them one of those paternal addresses which so eminently characterized his relationship with his army. To the tune of Roslyn Castle, the soldier's dirge, his brave comrades passed slowly by their great leader, and filed away to their respective homes. It was a thrilling scene. There were gray-headed soldiers who had grown old by hardships and exposures, and too old to begin life anew. Tears coursed freely the furrowed cheeks of these veterans. Among the thousands passing in review before him were those, also, who had done valorous service when the destiny of the country hung tremblingly in the balance. As Washington looked upon them for the last time, he said, I am growing old in my country's service, and losing my sight, but I never doubted its justice or gratitude. Even on the rudest and roughest of the soldiery, the effect of his parting language was irresistible. On the 4th of December, 1783, by Washington's request, his officers in full uniform assembled in Francis Tavern, New York, to take a final leave of their commander-in-chief. On entering the room and finding himself surrounded by his old companions in arms, who had shared with him so many scenes of hardship, difficulty, and danger, his agitated feelings overcame his usual self-command. Every man arose with eyes turned towards him. Filling a glass of wine and lifting it to his lips, he rested his benignant but saddened countenance upon them, and said, With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous as your former ones have been honorable and glorious. Having drunk, he added, 
I cannot come to each of you to take my leave, but shall be obliged to you if each of you will come and take me by the hand. A profound silence followed, as each officer gazed on the countenance of their leader, while the eyes of all were wet with tears. He then expressed again his desire that each of them should come and take him by the hand. The first being nearest to him was General Knox, who grasped his hand in silence, and both embraced each other without uttering a word. One after another followed, receiving and returning the affectionate adieu of their commander, after which he left the room in silence, followed by his officers in procession, to embark in the barge that was to convey him to Paulus Hook, now Jersey City. As he was passing through, the light infantry drawn up on either side to receive him. An old soldier, who was by his side on the terrible night of his march to Trenton, stepped out from the ranks, and reaching out his arms, exclaimed, "'Farewell, my dear General, farewell!' Washington seized his hand most heartily, when the soldiers forgot all discipline, rushed toward their chief, and bathed him with their tears." The scene was like that of a good patriarch taking leave of his children, and going on a long journey from whence he might return no more. Having entered the barge, he turned to the weeping company upon the wharf, and waving his hat, bade them a silent adieu. They stood with heads uncovered, until the barge was hidden from their view, when, in silent and solemn procession, they returned to the place where they had assembled. Congress was at this time in session at Annapolis, Maryland, to which place Washington now proceeded, greeted along his whole route with enthusiastic homage, for the purpose of formally resigning his commission. He arrived on the 19th of December, 1783, and the next day he informed Congress of the purpose for which he had come, and requested to know whether it would be their pleasure that he should offer his resignation in writing or at an audience. A committee was appointed by Congress, and it was decided that on Tuesday, December 23rd, the ceremonial should take place. When the hour arrived, the President, General Mifflin, informed him that that body was prepared to receive his communications. With a native dignity, heightened by the solemnity of the occasion, the General rose. In a brief and appropriate speech, he offered his congratulations on the termination of the war, and having alluded to his object in appearing thus in that presence, that he might resign into the hands of Congress the trust committed to him, and claim the indulgence of retiring from the public service. He concluded with those affecting words which drew tears from the eyes of all in that vast assembly. I consider it an indispensable duty to close this last act of my official life by commending the interests of our dearest country to the protection of Almighty God, and those who have the superintendence of them to His holy keeping. Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the theatre of action, and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body, under whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission, and take my leave of all the employments of public life. After advancing to the chair, and delivering his commission to the President, he returned to his place and remained standing, while General Mifflin replied, reviewing the great career thus brought to a close, and saying in conclusion, The glory of your virtues will not terminate with your military command. It will continue to animate the remotest ages. We join with you in commending the interest of our country to Almighty God, beseeching Him to dispose the hearts and minds of its citizens to improve the opportunity afforded them of becoming a happy and respectful nation. And for you we address to Him our warmest prayers, that a life so beloved may be fostered with all His care, 
that your days may be as happy as they have been illustrious, and that he will finally give you that reward which this world cannot bestow. End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Section 12 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The United States, Volume 2, Part 2. Life in Revolutionary Days. Historical Note. At the commencement of the Revolution, the colonists of America were husbandmen, merchants, mechanics, and fishermen, who were occupied in the ordinary duties of their respective callings, and were sober, honest, and industrious. But when the struggle for independence began, new fields for exertion were opened, and a great change was suddenly wrought in the American people. Many who were before only known in the humble sphere of peaceful occupations soon shone forth in the cabinet or in the field. The war, too, did much to wear away local peculiarities and prejudices. But the revolution introduced at the same time greater looseness of manners and morals. An army always carries deep vices in its train, and communicates its corruption to society around it. Besides this, the failure of public credit so far put it out of the power of individuals to perform private engagements, that the breach of them became common, and at length were scarcely disgraceful. Education suffered in common with other kindred interests. In several colleges the course of instruction was suspended, the hall was exchanged for the camp, and the gown for the sword and epaulette. After the war, interest in education revived, and before the end of the period several colleges and other institutions of learning were established in different sections of the country. During the war the commerce of the United States was suppressed, but it revived on the return of peace. Arts and manufactures made considerable progress in the United States during this period. Cut off by the war from foreign sources of supply, the people of the United States had been obliged to look to their own industry and ingenuity to furnish articles needed in the struggle and for the usual occupations of life. On the return of peace, many branches of manufacture had become so firmly established that they held their ground, even against the excessive importations that immediately followed. Agriculture was greatly interrupted during the war by the withdrawing of laborers to the camp, and by the distractions which disturbed all the occupations of society. But within a few years after peace was established, the exports of products raised in the United States were again considerable. Charles A. Goodrich End of section 12 This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 13. The Mescianza at Philadelphia. 1778 by John F. Watson. The British spent the winter of 1777 to 78 in Philadelphia. To pass the time, they gave balls and other entertainments. The most noted of these was the Mescianza, the editor. This is the appellation of the most splendid pageant ever exhibited in our country. Footnote. This was written in 1843, end footnote, if we accept the great federal procession of all trades and professions through the streets of Philadelphia in 1788. The Mescianza was chiefly a tilt and tournament with other entertainments, as the term implies, and was given on Monday the 18th of May 1778 at Wharton's country seat in Southwark, by the officers of General Sir William Howe's army to that officer on his quitting the command to return to England. A considerable number of our city bells were present, which gave considerable offence afterwards to the Whigs, and did not fail to mark the fair as the Tory ladies. The ill nature and the reproach have long since been forgotten. 
the company began to assemble at three to four o'clock at Knight's Wharf, at the water edge of Green Street in the Northern Liberties, and by half past four o'clock in the afternoon, the whole were embarked in the pleasant month of May in a grand regatta of three divisions. In the front of the whole were three flatboats, with a band of music in each of them, rowed regular to harmony. At this assemblage of vessels progressed barges rowed on the flanks. Light skimming stretched their oary wings to keep off the multitude of boats that crowded from the city as beholders, and the houses, balconies, and wharves were filled with spectators all along the river sides. When arrived at the fort below the Swedes Church, they formed a line through an avenue of grenadiers and light horse in the rear. The company were thus conducted to a square lawn of 150 yards on each side, and which was also lined with troops. This area formed the ground for a tilt or tournament. On the front seat of each pavilion were placed seven of the principal young ladies of the country, dressed in Turkish habits, and wearing in their turbans the articles which they intended to bestow on their several gallant knights. Soon the trumpets at a distance announced the approach of the seven white knights, habited in white and red silk, and mounted on grey chargers, richly caparisoned in similar colours. These were followed by their several esquires on foot. Besides these there was a herald in his robe, these all made the circuit of the square, saluting the ladies as they passed, and then they ranged in line with their ladies. Then their herald, Mr. Beaumont, after a flourish of trumpets, proclaimed their challenge in the name of the Knights of the Blended Rose, declaring that the ladies of their order excelled in wit, beauty, and accomplishments those of the whole world, and that they are ready to enter the lists against any knights who will deny the same, according to the laws of ancient chivalry. At the third repetition of the challenge, a sound of trumpets announced the entrance of another herald, with four trumpeters dressed in black and orange. The two heralds held a parley when the black knight proceeded to proclaim his defiance in the name of the Knights of the Burning Mountain, then retiring there soon after entered the Black Knights, with their esquires, preceded by the herald, on whose tunic was represented a mountain, sending forth flames, and the motto, I burn forever. These seven knights, like the former ones, rode round the lists, and made their obeisance to the ladies, and then drew up fronting the white knights, and the chief of these having thrown down his gauntlet, the chief of the black knights directed his esquire to take it up. Then the knights received their lances from their esquires, fixing their shields on their left arms, and making a general salute to each other by movement of their lances, turned round to take their career, and encountering in full gallop, shivered their spears. In the second and third encounter they discharged their pistols. In the fourth they fought with their swords. From the garden they ascended a flight of steps covered with carpets, which led into a spacious hall, the panels of which were painted in imitation of Siena marble, enclosing festoons of white marble. In this hall and the adjoining apartments were prepared tea, lemonade, etc., to which the company seated themselves. At this time the knights came in, and on their knee received their favours from their respective ladies. From these apartments they went up to a ballroom, decorated in a light, elegant style of painting, and showing many festoons of flowers. The brilliancy of the whole was heightened by eighty-five mirrors, decked with ribbons and flowers, and in the intermediate spaces were thirty-four branches. On the same floor were four drawing-rooms, with sideboards of refreshments decorated and lighted in the style of the ballroom. The ball was opened by the knights and their ladies, and the dances continued till ten o'clock, when the windows were thrown open, and a magnificent bouquet of rockets began the fireworks. These were planned by Captain Montresor, the chief engineer, 
and consisted of twenty different displays in great variety and beauty, and changing General Howe's arch into a variety of shapes and devices. At twelve o'clock midnight, supper was announced, and large folding doors, before concealed, sprung open and discovered a magnificent saloon of two hundred and ten feet by forty feet, and twenty-two feet in height, with three alcoves on each side, which served for sideboards. The sides were painted with vine leaves and festoon flowers, and fifty-six large pier glasses, ornamented with green silk artificial flowers and ribbons. There were also one hundred branches trimmed, and eighteen lustres of twenty-four lights hung from the ceiling. There were three hundred wax tapers on the supper tables, four hundred and thirty covers, and twelve hundred dishes. There were twenty-four black slaves in oriental dresses, with silver collars and bracelets. Towards the close of the banquet, the herald with his trumpeters entered and announced the king and the royal family's health with other toasts. Each toast was followed by a flourish of music. After the supper, the company returned to the ballroom and continued to dance until four o'clock in the morning. I omit to describe the two arches, but they were greatly embellished. They had two fronts in the Tuscan order. The pediment of one was adorned with naval trophies, and the other with military ones. Major André, who wrote a description of it, although his name is concealed, calls it the most splendid entertainment ever given by an army to its general. The whole expense was borne by twenty-two field officers. The managers were Sir John Rottlesby, Colonel O'Hara, Majors Gardiner and Montressor. This splendid pageant blazed out in one short night. Next day the enchantment was dissolved, and in exactly one month all these knights and the whole army chose to make their march from the city of Philadelphia. When I think of the few survivors of that gay scene who now exist, of some whose sprightliness and beauty are gone, I cannot but feel a gloom succeed the recital of the fate. I think, for instance, of one who was then the queen of the Meschianza, since Mrs. L, now blind and fast waning from the things that be, to her I am indebted for many facts of illustration. She tells me that the unfortunate Major André was the charm of the company. Lieutenant André, his esquire, was his brother, a youth of about nineteen, possessing the promise of an accomplished gentleman. Major André and Captain Oliver de Lancy painted themselves the chief of the decorations. The Siena marble, for instance, on the apparent side walls, was on canvas, in the style of stage scene painting. André also painted the scenes used at the theatre, at which the British officers performed. The proceeds were given to the widows and orphans of their soldiers. The waterfall scene, drawn by him, was still in the building when it lately burnt. She assures me that, of all that was borrowed for the entertainment, nothing was injured or lost. They desired to pay double if accidents occurred. The general deportment of the officers was praiseworthy therein. There were no ladies of British officers, save Miss Ochmuty, the new bride of Captain Montresor. The American young ladies present were not numerous, not exceeding fifty. The others were married ladies. Most of our ladies had gone from the city, and what remained were, of course, in great demand. The American gentlemen present were aged non-combatants. Our young men were Whigs generally, and were absent. No offence was offered to the ladies afterwards for their acceptance of this instance of an enemy's hospitality. When the Americans returned, they got up a great ball to be given to the officers of the French army and to the American officers of Washington's command. When the managers came to invite their guests, it was made a question whether the Mesquianza ladies should be invited. It was found they could not make up their company without them. They were therefore included. When they came, they looked differently habited from those who had gone to the country, they having assumed the high headdress, etc., of the British fashion. And so the characters, unintentionally, were immediately perceived at a glance through the hall. 
but lots being cast for partners, they were soon fully intermixed, and conversation ensued as if nothing of jealousy had ever existed, and all umbrage was forgotten. End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 14. A New England Thanksgiving Dinner in 1779. By Juliana Smith. Dear Cousin Betsy, when Thanksgiving Day was approaching, our dear Grandmother Smith, nay Jerusha Mother, great-granddaughter of the Reverend Richard Mother of Dorchester, Massachusetts, who is sometimes a little desponding of spirit, as you well know, did her best to persuade us that it would be better to make it a day of fasting and prayer, in view of the wickedness of our friends, etc., the vileness of our enemies. I am sure you can hear Grandmother say that, and see her shake her cup border. But indeed there was some occasion for her remarks, for our resistance to an unjust authority has cost our beautiful coast towns very dear, the last year, and all of us have had much to suffer. But my dear father brought her to a more proper frame of mind, so that by the time the day came she was ready to enjoy it almost as well as Grandmother Worthington did, and she, you will remember, always sees the bright side. In the meanwhile, we had all of us been working hard to get all things in readiness to do honour to the day. This year it was Uncle Simeon's turn to have the dinner at his house, but of course we all helped them as they helped us when it is our turn, and there is always enough for us all to do. All the baking of pies and cakes was done at our house, and we had the big oven heated and filled twice, each day, for three days, before it was all done, and everything was good, though we did have to do without some things that ought to be used. Neither love nor money could buy raisins, but our good red cherries dried without the pits did almost as well, and happily Uncle Simeon still had some spices in store. The tables were set in the dining hall, and even that big room had no space to spare when we were all seated. The servants had enough ado to get around the table and serve us all without oversetting things. There were our two grandmothers side by side. They are always handsome old ladies, but now many thought they were handsomer than ever and happy they were able to look around upon so many of their descendants. Uncle and Aunt Simeon preside at one table, and father and mother at the other. Besides us, five boys and girls, there were two of the Gales and three Elmers, besides James Brown and Ephraim Coles. We had them at our table, because they could be best supervised there. Most of the students had gone to their own homes for the weeks, but Mr. Skiff and Mr. Blank were too far away from their homes. They sat at Uncle Simeon's table, and so did Uncle Paul and his family, five of them in all, and cousins Finn and Paul. Then there were six of the Livingston family next door. They had never seen a Thanksgiving dinner before, having been used to keep Christmas Day instead, as is the wont in New York and Province. Then there were four old ladies who have no longer homes or children of their own, and so came to us. They were invited by my mother, but uncle and Aunt Simeon wished it so. Of course, we could have no roast beef. None of us have tasted beef this three years back, as it all must go to the army, and too little they get, poor fellows. But my quittimost hunters were able to get us a fine red deer, so that we had a good haunch of venison on each table. These were balanced by huge chines of roast pork at the other ends of the table. Then there was on one a big roast turkey, and on the other a goose, and two big pigeon pasties. Then there was an abundance of good vegetables of all the old sorts, and one which I do not believe you have yet seen. Uncle Simeon had imported the seed from England just before the war began, and only this year was there enough for table use. It is called celery, and you eat it without cooking. It is very good served with meats. Next year, Uncle Simeon says he will be able to raise enough to give us all some. 
It has to be taken up, roots and all, and buried in earth in the cellar, through the winter, and only pulling up some when you want it to use. Our mince pies were good, although we had to use dried cherries, as I told you, and the meat was shoulder of venison instead of beef. The pumpkin pies, apple tarts, and the big Indian puddings lacked for nothing save appetites by the time we had to get around to them. Of course we had no wine. Uncle Simeon has still a cask or two, but it must all be saved for the sick, and indeed for those who are well, good cider is a sufficient substitute. There was no plum pudding, but a boiled suet pudding, stirred thick with dried plums and cherries, was called by the old name and answered the purpose. All the other spice had been used in the mince pies, so for this pudding we used a jar of West India preserved ginger which chanced to be left of the last shipment which Uncle Simeon had from there. We chopped the ginger small and stirred it through with the plums and cherries. It was extraordinary good. The day was bitter cold, and when we got home from meeting, which father did not keep over long by reason of the cold, we were glad enough of the fire in uncle's dining room, but by the time the dinner was one half over, those of us who were on the fireside of one table was forced to get up and carry our plates with us around to the far side of the other table, while those who had sat there were glad to bring their plates around to the fireside to get warm all but the old ladies who had a screen put behind their chairs uncle simeon was in his best mood and you know how good that is he kept both tables in a roar of laughter with his droll stories of the days when he was studying medicine in edinburgh and afterwards he and father and uncle paul joined in singing hymns and ballads you know how fine their voices go together then we all sang a hymn and afterwards my dear father led us in prayer remembering all absent friends before the throne of grace and much i wished that my dear betsy was here as one of us as she has been of yore we did not rise from the table until it was quite dark and when the dishes had been cleared away we all got around the fire as close as we could and cracked nuts and sang songs and told stories at least some told and others listened you know nobody can exceed the two grandmothers at telling tales of all the things they have seen themselves and repeating those of the early years in new england and even some in the old england which they had heard in their youth from their elders my father says it is a goodly custom to hand down all worthy deeds and traditions from father to son as the israelites were commanded to do about the passover and as the indians here have always done because the word that is spoken is remembered longer than the one what is written brother jack who did not reach here until late on wednesday though he left the college very early on monday morning and rode with all due diligence considering the snow brought an orange to each of the grandmothers but alas they were frozen in his saddle-bags we soaked the frost out in cold water but i guess they was not as good as they should have been End of section 14。section 15 of the United States。read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter。A call on Lady Washington in 1780 by Charles D. Platt。O Lady Martha Washington has come to Morristown, and we must go and quickly so each in her finest gown, and call at Colonel Ford's to see that dame of high renown. So spake the dames of Hanover, and put on their array, of silks to wit, and all that's fit to grace a gala day, and called on Lady Washington in raiment bright and gay. Those were the days of scarcity in all our stricken land, when hardships tried the countryside, want was on every hand when they called on Lady Washington in fine attire so grand. And don't you think we found her with a speckled homespun apron on, with knitting in hand, that lady so grand, that stately Lady Washington, when we came to Morristown that day with all our finest fixins on? She welcomed us right graciously, and then, quite at her ease, she makes the glancing needles fly as nimbly as you please. And so we found this courtly dame as busy as two bees. 
for while our gallant soldiers bear the brunt of war quoth she it is not right that we delight in costly finery so spake good martha washington still smiling graciously but let us do our part quoth she and speedily begin to clothe our armies on the field and independence win good-bye good-bye we all did cry we're going home to spin end of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain section sixteen of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 16. How People Traveled in Revolutionary Times. 1775 to 1781. By John Back McMaster. A journey of any length was beset with innumerable difficulties and delays. Towns and cities between which we pass in an hour were a day's journey apart. For all purposes of trade and commerce, 250 miles was a greater distance then than 2,500 miles now. A voyage across the ocean to London or Liverpool, a trip across the prairies to the Pacific coast, is at present performed with more ease and comfort, and with quite as much expedition as a hundred years since a journey from Boston to New York was made. It was commonly by stages that both travellers and goods passed from city to city insufferably slow as such a mode of conveyance would seem to an american of this generation it had in seventeen eighty four but lately come in and was hailed as a mark of wonderful progress the first coach and four in new england began its trips in seventeen forty four the first stage between new york and philadelphia then the two most populous cities in the colonies was not set until seventeen fifty six and made the run in three days the same year that the Stamp Act was passed, a second stage was started. This was advertised as a luxurious conveyance, quote unquote, being a covered jersey wagon, and was promised to make the trip in three days, the charge being two pence the mile. The success which attended this venture moved others, and in the year following it was announced that a conveyance described as the flying machine, quote unquote, being a good wagon with seats on springs, would perform the whole journey in the surprisingly short time of two days. This increase of speed was, however, accompanied by an increase of fare, the charge being twenty shillings for the through trip and threepence per mile for way passengers. When the revolution came, most of these vehicles ceased to ply between the distant cities, horseback travelling was resumed, and a journey of any length became a matter of grave consideration. On the day of departure, the friends of the traveller gathered at the inn, took a solemn leave of him, drank his health in bumpers of punch, and wished him Godspeed on his way. The Quaker preacher, Hicks, setting out in 1779 for yearly meeting, remarked, quote, We took a solemn leave of our families, they feeling much anxiety at parting with us on account of the many dangers we were exposed to, having to pass not only through the lines of the armies, but the deserted and almost uninhabited country that lay between them. End quote. With the return of peace, the stages again took the road, but many years elapsed before traffic over the highways became at all considerable. While Washington was serving his first term, two stages and twelve horses sufficed to carry all the travelers and goods passing between New York and Boston, then the two greatest commercial centers of the country. The conveyances were old and shackling, the harness made mostly of rope, the beasts were ill-fed and worn to skeletons. The ordinary day journey was forty miles in summer, but in winter, when the roads were bad and the darkness came on early in the afternoon, rarely more than twenty-five. In the hot months the traveller was oppressed by the heat and half-choked by the dust. When cold weather came, he could scarce keep from freezing. One pair of horses usually dragged the stage some eighteen miles, when fresh ones were put on, and, if no accident occurred, the traveller was put down at the inn about ten at night. 
Cramped and weary, he ate a frugal supper and betook himself to bed, with a notice from the landlord that he would be called at three the next morning. Then, whether it rained or snowed, he was forced to rise and make ready, by the light of a horn lantern or a farthing candle, for another ride of eighteen hours. After a series of mishaps and accidents, such as would suffice for an emigrant train crossing the plains, the stage rolled into New York at the end of the sixth day. The discomforts and trials of such a trip, combined with the accidents by no means uncommon, the great distance from help in the solitary places through which the road ran, and the terrors of ferry boats on the rivers, made a journey of any distance an event to be remembered to the end of one's days. Such was the crude state of the science of engineering that no bridge of any considerable length had been undertaken in the States. No large rivers had yet been spanned. While going from Boston to Philadelphia in 1789, Breck crossed the Connecticut at Springfield, the Housatonic at Stratford, the Hudson at New York, the Hackensack and Passaic between Paul's Hook, now Jersey City, and Newark, the Raritan at New Brunswick, the Delaware at Trenton, and the Nashamung at Bristol, on what were then known as ferryboats. The crossing of any of these streams was attended by much discomfort and danger, but the wide stretch of water which flowed between Paulus Hook and the city of New York was especially the dread of travellers. There, from December till late in March, great blocks of ice filled the river from either bank far out to the channel. On windy days the waves were high, and when the tide ran counter with the wind, covered with whitecaps. Horse-boats had not yet come in. The hardy traveller was, therefore, rowed across in boats such as would now be thought scarcely better than scows. In one of her most touching letters to her husband, Mrs. Burr describes to him the alarm occasioned by his making the dangerous crossing. How she had anxiously waited for his return hoping that the dangers of the passage would deter him, how, when she heard that he was really embarked, she gave herself up to an agony of fear as she thought of him exposed in the little boat to the rough waters and the boisterous winds, and what thankfulness she felt when her son brought word of his safe arrival at Paul's Hook. Even a trip from Brooklyn to New York, across a river scarce half as wide as that separating the city from New Jersey, was attended with risks and delays that would now be thought intolerable. Then, and indeed till the day thirty years later, when the rude steamboats of Fulton made their appearance on the ferry, the only means of transportation for man and beast were clumsy rowboats, flat-bottomed, square-ended scows with sprit sails, and two-masted boats called periaglas. In one of these, if the day were fine, if the tide were slack, if the watermen were sober, and if the boat did not put back several times to take in belated passengers who were seen running down the hill, the crossing might be made with some degree of speed and comfort, and a landing effected at the foot of the steps at the pier which, much enlarged, still forms part of the Brooklyn slip of the Fulton Ferry. But when the wind blew with the tide, when a strong flood or an angry ebb was on, the boatmen made little headway, and counted themselves happy if, at the end of an hour's hard pulling, the passengers were put ashore opposite Governor's Island, or on the marshes around Wallabot Bay. In summer these delays, which happened almost daily, were merely annoying, and did no more harm than to bring down some hearty curses on the boatmen and the tide. But when winter came, and the river began to fill with huge blocks of ice, Crossing the ferry was hazardous enough to deter the most daring. Sometimes a rowboat would get in an ice jam and be held there in the wind and cold for many hours. At others a periagua would go to pieces in the crash, and the passengers, forced to clamber on the ice, would drift up and down the harbour at the mercy of the tide. It is not improbable that the solicitude of Mrs. Burr for the safety of her husband was heightened by the recollection of such an occurrence which took place but a few months before. Nor were the scows in the best of weather less liable to accidents than the rowboats. It was on these that horses, wagons, and cattle were brought over from city to city, for the butchers of the fly market drew their supplies of beef and mutton from the farms that lay on the hills towards Flatbush and what is now Williamsburg. 
Every week small herds of steers and flocks of sheep were driven to the ferry, shut up in pens, and brought over the river, a few at a time, on the scows. The calmest days, the smoothest water, and a slack tide were, if possible, chosen for such trips. Yet even then, whoever went upon a cattle boat took his life in his hands. If a sudden gust of wind struck the sails, or if one of the half-dozen bullocks became restless, the scow was sure to upset. No one, therefore, who was so fortunate as to own a handsome carriage would trust it on the boats if the wind and sea were high, or much ice in the river, but would wait two or three days for a gentle breeze and smooth water. But it was not solely by coaches and ferry boats that our ancestors travelled from place to place. Packet sloops plied between important points along the coast and such of the inland cities as stood upon the banks of navigable rivers. The trip from New York to Philadelphia was thus often made by packet to South Amboy, thence by coach to Burlington in New Jersey, where a packet was once more taken to the Quaker City. A similar line of vessels ran between New York and Providence, where coaches were in waiting to convey travellers to Boston. This mode of conveyance was thought to be far more comfortable than by stage wagon, but it was, at the same time, far more uncertain. Nobody knew precisely when the sloops would set sail, nor when once started, how soon they would reach their haven. The wind being favourable, and the waters of the sound quite smooth, the run to Providence was often made in three days. But it was not seldom that nine days, or two weeks, were spent in the trip. On the Hudson were many such sloops, bringing down again timber and skins from Albany, to be exchanged for broadcloth, half thicks and tummies at New York. They ceased to run, however, when the ice began to form in the river, trade was suspended, and the few travellers who went from one city to the other made the journey on horseback or in the coach. In summer, when the winds were light, two weeks were sometimes spent in sailing the 150 miles. The difficulties, indeed, which beset the English traveller John Maud on his way to Albany would now be rarely met with in a canoe on the rivers of the northwest. Burr, on his way from Albany to attend court, changed from sloop to wagon ere his journey was ended. Travellers by these packets often took boat as the vessel floated slowly down the river, rode ashore and purchased eggs and milk at the farmhouses near the bank, and overtook their vessel with ease. The present century had long passed its first decade before any material improvement in locomotion became known. Our ancestors were not wholly unacquainted with the great motive power which has within the lifetime of a generation revolutionized every branch of human industry and enabled great ships of iron to advance in the face of wind and waves, and long trains of cars to traverse the earth at a speed exceeding the pace of the fleetest horse. Before the close of 1787, Fitch at Philadelphia and Ramsey at Shepherdstown, Virginia, had both moved vessels by steam. Before 1790, a steamboat company had been organized at Philadelphia, and a little craft built by Fitch had steamed up and down the Delaware to Burlington, to Bristol, to Bordentown and Trenton. Before 1800, Samuel Morey had gone up the Connecticut River in a steamer of his own construction and design and Elijah Ormsby, a Rhode Island mechanic, had astonished the farmers along the banks of the Seekonk River with the sight of a boat driven by paddles. Early in this century, Stevens placed upon the waters of the Hudson a boat moved by a watt engine. The same year, Oliver Evans ran a paddle-wheel vessel on the waters of the Delaware and the Schuylkill. Fulton, in 1807, made his trip to Albany in the famous Clermont, and used it as a passenger boat till the end of the year but he met with the same opposition which in our time we have seen expended on the telegraph and the sewing machine, and which, some time far in the future, will be encountered by inventions and discoveries of which we have not now the smallest conception. No man in his senses, it was asserted, would risk his life in such a fire-boat as the Clermont, when the river was full of good packets. Before the year 1820 came, the first boat had steamed down the Mississippi to New Orleans, the first steamboat had appeared upon the lakes, and the Atlantic had been crossed by the steamship Savannah, but such amazing innovations as these found little favour with men accustomed from boyhood to the stagecoach and the sailboat. 
In 1810 nine days were spent in going from Boston to Philadelphia. At the outbreak of the second war with England, a light coach and three horses went from Baltimore to Washington in a day and a half. The mail wagon, then thought to make the journey with surprising speed, left Pennsylvania Avenue at five in the morning, and drew up at the post office in Baltimore at eleven at night. Ocean travel was scarcely known. Nothing short of the most pressing business, or an intense longing to see the wonders of the old world, could induce a gentleman of 1784 to leave his comfortable home and his pleasant fields, shut himself up in a packet, and breathe the foul air of the close and dingy cabin for the month or seven weeks spent in crossing the Atlantic. A passage in such a space of time would, moreover, have been thought a short one, for it was no very uncommon occurrence when a vessel was nine, ten, eleven weeks, or even three months on a voyage from Havre or Madrid to New York. So formidable was this tedious sail, and the bad food and loathsome water it entailed, that fewer men went over each summer to London than now go every month to South America. In fact, an emigrant steamer brings out each passage from Queenstown more human beings than a hundred years ago, crossed the ocean in both direction in the space of a twelfth month. So late as 1795, a gentleman who had been abroad was pointed out in the streets even of the large cities with the remark, There goes a man who has been to Europe. End of section 16section seventeen of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tapin section seventeen abraham devonport seventeen eighty by john g whittier in the old days a custom laid aside with breeches and cocked hats the people sent their wisest men to make the public laws and so from a brown homestead where the sound drinks the small tribute of the mayan ass waved over by the woods of ripo wams and hallowed by pure lives and tranquil deaths Stamford sent up to the councils of the state wisdom and grace in abraham davenport twas on a may day of the far old year seventeen hundred eighty that there fell over the bloom and sweet life of the spring over the fresh earth and the heaven of noon a horror of great darkness like the night in day of which the norland sagas tell the twilight of the gods the low-hung sky was black with ominous clouds save where its rim was fringed with a dull glow like that which climbs the crater's sides from the red hell below birds ceased to sing and all the barnyard fowls roosted the cattle at the pasture bars lowed and looked homeward bats on leathern wings flitted abroad the sound of labour died men prayed and women wept all ears grew sharp to hear the doom blast of the trumpet shatter the black sky that the dreadful face of christ might look from the rent clouds not as he looked a loving guest at bethany but stern as justice and inexorable law meanwhile in the old state house dim as ghosts sat the lawgivers of connecticut trembling beneath their legislative robes it is the lord's great day let us adjourn some said and then as if with one accord all eyes were turned to abraham davenport he rose slow cleaving with his steady voice the intolerable hush this well may be the day of judgment which the world awaits but be it so or not i only know my present duty and my lord's command to occupy till he come so at the post 
where he hath set me in his providence i choose for one to meet him face to face no faithless servant frightened from my task but ready when the lord of the harvest calls and therefore with all reverence i would say let god do his work we will see to ours bring in the candles and they brought them in then by the flaring lights the speaker read albeit with husky voice and shaking hands an act to amend an act to regulate the shad and elwive fisheries whereupon wisely and well spake abraham davenport straight to the question with no figures of speech save the ten arab signs yet not without the shrewd dry humour natural to the man his awe-struck colleagues listened all the while between the pauses of his argument to hear the thunder of the wrath of god break from the hollow trumpet of the cloud and there he stands in memory to this day erect self-poised a rugged face half seen against the background of unnatural dark a witness to the ages as they pass that simple duty hath no place for fear end of section seventeen recording by alan mapstone Section 18 of The United States, read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 3, The First Years of the Nation. Historical Note. During the Revolution, the colonies had stood together, but when the war came to an end, each one began to think what would be best for itself. In 1787, a convention was decided upon to form a more perfect union, and then it was that the Constitution of the United States was written. Very important questions came up for settlement. How much power should be given to the central government, and how much to each state? How long should president's term of office be? How should the states be represented? There was a vast amount of debate and discussion, but finally the Constitution was submitted to the states. The Federalists were eager for its ratification. The Anti-Federalists opposed chiefly on the ground of its giving so much power to the central government. The consent of nine states was necessary for adoption. Between December 7, 1787, and February 6, 1788, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts had signified their acceptance. Maryland came into line in April, South Carolina in May. Then there was a month's delay. At last, the Federalists carried the day in New Hampshire and a few days later in Virginia, and the Constitution was adopted. After the adoption of the Constitution, each state chose electors to vote for a president. Every vote was cast for Washington, and in 1789 he became president of the United States. The first difficulty for the new nation to meet was the lack of money. The United States had a poor financial rating because what the Continental Congress had borrowed had never been repaid. Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, made two propositions to Congress. The first was to tax foreign goods brought into the country. The second was somewhat startling, for he wished the whole government to assume the debt of each state. This was finally done, and now every creditor of each state became anxious to have a strong central government in order that he might get his money. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. America by Samuel Francis Smith. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee. I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. My native country, thee, land of the noble free, thy name I love, 
I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills, my heart with rapture thrills, like that above. Let music swell the breeze, and ring from all the trees sweet freedom's song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our Father's God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 20. How Philadelphia celebrated the ratification of the Constitution, 1788, by John Bach McMaster. Philadelphia was the first large city to receive the news of the adoption of the Constitution, and there the popular rejoicings put on a more impressive form. It was known so early as the 26th of June that New Hampshire had assented, but every one felt that the Constitution could never be firmly set up while so great and populous a state as Virginia held out. When, therefore, the post that came in on the evening of the 2nd of July brought letters telling that Virginia was federal, the doubts and fears that had tormented men for seven months were put at rest. It was instantly determined that the coming fourth of July should be made the occasion for a great display of federal spirit, that there should be speeches and toasts and a procession, and that the procession, it was said, should be such a one as the continent had never seen. Not a moment was wasted, and by the night of the third all was ready. The pavements had been swept, the trees had been lopped. Ten ships had been procured, dressed in bunting, and anchored in the Delaware, one at the foot of every street from the North Liberties to South Street. They were typical of the ten ratifying states. As the first rays of the morning sun came over the eastern bank of the Delaware, the ship Rising Sun, which lay at the foot of Market Street, fired a national salute, the bells of Christ Church rang out, and each of the ten vessels on the river ran up to her masthead a broad white flag which, spread by a stiff breeze from the south, displayed the name of the commonwealth for which she stood. Meanwhile the procession was fast forming in the city, but the sun had been four hours up before it began to move. Every trade, every business, every occupation of life was represented— there were saddlers and gunsmiths, stone-cutters, tanners, brewers, merchants, doctors, shipwrights, and stocking-makers. The cordwainers sent a miniature shop. The rope-makers marched each with a bunch of hemp and a piece of rope in his hand. The Manufacturers' Society delighted the crowd with the spectacle of a huge wagon drawn by ten horses and neatly covered with cotton cloth of their own make. On the wagon were a lace loom, a printing mill, a carding and a spinning jenny of eighty spindles. Compared with the cunningly and exquisitely wrought machines now to be found in the mills and factories of New England, they would seem rude and ill-formed, but they were among the newest inventions of the age, and were looked on by our ancestors as marvels of mechanical ingenuity. There, too, were represented in succession, independence, the French alliance, 
the definitive treaty the convention of the states and the federal roof a huge dome supported by thirteen corinthian columns but the cheering was never so loud as when the federal ship union came in sight she had it was whispered among the crowd been built in four days her bottom was the barge of the ship alliance and was the same that had once belonged to the serapis and had been taken in the memorable fight by paul jones she mounted twenty guns and had upon her deck four small boys who performed all the duties of a crew set sail took a pilot on board trimmed the sheets to suit the breeze threw out the lead cast anchor at union green and set off dispatches to the president of the united states when the end of the procession had passed union green wilson gave the address hopkinson wrote the ode which printed in english and in german was scattered among the people and sent off on the wings of carrier pigeons to the ten ratifying states that night the streets of the city were bright with bonfires and noisy with the shouts of revellers who had taken too many bumpers to the french king to the american fabius and the builders of the federal roof but the rejoicings did not end with the day for months afterward the newspapers gave unmistakable evidence of the pleasure with which the great mass of the people contemplated the new plan the word federal became more popular than ever. It was given by town committees and selectmen as names to streets in numberless towns, and was used as a catchword by tradesmen and shopkeepers. One advertisement informed the public where the federal minuet was to be obtained. In another, a dancing master announced that he would give instruction in the federal minuet. A third invited gentlemen who visited the city to put up their horses at the federal stables. A number of designs were suggested for a lady's federal hat. Federal punch became the drink of the day. In the shipping news, in the list of packets that had arrived and brigs that had sailed, appeared notices that the sloop Anarchy when last heard from, was ashore on Union Rocks, that the scow Old Federation, imbecility master, had gone to sea, and that on the same day the staunch ship Federal Constitution, with public credit, commercial prosperity, and national energy on board, had reached her haven in safety. End of section 20 this recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 21. The First Inauguration Day, 1789, by John Bach McMaster. In every great city, from Boston to Baltimore, societies for the encouragement of manufacturers had sprung up since the war and were flourishing that at boston put forth an address urging the manufacturers of the great seaports to join with it in checking importation the members of the society in delaware took a solemn pledge to appear on the first day of january in each year clothed in goods of american make to foster the growth of flax and wool and to discourage the purchase of cloth abroad the society at philadelphia had at great cost and labor secured the models of a cotton carter and a cotton spinner built a factory and begun the manufacture of cotton goods the result was a speedy return to old habits of simplicity and frugality young women wore plainer clothes and made haste to surpass their mothers in skill at the spinning wheel 
young men drank american porter and beer and were not ashamed to be seen in homespun stockings and homemade jeans politicians found the surest way to win the hearts of their constituents was to appear dressed in american broadcloth the town of hartford could think of no gift so appropriate for john adams on his way to be inaugurated vice-president as a roll of cloth from its own looms all true patriots heard with joy that on the auspicious day when the american fabius stood forth to take the oath of office he was clad from head to foot in garments whose material was the product of american soil his inauguration fell on the last day of april washington quitted mount vernon on the sixteenth of the month in company with colonel humphreys and mr thompson and came by the most direct road through baltimore and philadelphia to new york the journey even at that time of year might easily have been made in five days but he was much delayed by the hearty receptions given him along the entire route from every village and hamlet through which the road lay the people poured forth to welcome him and to testify by shouts and blessings their love and gratitude for the great things he had done he was feasted at alexandria he was entertained at georgetown he was warmly received at philadelphia the people of that city had selected Gray's Ferry on the lower Shykill as the place to meet him, and had taxed their ingenuity to the utmost to devise decorations worthy of the occasion. The bridge, a mean and rude structure, was hidden under cedars and laurel, flags and liberty caps. Two triumphal arches were put up, and signals arranged to give warning of his coming. At last, about noon on the twentieth, the flag in the ferry garden was dropped, and soon after the President was seen riding slowly down the hill and under the first arch, where a laurel crown was let fall upon his head. From the bridge he went on in company with Governor Mifflin and the troops to Philadelphia, where he lay that night. The moment he entered the city limits, the bells of all the churches were rung, and in the language of that time a feu de joie was fired. The President was much affected, and, says an eyewitness, as he moved down Market Street to the city tavern, every face seemed to say, Long, long, long live George Washington! Early the next morning the Philadelphia horse rode with him to Trenton, where a yet more pleasing reception awaited him. On the Assumpic Bridge, over which twelve years before he led his little army on the night before the battle of princeton the women of trenton had put up a triumphal arch thirteen columns supported it and were surmounted by a great dome adorned with a sunflower and the inscription to thee alone Beyond the bridge was gathered a bevy of women and girls, who, as the President passed under the dome, came forward to greet him, singing and strewing the way with flowers. Washington was greatly touched, and thanked them in a few neatly turned sentences. From Trenton, the Huntington horse accompanied him to Rocky Hill, where the Somerset horse met him and escorted him to Brunswick. Thence the Middlesex horse took him to Woodbridge, and the Essex horse to the barge at Elizabethtown Point. Once on board, the little craft was rowed by thirteen pilots through the Kill von Kull, and out into the broad bosom of the most beautiful of harbors. Around him on every side crowded an innumerable navy of track scouts and shallops, barges and rowboats, gay with flags and black with shouting men. Before him, just visible in the distance, lay the low hills and the white houses of the great city, and as the barge sped swiftly toward them, the Spanish warship Galveston saluted with thirteen guns. The ship North Carolina replied. A third salute was fired by the artillery. 
as washington climbed the stairs at murray's wharf and was welcomed by clinton the senators and representatives and escorted through dense lines of cheering citizens to the house made ready for his use at night the sky was red with bonfires and the streets and coffee-houses full of revellers it was the twenty-third of the month but as a few finishing touches were yet to be given to federal hall the ceremonies of inauguration were put off till the thirtieth on the morning of that day the people went in crowds to the churches to offer up prayers for the welfare of the new government and the safety of the president precisely at noon the procession which had been forming almost since sunrise moved from washington's house on cherry street through queen street great dock and broad streets to federal hall as the head of the line reached the building the troops divided and washington was led through the midst of them to the senate chamber where both houses were formally introduced to him when the members were again seated and the noise had subsided adams who had already been inaugurated informed the president that the time had come for the administration of the oath of office washington rose and followed by the members of the two houses went out on the balcony of federal hall from which he could be seen far up and down wall street and by the multitude that filled broad street the chancellor of new york tendered the oath and when the ceremony was over turning toward the people cried out long live george washington president of the united states the crowd took up the cry and amid the joyous shouts of the citizens and the roar of the cannon on the battery washington went back to the senate chamber and delivered his inaugural that night there were bonfires in all the streets and moving transparencies in the windows of the spanish minister's house end of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain section twenty two of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 22. The Death of Washington. 1799. The following account is that given by Mr. Lear, Washington's private secretary combined with some facts given by Mr. Custis. The Editor Between two and three o'clock on Saturday morning, December 14th, he, footnote, Washington, end of footnote, awoke Mrs. Washington and told her that he was very unwell and had had an ague. She observed that he could scarcely speak and breathed with difficulty and would have got up to call a servant, but he would not permit her lest she should take a cold. As soon as the day appeared, the woman, Caroline, went into the room to make a fire, and Mrs. Washington sent her immediately to call me. I got up, put on my clothes as quickly as possible, and went to his chamber. Mrs. Washington was then up, and related to me his being ill as before stated. I found the general breathing with difficulty, and hardly able to utter a word intelligibly. He desired Mr. Rollins, one of the overseers, might be sent for, to bleed him before the doctor could arrive. I dispatched a servant instantly for Rollins, and another for Dr. Craik, and returned again to the general's chamber, where I found him in the same situation as I had left him. A mixture of molasses, vinegar, and butter was prepared to try its effects in the throat, but he could not swallow a drop. Whenever he attempted it, he appeared to be distressed, convulsed and almost suffocated. Rollins came in soon after sunrise and prepared to bleed him. When the arm was ready, the general, observing that Rollins appeared to be agitated, said, as well as he could speak, "'Don't be afraid.' And when the incision was made, he observed, "'The orifice is not large enough.' However, 
the blood ran pretty freely. Mrs. Washington, not knowing whether bleeding was proper or not in the general situation, begged that much might not be taken from him, lest it should be injurious, and desired me to stop it. But when I was about to untie the string, the general put up his hand to prevent it, and as soon as he could speak, he said, More. More. Mrs. Washington being still very uneasy, lest too much blood should be taken, it was stopped after taking about half a pint. Finding that no relief was obtained from bleeding, and that nothing would go down the throat, I proposed bathing it externally with sal volatile, which was done, and in the operation, which was with the hand, and in the gentlest manner, he observed, It is very sore. A piece of flannel dipped in sal volatile was put around his neck, and his feet bathed in warm water, but without affording any relief. In the meantime, before Dr. Craig arrived, Mrs. Washington desired me to send for Dr. Brown, of Port Tobacco, whom Dr. Craig had recommended to be called, if any case should ever occur that was seriously alarming. Dr. Dick came about three o'clock, and Dr. Brown arrived soon after. Upon Dr. Dick seeing the general, and consulting a few minutes with Dr. Craig, he was bled again. The blood came very slow, was thick, and did not produce any symptoms of fainting. Dr. Brown came into the chamber soon after, and upon feeling the general's pulse, the physicians went out together. Dr. Craig returned soon after. The general could now swallow a little. Calomel and tartar emetic were administered, but without any effect. The weather became severely cold, while the group gathered nearer to the couch of the sufferer. He spoke but little. To the respectful and affectionate inquiries of an old family servant, as she smoothed down his pillow, how he felt himself, he answered, I am very ill. To Mrs. Washington he said, Go to my desk, and in the private drawer you will find two papers. Bring them to me. They were brought. Upon looking at them he observed, These are my wills. Preserve this one and burn the other, which was accordingly done. In the course of the afternoon he appeared to be in great pain and distress from the difficulty of breathing, and frequently changed his posture in the bed. On these occasions I lay upon the bed and endeavored to raise him and turn him with as much ease as possible. He appeared penetrated with gratitude for my attentions, and often said, I am afraid I shall fatigue you too much and upon my assuring him that I could feel nothing but a wish to give him ease, he replied, Well, it is a debt we must pay to each other, and I hope, when you want aid of this kind, you will find it. He asked when Mr. Lewis and Washington Custis would return. They were then in New Kent. I told him about the twentieth of the month. The general's servant, Christopher, was in the room during the day, and in the afternoon the general directed him to sit down, as he had been standing almost the whole day. He did so. About eight o'clock in the morning he had expressed a desire to get up. His clothes were put on, and he was led to a chair by the fire. He found no relief from that position, and lay down again about ten o'clock. About five o'clock Dr. Craik came into the room, and upon going to the bedside, the general said to him, Doctor... I die hard, but I am not afraid to go. I believed from my first attack that I should not survive it. My breath cannot last long. The doctor pressed his hand, but could not utter a word. He retired from the bedside, and sat by the fire absorbed in grief. Between five and six o'clock, Dr. Dick and Dr. Brown came into the room, and with Dr. Craig went to the bed when Dr. Craig asked him if he could sit up in the bed. He held out his hand, and I raised him up. He then said to the physicians, I feel myself going. I thank you for your attentions, but I pray you to take no more trouble about me. Let me go off quietly. I cannot last long. About ten o'clock, he made several attempts to speak to me before he could effect it. At length he said, I am just going. Have me decently buried, and do not let my body 
be put into the vault in less than three days after I am dead. I bowed assent, for I could not speak. He then looked at me again and said, Do you understand me? Yes, I replied. Tis well, said he. The last words which he ever uttered on earth. With surprising self-possession he prepared to die, composing his form at full length and folding his arms on his bosom. About ten minutes before he expired, which was between ten and eleven o'clock Saturday evening, his breathing became easier. He lay quietly. He withdrew his hand from mine and felt his own pulse. I saw his countenance change. I spoke to Dr. Craik, who sat by the fire. He came to the bedside. The general's hand fell from his wrist. I took it in mine and pressed it to my bosom. Dr. Craik put his hands over his eyes, and he expired without a struggle or a sigh, December 14th, 1799, in the 68th year of his age, after an illness of 24 hours. End of section 22《Numerous white missionaries now came to the country of the Indians, endeavoring as well as they could to establish Christianity among the savages. One of these, a missionary named Cram, made a long speech to the Senecas, telling them there was but one religion, and unless they adopted it they could not prosper, that they had lived all their lives in darkness, and that his object in talking to them was not to get away their lands or money, but to turn them towards the true gospel. Finally, he asked them to state their objections, if they had any, to the adoption of his religion. He closed his address with a strong appeal to their reasoning powers, and after he had finished speaking, the Seneca chiefs retired for a conference. After several hours of talking, Red Jacket came from the tent in which they had been seated and, striding forward, delivered the following speech, which stands as one of the greatest examples of Indian eloquence that is known to history. Friend and brother, he began, it was the will of the great spirit that we should meet together this day he orders all things and he has given us a fine day for our council he has taken his garment from before the sun and has caused the bright orb to shine with brightness upon us our eyes are opened so that we see clearly our ears are unstopped so that we have been able to distinctly hear the words which you have spoken for all of these favors we thank the great spirit and him only brother this council fire was kindled by you it was at your request that we came together at this time we have listened with attention to what you have said you have requested us to speak our minds freely this gives us great joy for we now consider that we stand upright before you and can speak what we think all have heard your voice and all speak to you as one man our minds are agreed brother you say that you want an answer to your talk before you leave this place it is right that you should have one, as you are a great distance from home, and we do not wish to detain you. But we will first look back a little, and tell you what our fathers have told us, and what we have heard from the white people. Brother, listen to what we say. There was a time when our forefathers owned this great land, meaning the continent of North America, a common belief among the Indians. Their seats extended from the rising to the setting of the sun. The Great Spirit had made it for the use of Indians, and he had created the buffalo, the deer, and other animals for food. He made the bear and the deer, and their skins served us for clothing. He had scattered them over the country, and had taught us how to take them. He had caused the earth to produce corn for bread. All this he had done for his red children, because he loved them. If we had any disputes about hunting grounds, they were generally settled without the shedding of much blood. But an evil day came upon us. Your forefathers crossed the great waters and landed on this island. Their numbers were small. They found friends and not enemies. They told us they had fled from their own country for fear of wicked men and had come here to enjoy their religion. They asked for a small seat. We took pity on them, granted their request, and they sat down amongst us. 
We gave them corn and meat. They gave us poison, spiritous liquor, in return. The white people had now found our country. Tidings were carried back, and more came amongst them. Yet we did not fear them. We took them to be friends. They called us brothers. We believed them and gave them a large seat. At length their numbers had greatly increased. They wanted more land. They wanted our country. Our eyes were opened, and our minds became uneasy. Wars took place, Indians were hired to fight against Indians, and many of our people were destroyed. They also brought strong liquors among us. It was strong and powerful, and has slain thousands. Brother, our seats were once large, and yours were very small. You have now become a great people, and we have scarcely a place left to spread our blankets. You have got our country, but you are not satisfied. You want to force your religion upon us. Brother, continue to listen. You say that you are sent to instruct us how to worship the great spirit agreeably to his mind, and if we do not take hold of the religion which you white people teach, we shall be unhappy hereafter. You say that you are right and we are lost. How do we know this to be true? We understand that your religion is written in a book. If it was intended for us as well as you say, why has not the great spirit given it to us, and not only to us? But why did he not give to our forefathers the knowledge of that book with the means of understanding it rightly? We only know what you tell us about it. How shall we know when to believe, being so often deceived by the white people? Brother, you say there is but one way to worship and serve the Great Spirit. If there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much about it? Why not all agree, as you can all read the book? Brother, we do not understand these things. We are told that your religion was given to your forefathers and has been handed down father to son. We also have a religion which has been given to our forefathers and has been handed down to us, their children. We worship that way. It teaches us to be thankful for all of the favors we receive, to love each other, and to be united. We never quarrel about religion. Brother, the Great Spirit has made us all, but he has made a great difference between his white and red children. He has given us a different complexion and different customs. To you he has given the arts, to these he has not opened our eyes. We know these things to be true. Since he has made so great a difference between us and other things, why may not we conclude that he has given us a different religion according to our understanding? The Great Spirit does right. He knows what is best for his children. We are satisfied. Brother, we do not wish to destroy your religion or take it from you. We only want to enjoy our own. Brother, you say you have not come to get our land or our money, but to enlighten our minds. I will now tell you that I have been at your meetings and saw you collecting money from the meeting. I cannot tell what this money was intended for, but suppose it was for your minister, and if we should conform to your way of thinking, perhaps you may want some from us. Brother, we are told that you have been preaching to white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We are acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If we find it does them good and makes them honest and less disposed to cheat Indians, we will then consider again what you have said. Brother, you have now heard our answer to your talk, and this is all we have to say at present. As we are going to part, we will come and take you by the hand, and hope the Great Spirit will protect you on your journey and return you safe to your friends. End of section 23. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 24 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 24. The Burning of the Philadelphia. 1804, by Cyrus Townsend Brady. The piratical people of the Barbary states seized the vessels of all nations that did not pay them tribute, and held officers and crews as slaves in a horrible servitude. In 1803, the American frigate Philadelphia, when blockading the harbor of Tripoli, was captured by the pirates and refitted. Decatur, with the permission of Commodore Preble, set off in a little catch, the Intrepid, to destroy her. The Editor It had been arranged that the attack of the catch should be supported by the sirens' boats, but delay occurring, Decatur decided not to wait for them, remarking to his officers, 
the fewer the numbers, the greater the honour. It was still early evening, and with beating hearts the men on the brig watched the little ketch speed into the harbour toward the Philadelphia. The frigate lay swinging to the wind under the guns of the Bashaw's castle, and protected on every side by the powerful land batteries and forts, mounting over one hundred and fifteen heavy guns, beside numberless smaller pieces, and manned by twenty-five thousand men. On either side, reaching toward the entrance of the harbour, like the horns of a wide crescent, were arranged three smart cruisers, two large galleys and nineteen gunboats. The group of vessels resembled an open mouth, at the back of which was the Philadelphia. Into these jaws of death Decatur boldly sent the intrepid. The breeze being still fresh, though dying, drags composed of buckets, spare spars and canvas were cast astern to diminish the speed of the vessel coming on too rapidly, as any attempt to take in sail would have been suspicious. As the hours of the evening wore away, the wind fell, and she crept slowly up the harbour. The evening was balmy and pleasant. The moon in that tropic land had flooded the heavens with mystic light, bathing the minarets and towers of the sleeping town upon the shores with silver splendour. Lights twinkled here and there in the white-walled city, and the Philadelphia herself was brilliantly illuminated by long rows of battle-lanterns, which sent beams of yellow lustre to mingle with the soft moonlight upon the sparkling water. The frigate's foremast had been cut away in the effort to get her off the reef, her topmasts were housed, and the lower yards lay athwart ship on the gunwales. The lower rigging was set up, and, as it was afterward learned, all her guns were shotted. A heavy crew, probably three hundred and fifty men, was on board. What must have been the sensations of the men in that little ketch as they glided along? To what were they going? Destruction? Victory? What would be the end of it? By Decatur's orders, the men had concealed themselves by laying flat upon the decks, behind the bulwarks, rails, masts, bits, etc., and only a few of the seamen, dressed like Sicilian sailors, with Decatur and the pilot aft to con the ship, and an old battle-scarred veteran at the wheel, were visible. Eighty-three men in a little ramshackle boat, a cockle shell, were going into a harbour defended by scientifically constructed and well-armed batteries to attempt to take a thirty-eight-gun frigate, full manned and armed, and surrounded by a fleet of small boats carrying fifty to sixty more guns, all bearing upon the Philadelphia herself, in expectation of just such an attack. The attack itself to be delivered in the bright moonlight and in the early evening, about half after ten o'clock. The very audacity of the conception strikes one with amazement, and to its boldness is largely due the immunity the attackers enjoyed. That anybody should attempt such a thing was absolutely incredible. The thoughts of the young men doubtless went back to home and friends, sweethearts and wives, but, with the determination of heroes, they schooled their beating hearts, nerved their resolution, and stifled any sensations of trepidation which might naturally possess them. As they approached the Philadelphia, Decatur ordered the seamen at the wheel to head the ketch for the bows of the latter ship, determining to lay his vessel athwart the hawse of the frigate and board from thence. As they drew near, the Tripolitan hailed. By Decatur's direction, the pilot answered that they were traders from Malta who had lost their anchors in the recent storm and desired the privilege of riding by the Philadelphia for the night, that is, attaching their boat to the frigate's cables until morning. This not unusual request was granted as a matter of course, and after assuring the watchful Tripolitan that the brig in the offing, about which he had made inquiry, was an English schooner, the transfer, the siren's boat, which was swinging astern, was manned by the sailors upon the deck, and a line carried forward to the port-sheet cable. 
At this moment a sudden shift of wind took the ketch aback, and she hung motionless, directly in line with the frigate's battery, and not forty yards away. The position was one fraught with the greatest danger. If they were discovered now, they were lost. The pilot, however, by decatur's orders, amused the enemy with descriptions of the cargo and sea gossip in his lingua franca, the common language of the Mediterranean, until the boat got away, and the catch feeling the breeze moved forward again. The coolness and resource of their young commander had saved them. The Tripolitans, with ready kindness, soon to be ill-requited, had sent a boat of their own with a cable leading from the port quarter of which they desired the ketch to lie. With great presence of mind the Americans intercepted the boat and took the cable back to the ketch themselves. Two lines were fastened together and then passed inboard, where the men, lying down on the deck, grasped it in their hands without rising and lustily hauled away, breasting the intrepid steadily in toward the frigate. As the ketch gathered way, she shot into the moonlight between the shadows cast by the masts of the Philadelphia, when the Tripolitan commander at once discovered her anchors hanging over her bows in plain sight. Indignant at the deception which had been practiced, but still unsuspicious of the true character of the stranger, he ordered the fasts immediately to be cut. At the same moment some of his crew discovered the men upon the decks of the ketch. The alarm was instantly given. The cry, Americanos, Americanos, rang out over the water. The Americans sprang to their feet, and though the ketch at this time lay directly under the broadside of the Philadelphia, and could have been blown out of the water by her heavy guns, disregarding their peril in their wild desire for action after their long restraint, they gave such a pull upon the line that before it could be cut the ketch had sufficient way to strike the side of the philadelphia where eager hands at once made her fast not an order had been given nor a sound made decatur now shouted the command borders away and sprang at the main chains midshipmen morris and laws who were beside him leaped forward at the same instant Laws dashed in through a port, but the pistols in his boarding belt caught between the gun and the port sill, the foot of Decatur slipped, and Charles Morris was the first man to stand upon the deck of the Philadelphia. A second after, the other two men were with him, and the rest of the crew poured in over the rail, and with cutlasses or boarding pikes charged down upon the astonished Tripolitans. The weapons were cold steel, the watchword Philadelphia. No firearms were used, for Preble's strict orders had been to carry all with the sword. Without cheers and with desperate energy, the little band dashed at the masses of astonished and terrified men before them, and the whistle of the cutlasses, the ring of steel against steel, the thud of the pike as it buried itself in some beating heart, alone gave evidence for the fell purpose of the stern borders. Their attack was pressed home with such vigor that the Americans could not be denied. Forming a line from bulwark to bulwark, they cleared the deck. After a short but fierce resistance, in which upward of twenty Tripolitans were killed, those remaining on the upper deck jumped overboard, where many of them were killed by Anderson and his boat crew, or were drowned, others concealing themselves below to meet a worse fate later. A similar scene was enacted on the gun deck by Lawrence, Bainbridge, McDonough, and others, during and following the action above. Only the watchword in the darkness and excitement had prevented several of the Americans from attacking each other. In ten minutes the ship was captured. Not an American had been wounded, so far. Decatur would have given half his life to have brought her out, and many naval officers have believed that he could have done so. It would have been a matter of extreme difficulty in face of the dangers, especially as there was not a yard crossed nor a sail bent, and as he had received positive orders not to attempt it, he had to obey. 
The catch had been filled with combustibles, and they were immediately passed on board. The crew had been divided into several different parties, and each body of men, under the direction of an officer, had been carefully instructed just what was to be done. With remarkable speed and order, each group proceeded to its appointed station, and, speedily arranging the inflammable matter, applied the torch. So rapidly was this done that those charged with the duty of starting the fires below were almost cut off from escape by the flames and smoke from the conflagration above. In less than thirty minutes the ship was on fire in every direction, and the Americans had regained the catch. Decature was the last man to leave the Philadelphia. The bowfast and the grapnels on the intrepid were hastily cut, the sweeps manned, and instant endeavour was made to get clear. For some unaccountable reason, however, the ketch clung to the frigate. Broad sheets of flame came rushing out from the latter's ports and played over the deck of the intrepid. The situation was serious. It was the most critical moment of the enterprise. All the powder on the intrepid, in default of a magazine, was stored upon the deck, covered only by a tarpaulin over which the flames were roaring. In another moment they would be blown up. They retained their presence of mind, however, and soon discovered that the stern fast had not been cast off. Decatur and others sprang upon the taffrail in the midst of the flames, and as no axes were at hand, hacked the line asunder with their swords. The intrepid was clear. After a few lusty strokes which carried them a little distance away, the men stopped rowing and gave three hearty American cheers. They waited until success was achieved, and then, in the midst of further danger, gave tongue to their emotions, a significant action. At the same moment the startled Tripolitans awoke to life. The minutes of stupor with which they had witnessed the attack, which they hardly comprehended, gave place to energy. The rolling of the drums upon the shore mingled with the wild shouts and cries of the excited soldiery. Lights appeared upon the parapets, and immediately the roar of a heavy gun, which sent a shell over the ketch, broke the silence. As if this had been a signal, every battery and every vessel in the harbour awoke to action and commenced a furious cannonade. Solid shot, shells, canister and grape shrieked and screamed in the air about the devoted intrepid, casting up beautiful jets d'eau upon the surface of the bay, which the flames from the burning Philadelphia rendered as light as day. The Americans, having cheered to their heart's content, bent to their oars, and with such energy as they probably never had used before, they speedily fled from the harbour. The spectacle they were leaving was one of awe-inspiring magnificence. The frigate, from her long cruise in the tropic latitude, was as dry as paper and burned like tinder. The flames ran upon the lofty spars in lambent columns and clustered about the broad tops in rosy capitals of wavering and mysterious beauty. As the fire spread, the guns of her battery became heated, and in sullen succession they poured forth their messengers of death upon the harbour and the affrighted town toward which the starboard broadside bore. It was a death song and a last salute for, as the eager watchers gazed in melancholy triumph upon the results of their own destructive handiwork, she drifted ashore, and with a frightful explosion which seemed to rend the heavens and surface the sky with fire, she blew up. A moment of silence supervened, which was broken by the roar of the batteries resuming the cannonade. Strange to say, the intrepid passed through the fusillade unharmed, one man being slightly wounded, and the grape-shot passing through a sail. The moon had set, and the eager watchers on the siren finally lost track of the vessel in the darkness. Their burning anxiety as to her fate was not relieved until a boat dashed alongside, and a manly figure, clad in a sailor's rough jacket and grimed with smoke, sprang on board, 
triumphantly announcing their safe arrival. It was Decatur. In 1815, Decatur succeeded in compelling the Dey to abandon his attacks on American vessels, to surrender his prisoners, and pay for all property destroyed. End of section 24section 25 of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world's story volume 13 the united states edited by eva march tappan section 25 the trials of the british minister in jefferson's administration eighteen o three to eighteen o nine by james parton the system of precedence was abolished this was settled at a cabinet meeting early in the first term when the whole barbarous code of precedence was swept away these rules were substituted one residence to pay the first visit to strangers and among strangers whether native or foreign first comers call first upon later comers to this rule there was allowed one exception foreign ministers from the necessity of making themselves known pay the first visit to the secretary of state which is returned two when brought together in society all are perfectly equal whether foreign or domestic titled or untitled in or out of office the president amplified these rules thus the families of foreign ministers arriving at the seat of government receive the first visit from those of the national ministers as from all other residents members of the legislature and of the judiciary independent of their offices have a right as strangers to receive the first visit no title being admitted here those of foreigners give no precedence difference of grade among the diplomatic members gives no precedence at public ceremonies to which the government invites the presence of foreign ministers and their families a convenient seat or station will be provided for them with any other strangers invited and the families of the national ministers each taking place as they arrive and without any precedence to maintain the principle of equality or of pell-mell and prevent the growth of precedence out of courtesy the members of the executive will practice at their own houses and recommend an adherence to the ancient usages of the country of gentlemen in mass giving precedence to the ladies in mass in passing from one apartment where they are assembled into another all this with the friendly humane usages that grew out of it or were akin to it agreeable as it was to most persons shocked some ladies and offended all men who owed their importance solely to rank or office mr jackson english minister in eighteen o nine being a gentleman of sense and good humour was amused and pleased during his first conference with president madison which proved to be very long when a negro servant brought in some glasses of punch and a seed cake just as might have been done in a farmhouse of the day but his wife lamented that her husband after having been accustomed to treat with the civilized governments of europe should have to negotiate with the savage democrats of america it so chanced that the british minister from eighteen o three to eighteen o nine with whom jefferson had most to do mary by name but not by nature was a fanatic of etiquette and it appears that previous to his presentation to the president he had not heard of the business-like manner in which the affairs of the white house were conducted he was stunned at the manner of his reception 
it made an impression upon his mind which neither explanation nor the lapse of years could even soften much less obliterate and really when we consider that he had passed his life at courts where the nod the smile the frown the glance the tone the silence the presence the absence of the head of the government were matters of importance to be noted recorded transmitted and weighed we ought not to laugh at this mr mary as we do besides as mr jefferson remarks poor mary had learned nothing of diplomacy but its suspicions without head enough to distinguish when they were misplaced nevertheless he comes down to us borne on a pillow of laughter and he remains to this day one of the stock jests of washington thus he recounted his woes three years after the event to mr josiah quincy of massachusetts the ablest federalist in congress and one of the worthiest i called on mr madison who accompanied me officially to introduce me to the president we went together to the mansion house i being in full official costume as the etiquette of my place required on such a formal introduction of a minister from great britain to the president of the united states on arriving at the hall of audience we found it empty at which mr madison seemed surprised and proceeded to an entry leading to the president's study i followed him supposing the introduction was to take place in the adjoining room at this moment mr jefferson entered the entry at the other end and all three of us were packed in this narrow space from which to make room i was obliged to back out in this awkward position my introduction to the president was made by mr madison mr jefferson's appearance soon explained to me that the general circumstances of my reception had not been accidental but studied i in my official costume found myself at the hour of reception he had himself appointed introduced to a man as president of the united states not merely in an undress but actually standing in slippers down at the heels and both pantaloons coat and underclothes indicative of utter slovenliness and indifference to appearances and in a state of negligence actually studied i could not doubt that the whole scene was prepared and intended as an insult not to me personally but to the sovereign i represented it is just possible that mr jefferson thought that morning of the time when governor morris kicked his heels four months in london waiting for the promised answer of the british government to as reasonable and urgent a communication from president washington as one government ever made to another and then had to leave england without getting it possibly also it did happen to occur to his memory that mr adams had been kept vainly waiting three years in england for a reply to the same proposals perhaps too he remembered the period when he was himself presented to the king of england by mr adams and the king froze to them both an example which was followed by the king's friends and society generally so that it required courage for a courtier to show them anything more than cold civility at an evening party and this while well, they were only asking the king to stay the bloody ravages of the indians by giving up the seven posts within the boundaries of their country he may too have thought of the time when he as secretary of state would send an important communication to the british minister at philadelphia and wait many months for an answer but if he failed to answer a letter within three or four days he would be goaded by a second perhaps he thought the time had come to show the federalists that he did not accept great britain at her own valuation and did not believe she was fighting the battle of man and liberty against bonaparte it may be too that he knowing the childish politics of europe and what ridiculous importance was attached there to trifles may have paused before ringing for a pair of shoes not down at the heels and wondered if his old slippers duly reported to bonaparte might not drive another nail into the bargain for louisiana just concluded by mr livingston and mr monroe to the great joy of president and people all these thoughts may have flitted through the president's mind and held back his hand from the bell rope but in all probability he had no thoughts of the kind and only wore the clothes he usually did while at work but poor mary's troubles were not yet at an end he and his wife dined one day at the white house and when dinner was announced the president offered his arm to the lady nearest him at the moment mrs madison not to mrs mary who was on the other side of the room insult upon insult poor mary made such an outcry at this in washington that mr madison deemed it best to explain the circumstances to monroe 
the american minister in london that he might be prepared to meet mary's version mr mary did relate his grievances to the english minister for foreign affairs who however forbore to mention it to monroe if he had monroe was ready for him for besides being fully alive to the humour of the affair he had seen a few weeks before in an official london drawing-room the wife of an under-secretary of state accorded precedence over his own mrs mary went no more to the white house and her husband went only when official duty compelled but nothing could tire the placable good-nature of jefferson some time after desirous to restore social intercourse he caused mr mary to be informally asked whether he and his wife would accept an invitation to a family dinner at the president's house and receiving as he understood an affirmative intimation mr jefferson sent the invitation written with his own hand mary rose to his opportunity he wrote to the secretary of state asking whether the president of the united states had invited him as a private gentleman or as british plenipotentiary for if as a private gentleman he must obtain the king's permission before he could accept if in his official character he must have an assurance that he would be treated with the respect due to it madison with short civility waived the solution of this problem and the matter dropped but it was not till eighteen o nine that british interests in america were confided to abler hands some other points of public etiquette were now settled on rational principles once and forever the fussy incompetence recently in power had been concerned to know the relation which the president sustained to the governors of states precisely how much more exalted a president was than a governor the exact degree of deference a governor would show a president and the forms in which deference should be expressed in july eighteen o one the governor of virginia asked the president to indicate the etiquette which he thought should regulate the communications between the state governments and the general government his reply in substance was let there be no special etiquette between president and governor each being the supreme head of an independent government no difference of rank can be admitted they are equals let us continue then as in general washington's time to write freely just as public business requires and with no more ceremony than obvious propriety and convenience dictate if it be possible he said to be certainly conscious of anything i am conscious of feeling no difference between writing to the highest and lowest being on earth End of section twenty five this recording is in the public domain section twenty six of the united states read for librivox dot org by sonia the claremont's first advertisement long before the end of the eighteenth century there were attempts to navigate by steam power but for the lack of a practical steam engine they failed in seventeen eighty two james watt produced his engine and then experimenters were numerous in both england and america a boat made by john fitch in america reached a speed of seven knots an hour in seventeen ninety seven robert fulton a pennsylvania boy of irish parents succeeded in building the claremont whose trial ship took place on the hudson river august seventh eighteen o seven in less than a month as is seen by the following advertisement she was making regular trips between new york and albany fulton can hardly be said to have invented steam navigation but he was certainly the first to make it a practical and financial success the editor the public is informed how to take passage on the claremont september second eighteen o seven the north river steamboat will leave paulus hook ferry on friday fourth of september at six in the morning and arrive at albany on saturday in the afternoon provisions good berth and accommodations are provided the charge to each passenger as follows to newburgh three dollars time fourteen hours to poughkeepsie four dollars time seventeen hours to esopus four and a half dollars time twenty hours to hudson five dollars time thirty hours to albany seven dollars time thirty six hours for places apply to william vandervoort number forty eight courtland street on the corner of greenwich street end of section twenty six this recording is in the public domain section twenty seven of the united states 
Read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 4, The Louisiana Territory, Historical Note. By treaties made at the close of the French and Indian and the Revolutionary Wars, Florida and the Louisiana Territory, that is, the country west of the Mississippi, and also both shores at its mouth, were given to Spain. In 1800, a secret treaty was made between Spain and France, by which all this area except Florida was retroceded to France. America was deeply interested, for no one knew to what length French ambition might go. Moreover, American commerce might easily be prohibited from passing out through the mouth of the Mississippi. President Jefferson sent Robert R. Livingston and James Monroe to France with authority from Congress to offer Napoleon two million dollars in cash for the island of New Orleans. Napoleon surprised them by offering to sell the whole Louisiana Territory, and in behalf of the American people, they purchased it for the sum of fifteen million dollars. By making this purchase, Jefferson more than doubled the area of the United States. Before 1803, that area was 827,844 square miles. Jefferson's purchase added over 900,000 square miles, out of which have since been formed the states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, and the two Dakotas, with a great part of the states of Minnesota and Colorado, and also the Indian Territory, including Oklahoma. West of the Louisiana Territory and north of the Spanish possessions was a magnificent and fertile country where white men had never set foot. To what nation Oregon belonged was doubtful. Its great river had been discovered in 1792 by Captain Robert Gray of Boston in the good ship Columbia, whose name he gave to the river. The illustrious British sailors Cook, Mears, and Vancouver had explored parts of the coast. In 1804, President Jefferson sent an overland expedition under Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. These explorers ascended the Missouri River to its sources, then found the Valley of the Columbia and explored it down to the Pacific Ocean, thus strengthening our claim to the possession of Oregon. Unquote. John Fisk. End of section 27. This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 28. Napoleon Plans to Sell Louisiana, 1803, by A. E. Winship and Robert W. Wallace. Know merely, Lucien, that I had decided to sell Louisiana to the Americans. This was the startling announcement made by the first consul of France to his younger brother, while disporting himself in his bath, scented with cologne water. The graphic story is narrated by Lucien Bonaparte in his memoirs, published in Paris in 1882. The evening before the incident of the bath, Joseph Bonaparte visited his brother Lucien with a piece of news that kept them from the theater for a night. The general wishes to alienate Louisiana, said Joseph. Bah, said Lucien, who will buy it from him? The Americans. The idea. If he could wish it, the chambers would not consent to it. And therefore, responded Joseph, he expects to do without their consent. That is what he replied to me. What? He really said that to you? That is a little too much. But no, it is impossible. It is a bit of brag at your expense. No, no, insisted Joseph. He spoke very seriously. And what is more, he added to me, that this sale would furnish him the first funds for war. The brothers parted for the night with the understanding that they would visit Napoleon early the next morning, when they hoped to dissuade him from alienating the colony. The morning found them both at the Tuileries, 
just as napoleon had entered his bath he invited them in the conversation reverted at once to louisiana the brothers endeavoring to dissuade him lucien quietly joseph more warmly from alienating the territory and both urging the point that the chambers will not give their consent to it gentlemen said napoleon from his perfumed bath think what you please about it but give up this affair as lost both of you you lucien on account of the sale in itself you joseph because i shall get along without the consent of any one whomsoever do you understand at this joseph lost his temper and approaching the bathtub replied in an angry tone you will do well my dear brother not to expose your plans to parliamentary discussion for i declare to you that i am the first one to place himself if it is necessary at the head of the opposition which cannot fail to be made to you this vehement resolution was met by more than olympian bursts of laughter from napoleon which angered joseph still more and led him to exclaim laugh 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 then none the less i will do what i say and although i do not like to mount the tribune this time they shall see me there upon this napoleon lifted himself halfway out of his bath and said in a tone energetically serious and solemn you will have no need to stand forth as orator of the opposition for i repeat to you that this discussion will not take place for the reason that the plan which is not fortunate enough to obtain your approbation conceived by me negotiated by me will be ratified and executed by me all alone do you understand by me who snapped my fingers at your opposition by this time joseph was close to the bathtub his face red with anger and heated words about to pass his lips when napoleon suddenly sank himself into the water of which the tub was full and a wave splashed joseph from head to foot he had received says lucien all over him the most copious ablution but the perfume flood calmed joseph's anger and he contented himself with letting the valet sponge and dry his clothes the brothers meanwhile regretting greatly that the valet had remained a witness of this serious folly between such actors end of section twenty eight this recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section twenty nine of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by ava march tappan section twenty nine the bargain purchase of the louisiana territory eighteen o three by james parton bonaparte's plan was to invade england a thing of immense difficulty and vast expense he wanted money and dared not press the french people further at the beginning of a war on easter sunday april ten in the afternoon after having taken conspicuous part in the revived ceremonies of the occasion mr monroe being still many leagues from paris but expected hourly the first consul opened a conversation with two of his ministers upon louisiana one of these ministers who reports the scene was that old friend of jefferson's barbe marbois for whom twenty-six years before he had compiled his notes on virginia a gentleman ten years resident at philadelphia where he married the daughter of a governor of pennsylvania the other minister had served in america under rochambeau during the revolutionary war i know said the first consul speaking with passion and vehemence i know the full value of louisiana and i have been desirous of repairing the fault of the french negotiator who abandoned it in seventeen sixty three 
a few lines of a treaty have restored it to me and i have scarcely recovered it when i must expect to lose it but if it escapes from me it shall one day cost dearer to those who oblige me to strip myself of it than to those to whom i wish to deliver it the english have successively taken from france canada cape breton newfoundland nova scotia and the richest portions of asia they shall not have the mississippi which they covet i have not a moment to lose in putting it out of their reach i think of ceding it to the united states i can scarcely say that i cede it to them for it is not yet in our possession if however i leave the least time to our enemies i shall only transmit an empty title to those republicans whose friendship i seek they only ask of me one town in louisiana but i already consider the colonies entirely lost and it appears to me that in the hands of this growing power it will be more useful to the policy and even to the commerce of france than if i should attempt to keep it he paused to hear the opinion of the two ministers barbe marbois said in a long discourse the province is as good as gone let the americans have it the other said at great length no there is still a chance of our being able to keep it it will be time to give up so precious a possession when we must the three continued to converse on the subject till late at night and the master broke up the conference without announcing his decision the ministers remained at st cloud at daybreak barbe marbois received the summons to attend the first consul in his cabinet dispatches had arrived from england showing that the king and ministry were entirely resolved upon war and were pushing preparations with extraordinary vigor when monsieur marbois had read these bonaparte resumed the subject of the evening's conversation irresolution and deliberation he said are no longer in reason i renounce louisiana it is not only new orleans that i will cede it is the whole colony without any reservation i renounce it with the greatest regret to attempt obstinately to retain it would be folly i direct you to negotiate this affair with the envoys of the united states do not even wait the arrival of mr monroe have an interview this very day with mr livingston but i require a great deal of money for this war and i would not like to commence it with new contributions if i should regulate my terms according to the value of those vast regions to the united states the indemnity would have no limits i will be moderate in consideration of the necessity in which i am of making a sale but keep this to yourself i want fifty million francs and for less than that sum i will not treat i would rather make a desperate attempt to keep those fine countries to-morrow you shall have your full powers the deed was done the rest was merely the usual cheapening and chaffering that passes between buyer and seller when the commodity has no market price mr monroe's arrival was well timed for mr livingston had lost all faith in the possibility of getting new orleans by purchase and was unprepared even to consider a proposition for buying the whole province he evidently thought that the french ministers were all liars together and he looked upon this sudden change of tone after so many months of neglect or evasion as a mere artifice for delay if mr monroe agrees with me said livingston to talleyrand a day or two before monroe's arrival we shall negotiate no further on the subject but advise our government to take possession the times are critical and though i do not know what instructions mr monroe may bring i am perfectly satisfied they will require a precise and prompt notice i am fearful from the little progress i have made that my government will consider me a very indolent negotiator talleyrand laughed i will give you a certificate said he that you are the most importunate one i have yet met with but mr livingston soon discovered that all had really changed with regard to louisiana on the day after monroe's arrival while sitting at dinner with him and other guests livingston espied monsieur barbe marbois strolling about in his garden 
During the interview that followed, business made progress. Marbois took the liberty of telling a few diplomatic falsehoods to the American minister. Instead of the fifty millions, which in his History of Louisiana, he says Napoleon demanded, he told Mr. Livingston that the sum required was one hundred millions. He represented the first consul as saying, Well, you have charge of the treasury. Make the Americans give you one hundred millions, pay their claim, and take the whole country. Mr. Livingston was aghast at the magnitude of the sum. After a long conversation, Marbois dropped to sixty million, the United States to pay its own claimants, which would require twenty million more. It is in vain to ask such a thing, said Livingston. It is so greatly beyond our means. He thought, too, that his government would be perfectly satisfied with New Orleans and Florida, and had no disposition to extend across the river. Then it was that Mr. Monroe, fresh from Washington, and knowing the full extent of the President's wishes, knowing his aversion to the mere proximity of the French, came upon the scene with decisive and most happy effect. In a few days all was arranged. Monsieur Barbet Marbois's offer was accepted. Twenty days after the St. Cloud Conference, and eighteen days after Mr. Monroe's arrival, the convention was concluded, which gave imperial magnitude and completeness to the United States, and supplied Napoleon with fifteen millions of dollars to squander upon a vain attempt to invade and ravage another country. Monsieur Marbois related that as soon as the three negotiators had signed the treaties, they all rose and shook hands. Mr. Livingston gave utterance to the joy and satisfaction of them all. We have lived long, said he, but this is the noblest work of our whole lives. The treaty which we have just signed has not been obtained by art nor dictated by force, and is equally advantageous to the two contracting parties. It will change vast solitudes into flourishing districts. From this day the United States take their place among the powers of the first rank. The United States will re-establish the maritime rights of all the world, which are now usurped by a single nation. The instruments which we have just signed will cause no tears to be shed. They prepare ages of happiness for innumerable generations of human creatures. Mississippi and Missouri will see them succeed one another and multiply, truly worthy of the regard and care of providence in the bosom of equality, under just laws, freed from the errors of superstition and bad government. End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 30 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Taking Possession of Louisiana Territory by Tour de Tourstrup. Painting, page 114. On the 20th of December, 1803, Louisiana was turned over to the American commissioners general wilkinson and governor claiborne the commissioners had come to new orleans and encamped just outside the walls of the city three days before and sent a messenger asking for a conference in which they might arrange for the transfer on the twentieth the americans marched into the city led by the commissioners and were received by lazar the french commander delivered to claiborne the keys of the city the french flag descended from the staff in the square and was replaced by the American flag. There was no very great enthusiasm, because the people had nothing to do about making the change, and they did not know what it might mean for them. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of The United States. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The World's Story, Volume 13. The United States, 
edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 31. Exploring the Louisiana Territory by James Parton. In 1804, the government sent out a party under Meriwether Lewis and James Clark to explore the new purchase from France. They were to cross the continent, trace the Missouri River to its source, and open negotiations with the various Indian tribes along their way. The Editor The party consisted of two officers and forty-three men. They sailed up the Missouri in three boats. The largest was fifty-five feet long, drew three feet of water, had ten feet of deck in the stern, and a ten-foot forecastle. It was propelled by twenty-two oars, a side being provided with a large square sail, and it had movable sides that could be raised, so as to protect the crew from the fire of an enemy. The other two boats, one of six and one of seven oars, were open. Beside the boats, they had two horses, designed to be led along the banks for occasional use in exploring and hunting. Their stores consisted of a great quantity of ammunition, a supply of concentrated food of various kinds, and fourteen bales of Indian presents, such as richly laced coats, flags, medals, knives, tomahawks, beads, mirrors, handkerchiefs, ribbons, and paints. Starting up the Missouri on that bright May morning in 1804, the whole party seemed to have been possessed with a quiet, modest confidence in the success of the expedition. In such an affair as this, imaginary perils usually far transcend the real dangers. The private soldiers, as we learn from the diary of a sergeant, expected to pass through a country possessed by numerous powerful and warlike nations of savages, of gigantic stature, fierce, treacherous, and cruel, and particularly hostile to white people. Rumor had also given out that the mountains that lay in their path were inaccessible to human effort, but they all seemed fully resolved to accomplish the purpose of the government, and satisfy the high expectations of the people, unless prevented by absolute impossibilities. Sailing about twenty-five miles a day, never hasting, seldom resting, pausing now and then to hold talks with the Indians, or to secure supplies of game, they kept steadily on their way. In a month they were past the Kansas River. They celebrated the Fourth of July by firing a swivel at sunrise and sunset, drinking a glass of grog all round, and naming a creek on which they encamped Independence. August 2, 1804, they held a grand council on some high land adjoining the river, which, in consequence, has borne the name ever since of Council Bluffs. Soon they came to their first buffalo, and discovered the prairie dog, and at last, November 2nd, six months after starting, they went into winter quarters among the Mandan Indians, 1,610 miles above the mouth of the Missouri River. After a winter of no great hardship, during which they subsisted upon elk, buffalo, antelope, deer, porcupine, prairie dogs, and wild turkeys, they were ready, April 7, 1805, to resume the ascent of the river. The large boat, however, they sent back to St. Louis, with their diaries, bales of furs, horns of the antelope, and thirteen of their number, while thirty-one men and one squaw formed the party for further exploration. May 3, 1805, they passed a stream to which they gave the name Two Thousand Mile River. Then they came to the region of the grizzly bear, an animal none of them had either seen or heard of, but in hunting which they had remarkable success. Having arrived at the forks of the Missouri, they tried their skill at bestowing suitable names upon the various branches and neighboring streams. The north branch they called Jefferson, the south, Gallatin, the middle, Madison. One small river above the forks they named Philosophy, and another below they called Maria, after the president's youngest daughter. Another branch was called Wisdom, another Philanthropy. 
All of these names had but one object, which was to do honor to the president. August 11, they passed 3,000 Mile Island, and August 18, they left the Missouri, and after working their way across the mountains with exceeding difficulty, by a road which is still called Lewis and Clark's Pass, they bought 27 horses and one mule of the Indians, which brought them in three weeks to the Columbia River. They buried their saddles upon its banks, entrusted their horses to the Indians, and having made canoes, they embarked and floated down toward the ocean. In just a month they reached tidewater and heard of ships. Eleven days more brought them to where huge waves came rolling in from the broad Pacific. November 15, 1805, one year and six months after leaving the Mississippi River, they saw the Pacific. But now winter was upon them. They constructed huts, made salt, sent out hunting parties, gained the friendship of the Indians, and made themselves comfortable until the 23rd of March, 1806, when they started on their return. The last entry of Captain Lewis's journal, written on the 23rd of September, 1806, was as follows. Tuesday, 23rd, descended to the Mississippi and round to St. Louis, where we arrived at twelve o'clock, and, having fired a salute, went on shore and received the heartiest welcome from the whole village. They had been gone two years, four months, and ten days, long before they had been generally given up as lost, and this unexpected return was the great sensation of that year. Never, says Mr. Jefferson, did a similar event excite more joy through the United States. The humblest of its citizens had taken a lively interest in the issue of this journey, and looked forward with impatience for the information it would furnish. Captain Lewis's diary was published in London in a costly, solid quarto, and in Philadelphia in two volumes, octavo. The maps and charts, the observations and specimens which were very numerous and most accurately taken, were deposited among the archives of the government. Congress made a grant of land to all the members of the party, and the President appointed the two chiefs to important territorial governorships. End of Section 31 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 32 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 32. Lewis and Clark at the Source of the Missouri from their journal monday august the twelfth eighteen o five this morning as soon as it was light captain lewis sent drewyer to reconnoitre if possible the route of the indians in about an hour and a half he returned after following the tracks of the horse which we had lost yesterday to the mountains where they ascended and were no longer visible captain lewis now decided on making the circuit along the foot of the mountains which formed a cove expecting by that means to find a road across them and accordingly sent drewyer on one side and shields on the other in this way they crossed four small rivulets near each other on which were some bowers or conical lodges of willow brush which seemed to have been made recently from the manner in which the ground in the neighbourhood was torn up the indians appeared to have been gathering roots but captain lewis could not discover what particular plant they were searching for nor could he find any fresh track till at the distance of four miles from his camp he met a large plain indian road which came into the cove from the northeast and wound along the foot of the mountain to the southwest approaching obliquely the main stream he had left yesterday down this road he now went toward the southwest 
At the distance of five miles it crossed a large run or creek, which is a principal branch of the main stream into which it falls, just above the high cliffs or gates observed yesterday, and which they now saw below them. Here they halted and breakfasted on the last of the deer, keeping a small piece of pork in reserve against accident. They then continued through the low bottom along the main stream, near the foot of the mountains on their right. For the first five miles the valley continues towards the southwest, from two to three miles in width. Then the main stream, which had received two small branches from the left in the valley, turns abruptly to the west through a narrow bottom between the mountains. The road was still plain, and, as it led them directly towards the mountain, the stream gradually became smaller till, after going two miles, it had so greatly diminished in width that one of the men, in a fit of enthusiasm, with one foot on each side of the river, thanked God that he had lived to bestride the Missouri. As they went along, their hopes of soon seeing the waters of the Columbia arose almost to painful anxiety when, after four miles from the last abrupt turn of the river, they reached a small gap formed by the high mountains which recede on each side, leaving room for the Indian road. From the foot of one of the lowest of these mountains, which rises with a gentle ascent of about half a mile, issues the remotest water of the Missouri. They had now reached the hidden source of that river, which had never yet been seen by civilized man. And, as they quenched their thirst at the chaste and icy fountain, as they sat down by the brink of that little rivulet, which yielded its distant and modest tribute, to the parent ocean, they felt themselves rewarded for all their labours and all their difficulties. They left reluctantly this interesting spot, and, pursuing the Indian road through the interval of the hills, arrived at the top of a ridge from which they saw high mountains partially covered with snow still to the west of them. The ridge on which they stood formed a dividing line between the waters of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. They followed a descent much steeper than that on the eastern side, and at the distance of three-quarters of a mile reached a handsome, bold creek of cold, clear water running to the westward. They stopped to taste for the first time the waters of the Columbia and after a few minutes followed the road across the steep hills and low hollows till they reached a spring on the side of a mountain. Here they found a sufficient quantity of dry willow brush for fuel, and therefore halted for the night. End of section 32. Recording by Alan Mapstone. Section 33 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 33. Sacagawea, 1804, by Edna Dean Proctor. Sacagawea was the Indian woman who acted as a guide to the Lewis and Clark expedition to the Pacific Ocean. The Editor Shoshone Sacagawea, captive and wife was she, on the grassy plains of Dakota, in the land of the Minitari. But she heard the west wind calling, and longed to follow the sun, back to the shining mountains, and the glens where her life begun. So when the valiant captains, fain for the Asian sea, stayed their marvellous journey in the land of the Minotauri, the red men wondering weary, Omaha Mandan Sioux, friendly now, now hostile, as they toiled the wilderness through, glad she turned from the grassy plains and led their way to the west, her course as true as the swans that flew north to its reedy nest. 
her eye as keen as the eagle's when the young lambs feed below her ear alert to the stags at morn guarding the fawn and doe straight was she as a hillside fir lithe as the willow tree and her foot as fleet as the antelopes when the hunter rides the lee embroidered tunic and moccasins with braided raven hair and closely belted buffalo robe with her baby nestling there girl of but sixteen summers the homing bird of the quest free of the tongues of the mountains deep on her heart impressed shoshone sakagawea led the way to the west to missouri's broad savannas dark with bison and deer while the grizzly roamed the savage shore and the cougar and wolf prowled near to the cataract's leap and the meadows with lily and rose abloom the sunless trails of the forest and the canyons hush and gloom by the veins of gold and silver and the mountains vast and grim their snowy summits lost in clouds on the wide horizon's brim through sombre pass by soaring peak till the asian wind blew free and lo the roar of the oregon and the splendour of the sea some day in the lordly upland where the snow-fed streams divide a foam for the far atlantic a foam for pacific's tide there by the valiant captains whose glory will never dim while the sun goes down to the asian sea and the stars in ether swim she will stand in bronze as richly brown as the hue of her girlish cheek with broidered robe and braided hair and lips just curved to speak and the mountain winds will murmur as they linger along the crest shoshone sakagawea who led the way to the west end of section 33 this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone section 34 of the united states read for librivox.org the united states volume 2 part 5 the war of 1812 historical note to prevent england from interfering with american commerce and from exercising what she claimed to be her right of search war was declared against great britain in 1812 this was an audacious act for england had sixty times as many warships as the united states and although she was also at war with france at the time she had a large and well-trained army in this war the advantage on land was with the british and on the sea with the americans the attempts of the United States to invade Canada were defeated by the land battles of Queenstown Heights and Lundy's Lane, and counterattacks on the Northwest Territory and on northern New York were frustrated by Perry's naval victory on Lake Erie and McDonough's on Lake Champlain. On the ocean, especially in the first part of the war, the Americans won a series of brilliant victories, and the exploits of the Constitution, the Wasp, the United States, and the Essex aroused the wildest enthusiasm throughout the country. But by the close of the war, superior numbers enabled the British to establish a blockade of the principal ports that kept most of the American frigates idly at anchor. In the summer of 1814, a British fleet sailed up the Chesapeake Bay and landed a force of soldiers that entered Washington with little difficulty and burned the government buildings. Napoleon having been dethroned, the British were able to send more soldiers to America. Early in 1815, a strong force of Wellington's veterans attempted to capture New Orleans, but were defeated with heavy loss by a small force of riflemen under General Jackson. This battle was unnecessary as news was on the way of a treaty of peace that had been signed at Ghent two weeks before. By the terms of the treaty, matters were left as they were before the war but as the struggle with Napoleon was over, England had no further occasion to assert her right of search. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of the United States, 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section thirty five what caused the second war with england eighteen twelve by agnes c blount england was hard pressed in a life-and-death struggle with napoleon to recruit both army and navy conscription was rigidly and ruthlessly enforced yet more england claimed the right to impress british-born subjects in foreign ports to seize deserters in either foreign ports or on foreign ships and most obnoxious of all to search neutral vessels on the ocean highway for deserters from the british flag it was an era of great brutality in military discipline desertions were frequent also thousands of immigrants were flocking to the new nation of the united states and taking out naturalization papers england ignored these naturalization papers when taken out by deserters let us see how the thing worked out a passenger vessel is coming up new york harbor an english frigate with cannon pointed swings across the course signals the american vessel on american waters to slow up sends a young lieutenant with some marines across to the american vessel searches her from stem to stern or compels the american captain to read the roster of the crew forcibly seizes half a dozen of the american crew as british deserters and departs leaving the americans gasping with wonder whether they are a free nation or a tail to the kite of english designs it need not be explained that the offence was often aggravated by the swaggering insolence of the young officers they considered the fury of the unprepared american crew a prime joke in vain the government at washington complained to the government at westminster england pigeonholed the complaint and went serenely on her way searching american vessels from canada to brazil or an english vessel has come to hampton roads to wood and water an english officer thinks he recognizes among the american crews men who have deserted from english vessels three men defy arrest and show their naturalization papers high words follow broken heads and broken canes and the english crew are glad to escape the mob by rowing out to their own vessel is it surprising that the ill feeling on both sides accumulated till there lacked only the match to cause an explosion the explosion came in eighteen o seven h m s leopard cruising off norfolk in june encounters the united states ship chesapeake at three p m the english ship edges down on the american loaded to the water-line with lumber and signals a messenger will be sent across the young english lieutenant going aboard the chesapeake shows written orders from admiral barclay of halifax commanding a search of the chesapeake for six deserters he is very courteous and pleasant about the disagreeable business the orders are explicit he must obey his admiral the american commander is equally courteous he regrets that he must refuse to obey an english admiral's orders but his own government has given most explicit orders that american vessels must not be searched the young englishman returns with serious face the ships were within pistol shot of each other the men on the english decks all at their guns the americans off guard lounging on the lumber piles quick as a flash a cannon shot rips across the chesapeake's bows followed by a broadside and another and yet another that riddle the american decks to kindling wood before the astonished officers can collect their senses six seamen are dead and twenty-three wounded when the chesapeake strikes her colors to surrender but the leopard does not want a captive she sends her lieutenant back who musters the four hundred american seamen 
picks out four men as british deserters learns that another deserter has been killed and a sixth has jumped overboard rather than be retaken takes his prisoners back to the leopard which proceeds to halifax where they are tried by court-martial and shot it isn't exactly surprising that the episode literally set the united states on fire with rage and that the american president at once ordered all american ports closed to british war vessels the quarrel dragged on between the two governments for five years england saw at once that she had gone too far and violated international law she repudiated admiral barclay's order offered to apologize and pension the heirs of the victims but as she would not repudiate either the right of impressment or the right of search the american government refused to receive the apology other causes fanned the flame of war the united states was now almost the only nation neutral in napoleon's wars to cripple english commerce napoleon forbids neutral nations trading at english ports by way of retaliation england forbids neutral nations trading with french ports and the united states strikes back by closing american ports to both nations it means blue ruin to american trade but the united states cannot permit herself to be ground between the upper and nether millstones of two hostile european powers then sharp as a gamester playing his trump card napoleon revokes his embargo in eighteen ten which leaves england the offender against the united states then governor craig of canada commits an error that must have delighted the heart of napoleon who always profited by his enemy's blunders well-meaning but fatally ill and easily alarmed craig sends one john henry from montreal in eighteen o nine as spy to the united states for the double purpose of sounding public opinion on the subject of war and of putting any federalists in favor of withdrawing from the union in touch with british authorities craig goes home to england to die henry fails to collect reward for his ignoble services turns traitor and sells the entire correspondence to the war party in the united states for ten thousand dollars that spy business adds fuel to fire then there are other quarrels a deserter from the american army is found teaching school near cornwall in canada he is driven out of the little backwoods schoolhouse pricked across the field with bayonets out of the children's view and shot on canadian soil by american soldiers an outrage almost the same in spirit as the british crew's outrage on the chesapeake also in spite of apologies the warships clash again the english sloop little belt is cruising off cape henry in may of eighteen eleven looking for a french privateer when a sail appears over the sea the little belt pursues till she sights the commodore's blue flag of the united states frigate president then she turns about but by this time the president has turned the tables on the little sloop and is pursuing to find out what the former's conduct meant darkness settles over the two ships beating about the wind what sloop is that shouts an officer through a speaking trumpet from the american decks what ship is that bawls back a voice through the darkness from the little englander then before any one can tell who fired first in fact each accuses the other of firing first the cannon are pouring hot shot into each other's hulls till thirty men have fallen on the decks to the little belt apologies follow of course and explanations but that does not remedy the ill in fact when nations and people want to quarrel they can always find a cause war is declared in june of eighteen twelve by congress End of section thirty five. Section thirty six of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section thirty six how winfield scott rescued the irishman by james barnes in eighteen twelve general scott then a young lieutenant colonel of twenty-six years was taken prisoner by the british at the battle of queenstown 
the editor scott was in the cabin of the transport when he heard a loud voice demanding admission from the sentry at the cabin door and insisting upon the right to see him this the sentry vigorously denied scott hastened to the sentry's side and there found one of his own men much excited with some difficulty he quieted him and found out what was the matter they're sorting out every man who's got a bit of a brogue sir cried the soldier who showed a trace of his ancestry in his speech and they are going to send them over the seas to be tried for high treason there's young tom mcculloch who the same as myself was born in norfolk and mccurdy who was born in new york and they declare that all will be hanged for fighting against the king now it happened that there were a number of irishmen who were actually born in ireland but had emigrated to america and had enlisted in the american ranks there were even among the non-commissioned officers a few hardy old veterans of the revolution who could claim the emerald isle as the place of their birth scott saw that his presence on deck was at once necessary he was placed under no restraint on board the vessel and so brushing by the sentry in two leaps he was up the ladder and stood on the quarter-deck there he saw the prisoners numbering over two hundred standing under a guard of marines in the waist an officer was calling their names from a list in his hand twenty-three men had already been separated from the others and stood to one side with forlorn and disconsolate looks they had already been told off as prisoners to be detained and sent to england for trial scott stood out on the deck before them the officer looked up from the paper he was reading well sir he asked what can i do for you you can explain scott replied the reason for this discrimination i was led to understand that all of the men placed aboard this vessel were to be sent to the united states for exchange there are some traitors here the officer replied subjects of his majesty who have been taken in arms against him and we are led to believe that there are also not a few deserters from our service we have a right to investigate i deny that right sir scott replied a man who enlists in the army of the united states and fights as provided under the constitution becomes a citizen and is entitled to all privileges and protection and i warn you sir that the interests of every man shall be looked after you forget your position sir replied the officer hotly you're a prisoner and i order you below to the cabin i am on my parole scott thundered and you can send me to my cabin by the use of force only for i decline to go it is my privilege to look after the personal safety of my men the officer waved his hand toward the twenty-three disconsolate ones who stood lined up against the bulwarks this is my answer he replied these irish renegades are traitors and will be tried as such any more of their ilk will suffer the same fate thomas mcnulty he read in a loud voice from the list he had in his hand scott now turned to the americans if there is a man named mcnulty among you he said i order him not to step forward and as your commanding officer i order not one of you to reply to a question addressed to you by any british officer aboard this ship in any manner whatever they cannot force you to speak therefore keep silent the men looked at their tall leader with hope mingled with admiration had he said the word unarmed as they were they would have thrown themselves upon the marine guard that at a whispered order from a young red-coated lieutenant had brought their pieces to the ready i know my rights i tell you scott added and though a prisoner they still exist let these men be returned as they were before no replied the officer these we are sure of twenty-three traitors who will suffer traitors fates turning to the officer of the guard he ordered that the unfortunate men collected should be taken off in the longboat waiting alongside and put on shore to be transferred to another ship scott's anger was now beyond all bounds stretching himself to his full height he pointed to the poor fellows that were being hustled toward the gangway 
observe you this he said for every one of those men an englishman will be set apart to abide the sentence placed upon them my country does not forget those who serve her in time of need then walking over to where the prisoners were he swept through the marines and grasped some of his men by their extended hands good-bye my lads he said don't fear keep up your courage no harm shall come to you with that he turned and acknowledging the salute of his own men who stood at attention with their fingers to their cap brims he went below in a few minutes the ship was under way it is a peculiar characteristic of the good officer and natural soldier that his men are always his first thought over and above all else should be their interest and welfare and let private soldiers once understand that this is the case and duty is exalted to almost a religion affection and a desire to serve take the place of instilled obedience self-sacrifice becomes a pleasure a handful of men animated by this spirit will fight harder than thrice their number without it scott always had this peculiar gift he would call upon men for almost superhuman endeavor and under his leadership they never failed to respond as soon as he reached boston scott went on to washington and in a short time was exchanged he drew up a report of the occurrence on board the cartel and informed the secretary of war of the matter and this very same day a report was presented to congress and immediately a passage of an act of retaliation followed this was on march three eighteen thirteen scott never allowed himself to forget and never lost sight of the unfortunate irishmen in the latter part of may at the capture of fort george where many prisoners were taken he picked out twenty-three as hostages to receive the same punishment that should be meted out to his own brave soldiers much unnecessary suffering followed perhaps for the english retaliated but scott's prompt redemption of his promise saved his irish troops a strange sequel to this occurrence took place two years afterward when he was on leave of absence and recovering from his wounds he was passing one of the piers on the east river new york city when suddenly he heard the sound of loud cheering stopping for an instant he found himself surrounded by a lot of excited men some of whom rushed forward endeavoring to take his hand or even to touch him they were the same twenty-three who had just that moment been landed after their long imprisonment they almost crushed their still weak and wounded general in their arms so great was their enthusiasm and gratitude it might be mentioned that he wrote to the department at washington on their behalf claiming full pay for their services during the time of their imprisonment and soliciting patents for land bounty both petitions it is pleasing to record were granted End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. On the Capture of the Guerriere by Philippe Frenot. Long the tyrant of our coast reigned the famous Guerriere. Our little navy she defied, public ship and privateer on her sails in letters read to our captains were displayed words of warning words of dread all who meet me have a care i am england's guerriere on the wide atlantic deep not her equal for the fight the constitution on her way chanced to meet these men of might on her sails was nothing said but her waist the teeth displayed that a deal of blood could shed which if she would venture near would stain the deck of the guerriere now our gallant ship they met and to struggle with john bull who had come they little thought strangers yet to isaac hull better soon to be acquainted isaac hailed the lord's anointed while the crew the cannon pointed and the balls were so directed with a blaze so unexpected isaac so did maul and rake her that the decks of captain dacre were in such a woeful pickle as if death with scythe and sickle with his sling or with his shaft had cut his harvest fore and aft thus in thirty minutes ended mischiefs that could not be mended masts and yards and ship descended all to david jones's locker such a ship in such a pucker drink about to the constitution she performed some execution did some share of retribution for the insults of the year when she took the guerriere may success again await her 
let who will again command her bainbridge rogers or decatur nothing like her can withstand her with a crew like that on board her who so boldly called to order one bold crew of english sailors long too long our seamen's jailers dacre and the guerriere end of section thirty seven this recording is in the public domain section thirty eight of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tapin the shannon and the chesapeake eighteen thirteen by thomas tracy bouvet the captain of the shannon came sailing up the bay a reeling wind flung out behind his pennons bright and gay his cannon crashed a challenge and the smoke that hid the sea was driven hard to windward and drifted back to lee the captain of the shannon sent word into the town was lawrence there and would he dare to sail his frigate down and meet him at the harbour mouth and fight him gun to gun for honour's sake with pride at stake until the fight was won now long the gallant lawrence had scoured the bitter main with many a scar and wound of war his ship was home again his crew relieved from service were scattered far and wide and scarcely one his duty done had lingered by his side but to refuse the challenge could he outlive the shame brave men and true but deadly few were gathered to his fame once more the great ship chesapeake prepared her for the fight i'll bring the foe to town in tow he said before to-night high on the hills of hingham that overlooked the shore to watch the fray and hope and pray for they could do no more the children of the country watched the children of the sea when the smoke drove hard to windward and drifted back to lee how can he fight they whispered with only half a crew though they be rare to do and dare yet what can brave men do but when the chesapeake came down the stars and stripes on high stilled was each fear and cheer on cheer resounded to the sky the captain of the shannon he swore both long and loud this victory where'er it be shall make two nations proud now onward to this victory or downward to defeat a sailor's life is sweet with strife a sailor's death as sweet and as when the lightnings rend the sky and gloomy thunders roar and crashing surge plays devil's dirge upon the stricken shore with thunder and with sheets of flame the two ships rang with shot and every gun burst forth a sun of iron crimson hot and twice they lashed together and twice they tore apart and iron balls burst wooden walls and pierced each oaken heart still from the hills of hingham men watched with hopes and fears while all the bay was torn that day with shot that rained like tears the tall masts of the chesapeake went groaning by the board the shannon's spars were weak with scars when broke cast down his sword now woe he cried to england and shame and woe to me the smoke drove hard to windward and drifted back to lee give them one breaking broadside more he cried before we strike but one grim ball that ruined all for hope and home alike laid lawrence low in glory yet from his pallid lip rang to the land his last command boys don't give up the ship the wounded wept like women when they hauled her ensign down men's cheeks were pale as with the tail from hingham to the town they hurried in swift silence while towards the eastern night the victor bore away from shore and vanished out of sight hail to the great ship chesapeake hail to the hero brave who fought her fast and loved her last and shared her sudden grave 
and glory be to those that died for all eternity they lie apart at the mother heart of god's eternal sea end of section thirty eight this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone in oxford england Section 39 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 39 how perry saved the northwest eighteen thirteen by charles morris in eighteen thirteen oliver hazard perry a young naval officer who had never seen an engagement was sent to lake erie to build a fleet from trees then standing in the forest and to conquer the british vessels on the lake the editor in a moment everybody was astir the boatswain's whistles called the men to the capstans and at the command of up anchor the vessels were soon free to move but the wind was unfavorable for leaving the harbor and the crews had to resort to oars in aid of their sails the instructions to the commanding officers chiefly consisted in the brief but famous one of nelson if you lay your enemy close alongside you cannot be out of place on reaching the open waters the enemy was sighted five or six miles away and the ships were headed towards him though the light and uncertain wind interfered much with progress perry for some time sought to gain the windward position but at length gave up the effort and decided to square away under the lee of the islands replying to the sailing master's remonstrance that this would bring him to leeward of the enemy i don't care to windward or to leeward they shall fight to-day but again the wind shifted this time a favorable change to the south and the americans now having the weather gauge were put before it and ran down with free sheets upon the enemy the ships were formed in line of battle on the plan decided upon and all hands ordered to clear them for action in the midst of this a roll of bunting was brought up from below and handed to perry on unfolding it there were seen in great white letters upon a blue field lawrence's dying words don't give up the ship my brave lads said perry to his men this flag bears the last words of captain lawrence shall i hoist it ay ay sir came in a hearty response and up to the main truck sped the significant flag it was now about ten o'clock the wind continued light and a broad space still divided the two fleets to hearten the men for the work before them captain perry now ordered food and the usual allowance of grog to be served the mess kits were then cleared away and needful precautions for the coming fight taken such as drenching the decks with water to render harmless any loose powder that might be scattered and sprinkling a layer of sand so as to give the men a good footing even if the decks were wet with blood barclay meanwhile had hove to his ships and was awaiting the americans the vessels drawn up in close array in a line square across the wind the little chippewa and the big detroit at the head against these perry advanced in the lawrence his flagship the little ariel and scorpion leading the way with these he headed for the detroit leaving the remainder of his fleet to come up as rapidly as possible and to deal with the other british craft all being thus disposed the squadron moved slowly onward before the light and baffling wind perry pacing his deck impatiently stopping at intervals for a word to the gun crews all of whom he found eagerly preparing for the fray at one gun were men from the constitution 
the most of them stripped to the waist and with handkerchiefs tied round their heads to keep their hair out of their eyes i need not say anything to you he remarked you know how to beat those fellows at another gun stood some of his old gunboat men ah here are the newport boys he said cheerily they will do their duty i warrant the cheers he got in response showed well the spirit of the men the vessels of the squadron rather drifted than sailed towards the enemy and as noon approached the nearest vessels were still a mile apart while the rear of the american fleet lay far behind far separated as the flagships now were almost beyond the range of the best guns of that day the impatience of the british gunners had grown beyond restraint and a gun roared from the detroit its ball plunging into the water before reaching its goal in a minute or two more a second ball with better aim came crashing through the bulwarks of the lawrence the battle was on through all this frightful turmoil perry stood on his quarter-deck cheering on his men his little brother beside him with no evidence of fear on his face as they stood two musket balls passed through the boy's hat then a splinter was driven through his clothing finally he was knocked headlong across the deck and perry's face paled at the sight but it proved to be only a flying hammock that had struck him and in a minute he was on his feet again all the officers in my division are cut down said so lieutenant yarnall his face covered with blood from a splinter that had been driven through his nose can i have others others were given him and he went forward again in a short time he was back with a similar request i have no more officers to give you said perry you must make out by yourself he did make out aiming and firing the guns with his own hands a duty which perry himself was later forced to perform like paul jones of old he kept at this until he had not enough men on the quarter-deck to aim and fire the one gun left in service going to the hatchway he asked for a man from the surgeon one was sent and two others in succession but still perry was obliged to repeat the demand there is not another man left to go said the surgeon then are there none of the wounded who can pull on a rope at this appeal three men crawled up the hatchway ladder to help with the gun tackles these with aid from the purser and chaplain rolled the gun out while perry aimed and fired it this was the last gun fired from the lawrence the next broadside from the enemy left not a single gun that could be worked the vessel itself was a wreck her bowsprit and masts had been in great part shot away while her hull was riddled only fourteen men remained unhurt in her crew of more than a hundred twenty had been killed but the american flag and the blue banner with its motto don't give up the ship floated still and perry remained inspired by its spirit for two hours he had kept up a fight seemingly hopeless from the start and he was still far from the thought of surrender during these two fateful hours the niagara had kept out of the battle but now with a fresher breeze in her sails she was coming briskly up headed for the right of the british line her route would take her a quarter of a mile or more from the lawrence the sight of this unharmed vessel aroused a new hope in the mind of the gallant commander on her deck he might be able to retrieve the fortunes of the day action quickly followed thought throwing off the blue jacket he had so far worn he put on his uniform coat and ordered a boat with four men to be lowered on the side of the lawrence out of the fiery storm his boy brother sprang into the boat with the men yarnall he said to his faithful lieutenant i leave that lawrence in your charge with discretionary power you may hold out or surrender as your judgment and the circumstances shall dictate then taking his pennant and the broad banner with the lawrence motto which had been hauled down and given him he climbed down into the boat and ordered his men to pull away for the niagara as soon as the boat was seen from the british fleet and the purpose of the american commander guessed every gun that could be brought to bear was turned upon it the water all around being churned by round shot grape canister and musket balls through this torrent of shot perry stood erect in the stern of his boat intent on inspiring his men with courage the flag and pennant draped round his shoulders as they neared their goal a round shot plunged through the side of the boat perry took off his coat and plugged the hole with it and thus the side of the niagara was reached 
the crisis of the battle was now reached stepping on the deck of this fresh ship amid the loud cheers of the crew perry saw at a glance that a splendid opportunity to turn defeat into victory was in his hands how goes the day asked elliot distance had prevented his seeing for himself bad enough replied perry why are the gunboats so far astern i'll bring them up do so springing into the boat that had brought perry up elliot rowed away as he did so perry's pennant and the blue flag of the lawrence were hauled aloft bringing ringing cheers from every american ship except the lawrence herself on which arnall not having a gun that could be fired hauled down his flag to prevent the useless butchery of his crew on all other vessels hope had replaced doubt and dismay putting up his helm perry drove his new flagship square for the british squadron which was now so bunched that in a few minutes he was in its midst firing from one battery into the chippewa and lady prevost from the other into the detroit hunter and queen charlotte the effect of the close fire on them was disastrous already severely injured by the guns of the lawrence this hot fire from a fresh ship was annihilating the detroit and the queen charlotte tried to swing around and meet him but fouled each other while perry ranging ahead rounded two and raked them both the other american vessels were joining in as they came within range and barclay stood aghast at the slaughter and destruction hurled on his hitherto seemingly victorious ships the crew of the lady prevost fled from the deck leaving their commander lieutenant buchan alone on the quarter-deck with bleeding limbs and staring eyes the tempest of shot and the torrent of destruction were more than even british valor could stand and eight minutes after perry's signal dash into their line a man came to the rail of the british flagship waving a white handkerchief tied to a boarding pike it was the signal of surrender perry was victor in one of the greatest battles of the war two of the british vessels sought to escape the chippewa and the little belt but they were pursued by the scorpion and the trip and brought in as captives captain champlin on the scorpion as he had fired the first now firing the last gun in the fight in honor of the good ship in which his great struggle had been made captain perry accepted the surrender of the british officers on the deck of the lawrence amid the frightful scene of ruin and carnage which it presented but the british had left as frightful scenes on their own decks for the niagara had amply avenged her consort in the destruction wrought this narrative might be prolonged much farther but we must close it with the famous dispatch to general harrison in which perry announced his victory we have met the enemy and they are ours two ships two brigs one schooner and one sloop the news of the victory spread with great rapidity through the nation and was everywhere received with enthusiastic rejoicing for it was felt that it had definitely turned back the tide of british success in that quarter and saved the settlers of the northwest from the terrible visitation of the indian allies of the british harrison aided by perry followed it up with an invasion of canada found proctor and his army in retreat and completely defeated them at the battle of the thames tecumseh the indian leader being killed the northwest was saved end of section thirty nine this recording is in the public domain section forty of the united states read for librivox dot org by meg huskin the battle of lake erie from an engraving painting page one forty eight the difficulties under which commodore perry labored were almost as great in building his fleet as in winning his famous victory r m devins says at presque isle ninety miles west of buffalo a peninsula extending a considerable distance into the lake encircles a harbor on the borders of which was the port of erie at this place commodore perry was directed to locate and superintend a naval establishment the object of which was to create a superior force on the lake the difficulties of building a navy in the wilderness can only be conceived by those who have experienced them there was nothing at this spot out of which it could be built but the timber of the forest shipbuilders sailors naval stores guns and ammunition were all to be transported by land in wagons and over bad roads a distance of four hundred miles either from albany by the way of buffalo or from philadelphia by the way of pittsburgh but under all these embarrassments 
By the 1st of August, 1813, Commodore Perry had provided a flotilla consisting of the ships Lawrence and Niagara, of 20 guns each, and seven smaller vessels, to wit, one of four guns, one of three, two of two, and three of one. While the ships were building, the enemy frequently appeared off the harbor and threatened their destruction. But the shallowness of the water on the bar, there being but five feet, prevented their approach. The same cause, which ensured the safety of the vessels while building, seemed likely to prevent their being of any service when completed. The two largest drew several feet more water than there was on the bar. The inventive genius of Perry, however, surmounted this difficulty. He placed large scows on either side of these two, filled them so that they sank to the water edge, and then attached them to the ships by strong pieces of timber, and pumped out the water. The scows, in this way, buoyed up the ships, enabling them to pass the bar in safety. This operation was performed in the very eyes of the enemy. End of section 40. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Meg Huskin. Section 41 of the United States, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Star-Spangled Banner, 1814, by Francis Scott Key. Never has a patriotic poem come so directly out of the thunder of battle as did the Star-Spangled Banner. Just before the bombardment of Fort McHenry, its author was sent to the British flagship to arrange for an exchange of prisoners. Here he was obliged to remain until the close of the attack. All through the night he watched the bursting of the shells, but in the first dim grey of the morning his vigil was rewarded, for the flag of the United States was still waving over the fort. Then it was that the poem was written. The Editor Oh, say, can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there o oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave on the shore, dimly seen through the mists of the deep, where the foe's haughty host in dread silence reposes, what is that which the breeze, o'er the towering steep, as it fitfully blows, now conceals, now discloses? Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected now shines on the stream. Tis the star-spangled banner, O oh, long may it wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion a home and a country should leave us no more? Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps' pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave and the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave oh thus be it ever when freemen shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation blessed with victory and peace may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation then conquer we must for our cause that is just and this be our motto, in God is our trust, and the star-spangled banner and triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of The United States 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42. Tikamsa, the Indian Brigadier General, 1813, by Charles H. L. Johnston. In the fighting of the War of 1812, this great chief showed that he could lead an army almost as well as a white man. His military talent was so great that he was made a brigadier general, a position which, to my knowledge, no other American Indian has ever held among white troops, except General Eli S. Parker, who commanded a detachment of regulars in the army of the Potomac during the War of the Rebellion. The celebrated Shawnee fought bravely at a fierce fight at Brownston, and was also at the siege of Detroit with about seven hundred warriors, when this city capitulated to the British. The whole American frontier was open to the ravages of the Indians and English after this event, and under General Proctor, the combined forces of Redskins and Red Coats swept down upon the border fortress of Fort Meigs, and here captured a number of prisoners, although they did not take the stockade. The Indians under Tikumsa numbered about 1,800 in the fighting at this place, and, giving way to their instincts, they tomahawked all that they could. General Proctor made no attempt to stop them, but was looking calmly at their fiendish work when he saw Tecumseh galloping forward at great speed. Reaching the scene of slaughter, the savage leaped from his horse, and seizing two Indians by the throat, knocked them to the ground. Then, drawing his tomahawk and scalping knife, he cried out, He of you who injures another prisoner will be killed by Tecumseh. How dare you wreak vengeance upon defenseless men? Cowards! Be gone! Cowed by his consuming wrath, the savages slunk away, while the great chief, turning to Proctor, said, Why, General, did you not stop this awful massacre? Sir, replied the British General, your Indians cannot be restrained. Be gone, thundered Tikumsa. You are not fit to command. Go home and put on the petticoat of a squaw. Shortly after this, the celebrated Shawnee noticed a small group of Indians nearby who were standing about some prisoners. "'Yonder are four of your people who have been taken prisoners,' said Colonel Elliot to him. "'You may do as you please with them.' Tikumsa, therefore, walked over to the group and found four Shawnees who, while fighting on the side of the Americans, had been unable to escape the British regulars and had been captured." friends said he colonel elliot has placed you in my charge and i will send you back to your nation to have a talk with your people so saying he took them with him for some distance and then sent two of his warriors to accompany them to their own chiefs where they were discharged under the promise that they would never fight again against the british during the war the disasters to the americans led the government to collect the larger army which was placed under the command of General Harrison, the hero of Tippy Canoe. Captain Oliver H. Perry built a fleet in Lake Erie, sailed out to attack the British boats, and defeated them. When he had done so, Harrison moved upon Fort Malden, where both Proctor and Tecumseh were stationed. The former burned the fort and retreated with Tecumseh's Indians, meaning to join the other British forces at Niagara, but before the retreat, when Harrison was at Fort Meigs, Tecumseh had sent him a personal challenge which ran, General Harrison, I have with me eight hundred braves. You have an equal number in your hiding place. Come out with them and give me battle. You talked like a brave when we met at Vincennes, and I respected you. But now you hide behind logs and in earth like a groundhog. Give me answer. Tecumseh. Harrison, however, refused to come out, and, as Proctor decided to retreat, Tecumseh seriously meditated a withdrawal from the contest. "'You always told us that you would never draw your foot off British ground,' said he to the English commander. 
Now, father, we see that you are drawing back, and we are sorry to see our father doing so without seeing the enemy. We must compare our father's conduct to a fat dog, which carries its tail on its back, but, when affrighted, drops it between its legs and runs off. Father, listen. The Americans have not yet defeated us by land, neither are we sure that they have done so by water. We, therefore, wish to remain here and fight our enemy, should he make his appearance. If we are defeated, we will then retreat with our father. Father, you have got the arms and ammunition which our great father sent to his red children. If you have an idea of going away, give them to us, and you may go, and welcome. For us, our lives are in the hand of the great spirit. We are determined to defend our lands, and if it be his will, we wish to leave our bones upon them. But Proctor would listen to no such talk, and pretended, from time to time, that he would halt and give battle. Much to the chagrin of the redskins, he kept on moving. Finally, he halted on the river Thames, in Michigan, near a Moravian town, and told Tecumseh that he would fight it out here with the advancing Americans. The great chief himself chose the ground for battling, with a marsh on one flank and a stream upon the other. "'Brother warriors,' said he to his chiefs, we are about to enter an engagement from which I shall, doubtless, never return. My body will remain upon the field of battle. Then, unbuckling his sword, he handed it to a chief, remarking, When my son becomes a noted warrior and able to wield a sword, give this to him. Proctor had placed his guns in the highway and had deployed his regulars between them and a little marsh. Another marsh was five hundred yards farther on, to the right, and here the Indians under Tecumseh were stationed, together with some British regulars. The rest of the Indians were sent out in front, upon the extreme right, in a position just in front of the swampy bottom of the larger marsh. The ground was nearly covered with an open growth of trees, without underbrush, so that there was little impediment to fighting. Harrison, as he came up, placed his mounted infantry in front, for this was his strongest force, composed of a splendid body of Kentucky frontiersmen under Colonel Richard M. Johnson, all of whom were well used to border warfare. The infantry was in the rear, with a considerable body on the left flank, turned at right angle to the line, so as to face the Indians in the marsh. They were told to advance at the blast of the bugle, and to fight as they had done at Tipi Canoe, commands which they obeyed quite faithfully. At the shrill note of the horn the horsemen trotted forward. Then, as the British regulars began to pepper them with bullets, they gave a wild cheer, galloped on, and soon were charging right into the lines of the English. Proctor knew that he was badly wanted by the Americans, because of his numerous massacres of defenseless non-combatants, and so leaped into a two-horse vehicle in order to escape. But a dozen well-mounted men galloped after him, and seeing that he was about to be captured, the faint-hearted Britisher jumped to the earth, took to the woods, and got safely off. Tecumseh's men, meanwhile, stood their ground and did not, at first, give way before the American advance. But soon the savages posted upon the extreme right before the marsh ran wildly into the woods. The valiant Tecumseh was shot in the arm, but, disdaining to fly, stood up manfully, while his wild, inspiring war-whoop was loudly heard upon the din of battle. Thus he was holding his own men to their work, when the Kentucky cavalry, having dispersed Proctor's regulars, returned to the field of battle. Forming for the attack, they rushed, with a wild cheer, upon the mixed battalion of reds and whites. Johnson himself was soon near the great chief, and shot at him with his pistol. Tecumseh fell, whether from this shot or not, is not definitely known. The tide of conflict rolled by the prostrate form of the mighty Shawnee, and, with fierce cheers of victory, the Americans chased the now routed British and Indians into the forest, securing a complete and overwhelming victory. Near the battlefield, where a large oak lay prostrate by a willow marsh, the faithful Shawnees buried Tecumseh, after the American army, flushed with success, returned to the United States. 
the British government granted a pension to the widow of the noted warrior, and to his son gave a sword. The willows and rose bushes now grow thick above the mound where repose, in silence and solitude, the ashes of the mighty chief of the Shawnees. He struggled in vain against the inevitable, and his simple grave is only one of the many monuments which mark the restless, overwhelming advance of the conquering Americans. He fought a good fight. His fame is secure upon the golden pages of history. End of section 42「Section 43 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 43. The Privateers of 1812 by Willis J. Abbott. The declaration of war had hardly been made public when the hundreds of shipyards from Maine to Savannah resounded with the blows of hammers and the grating of saws as the shipwrights worked, busily refitting old vessels or building new ones, destined to cruise against the commerce of John Bull. All sorts of vessels were employed in the service, the Atlantic and Gulf coasts fairly swarmed with small pilot boats, mounting one long gun amidships, and carrying crews of twenty to forty men. These little craft made rapid sallies into the waters of the Gulf Stream, in search of British West Indiamen homeward bound. Other privateers were huge three-masters, carrying heavy batteries, and able to outsail any of the enemy's ships. On leaving port for a long cruise, these vessels would carry enormous crews, so that captured vessels might be manned and sent home. After a successful cruise, such a privateer returned to port, seldom bringing more than one-fifth of the crew with which she had set out. But the favorite rig for a privateer was that of the topsail schooner, such a rig as the enterprise carried during the war with france the famous shipyards of baltimore turned out scores of clean-cut clipper-built schooners with long low hulls and raking mass which straightway took to the ocean on privateering cruises the armament of these vessels generally consisted of six to ten cannonades and one long pivot gun going by the pet name of long tom mounted amidships the crew was usually a choice assortment of cutthroats and seafaring vagabonds of all classes ready enough to fight if plunder was to be gained but equally ready to surrender if only honour was to be gained by fighting Yet history records a few actions in which the privateersmen showed a steadiness and courage worthy of seamen of the regular service. One of the first things to attract the attention of the reader in the dingy files of some newspaper of 1812 to 1815 is the grotesque names under which many of the privateers sailed the grandiloquent style of the regular navy vanishes and in its place we find homely names such as jack's favorite lovely lass rowboat saucy jack or true-blooded yankee some names are clearly political allusions as the orders in council and the fair trade the black joke the shark and the anaconda must have had a grim significance for the luckless merchantmen who fell a prey to the vessels bearing these names bunker hill and divided we fall though odd names to sail under seemed to bring luck to the two vessels which were very successful in their cruises united we stand was a luckless craft however taking only one prize while the achievements of the full-blooded Yankee and the sine qua non were equally limited. 
of the poor sailor certainly little was to be expected and it is with no surprise that we find she captured only one prize among the most successful privateers was the rossi of baltimore commanded by the revolutionary veteran captain barney who left her finally to assume command of the american naval forces of chesapeake bay she was a clipper-built schooner carrying fourteen guns and a crew of one hundred and twenty men the destruction wrought by this one cruiser was enormous in a ninety days cruise she captured sunk or otherwise destroyed british property to the amount of a million and a half dollars and took two hundred and seventeen prisoners all this was not done without some hard fighting one prize his britannic majesty's packet ship princess amelia was armed with nine pounders and made a gallant defence before surrendering several men were killed and the rossi suffered the loss of her first lieutenant the prisoners taken by the rossi were exchanged for americans captured by the british with the first body of prisoners thus exchanged barney sent a cool note to the british commander at new brunswick assuring him that before long a second batch of his captured countrymen should be sent in perhaps the foremost of all the fighting privateers was the general armstrong of new york a schooner mounting eight long lines and one long twenty-four on a pivot she had a crew of ninety men and was commanded on her first cruise by captain guy r champlin this vessel was one of the first to get to sea and had cruised for several months with fair success when in march eighteen thirteen she gave chase to a sail off the surinam river on the coast of south america the stranger seemed to evince no great desire to escape and the privateer soon gained sufficiently to discover that the supposed merchantman was a british sloop of war whose long row of open ports showed that she carried twenty-seven guns Champlin and his men found this a more ugly customer than they had expected, but it was too late to retreat, and to surrender was out of the question. So, calling the people to the guns, Champlin took his ship into action with a steadiness that no old naval captain could have exceeded. Close quarters and quick work was the word passed along the gun deck and the Armstrong was brought alongside her antagonist at a distance of half pistol shot. For nearly an hour the two vessels exchanged rapid broadsides, but though the American gunners were the better marksmen, the heavy build of the sloop of war enabled her to stand against broadsides which would have cut the privateer to pieces captain champlin was hit in the shoulder early in the action but kept his station until the fever of his wound forced him to retire to his cabin however he still continued to direct the course of the action and seeing that the tide of battle was surely going against him he ordered the crew to get out the sweeps and pull away from the enemy whose rigging was too badly cut up to enable her to give chase this was quickly done and the general armstrong though badly injured and with her decks covered with dead and dying men escaped leaving her more powerful adversary to repair damages and make the best of her way home captain champlin on his arrival at new york was the hero of the hour for a privateer to have held out for an hour against a man-of-war was thought a feat worthy of praise from all classes of men the merchants of the city tendered the gallant captain a dinner and the stockholders in his vessel presented him with a costly sword but the general armstrong was destined to fight yet another battle which should far eclipse the glory of her first a new captain was to win the laurels this time for captain champlin's wound had forced him to retire and his place was filled by captain samuel c reed 
on the twenty sixth of september eighteen fourteen the privateer was lying at anchor in the roadstead of fayal over the land that enclosed the snug harbour on three sides waved the flag of portugal a neutral power but unfortunately one of insufficient strength to enforce the rights of neutrality while the armstrong was thus lying in the port a british squadron composed of the plantagenet seventy four the rota thirty eight and carnation eighteen hove in sight and soon swung into the harbour and dropped anchor reed watched the movements of the enemy with eager vigilance he knew well that the protection of portugal would not aid him in the least should the captain of that seventy-four choose to open fire upon the armstrong the action of the british in coming into the harbour was in itself suspicious and the american had little doubt that the safety of his vessel was in jeopardy while he was pacing the deck and weighing in his mind the probability of an assault by the british he caught sight of some unusual stir aboard the hostile ships it was night but the moon had risen and by its pale light reed saw four large barges let fall from the enemy's ships and manned by about forty men each make toward his vessel in an instant every man on the privateer was called to his post that there was to be an attack was now certain and the americans determined not to give up their vessel without at least a vigorous attempt to defend her reed's first act was to warp his craft under the guns of a rather dilapidated castle which was supposed to uphold the authority of portugal over the island and adjacent waters Hardly had the position been gained when the foremost of the British boats came within hail, and Captain Reed shouted, Boat ahoy! What boat's that? No response followed the hail, and it was repeated with the warning, Answer, or I shall fire into you. Still the British advanced without responding, and Reed, firmly convinced that they purposed to carry his ship, with a sudden dash ordered his gunners to open on the boats with grape this was done and at the first volley the british turned and made off captain reed then warped his vessel still nearer shore and bending springs on her cable so that her broadside might be kept always toward the enemy he awaited a second attack at midnight the enemy were seen advancing again this time with fourteen barges and about five hundred men. While the flotilla was still at long range, the Americans opened fire upon them with the heavy long tom, and, as they came nearer, the full battery of long nine-pounders took up the fight. The carnage in the advancing boats was terrible, but the plucky Englishmen pushed on, meeting the privateer's fire with volleys of musketry and carronades. Despite the American fire, the British succeeded in getting under the bow and quarter of the Armstrong, and strove manfully to board, while the Americans fought no less bravely to keep them back. The attack became a furious hand-to-hand -hand battle. From behind the boarding nettings, the Americans thrust pikes and fired pistols and muskets at their assailants, who, mounted on each other's shoulders, were hacking fiercely at the nettings, which kept them from gaining the schooner's deck. The few that managed to clamber on the taffrail of the Armstrong were thrust through and through with pikes, and hurled, thus horribly impaled, into the sea. The fighting was fiercest and deadliest on the quarter, for there were most of the enemy's boats, and there Captain Reed led the defense in person. So hot was the reception met by the British at this point that they drew off in dismay, despairing of ever gaining the privateer's deck. Hardly did Reed see the enemy thus foiled on the quarter, when a chorus of British cheers from the forecastle, mingled with yells of rage, told that the enemy had succeeded in effecting a lodgment there. 
Calling his men about him, the gallant captain dashed forward, and was soon in the front rank of the defenders, dealing furious blows with his cutlass, and crying out, "'Come on, my lads, and we'll drive them into the sea!' The leadership of an officer was all that the sailors needed. The three lieutenants on the forecastle had been killed or disabled, else the enemy had never come aboard. With Reed to cheer them on, the sailors rallied, and with a steady advance drove the British back into their boats. The disheartened enemy did not return to the attack, but returned to their ships, leaving behind two boats captured and two sunk. Their loss in the attack was thirty-four killed and eighty-six wounded. On the privateer were two killed and seven wounded. But the attack was not to end here. Reed was too old a sailor to expect that the British, chagrined as they were by two repulses, were likely to leave the privateer in peace. He well knew that the withdrawal of the barges meant not an abandonment, but merely a short discontinuance of the attack. Accordingly, he gave his crew scarcely time to rest before he set them to work, getting the schooner in trim for another battle. The wounded were carried below, and the decks cleared of splinters and wreckage. The boarding nettings were patched up and hung again in place. Long Tom had been knocked off his carriage by a carronade shot, and had to be remounted, but all was done quickly, and by morning the vessel was ready for whatever might be in store for her. The third assault was made soon after daybreak. Evidently the enemy despaired of his ability to conquer the privateersmen in a hand-to-hand -hand battle, for this time he moved the brig Carnation up within range and opened fire upon the schooner. The man-of-war could fire nine guns at a broadside while the schooner could reply with but seven. But Long Tom proved the salvation of the privateer. The heavy twenty-four-pound shots from this gun did so much damage upon the hull of the brig that she was forced to draw out of the action, leaving the victory for the third time with the Americans. But now Captain Reed decided that it was folly to longer continue the conflict. The overwhelming force of the enemy made any thought of ultimate escape folly. It only remained for the British to move the seventy-four Plantagenet into action to seal the doom of the Yankee privateer. The gallant defense already made by the Americans had cost the British nearly three hundred men in killed and wounded and Reed now determined to destroy his vessel and escape to the shore. The great pivot gun was accordingly pointed down the main hatch, and two heavy shots sent crashing through the bottom. Then, applying the torch to make certain the work of destruction, the privateersmen left the ship, giving three cheers for the gallant General Armstrong, as a burst of flame and a roar told that the flames had reached her magazine. This gallant action won loud plaudits for Captain Reed when the news reached the United States. Certainly no vessel of the regular navy was ever more bravely or skillfully defended than was the General Armstrong. But, besides the credit won for the American arms, Reed had unknowingly done his country a memorable service. The three vessels that attacked him were bound to the Gulf of Mexico to assist in the attack upon New Orleans. The havoc Reed had wrought among their crews, and the damage he inflicted upon the Carnation, so delayed the New Orleans expedition that General Jackson was able to gather those motley troops that fought so well on the plains of Chalmette. Had it not been for the plucky fight of the lads of the General Armstrong, the British forces would have reached New Orleans ten days earlier and Pakenham's expedition might have ended very differently. 
a narrative of the exploits of and service done by the american sailors in the war of eighteen twelve would be incomplete if it said nothing of the sufferings of that great body of tars who spent the greater part of the war season confined in british prisons several thousand of these were thrown into confinement before the war broke out, because they refused to serve against their country in British ships. Others were prisoners of war. No exact statistics as to the number of Americans thus imprisoned have ever been made public, but the records of one great prison, that at Dartmoor, show that when the war closed, six thousand American seamen were imprisoned there, twenty-five hundred of whom had been detained from long before the opening of the war on account of their refusal to join the ranks of the enemy as i write there lies before me a quaint little book put out anonymously in eighteen fifteen and purporting to be the journal of a young man captured by the british its author a young surgeon of salem named waterhouse shipped on a salem privateer and was captured early in the war his experience with british prisons and transport ships was long and against his jailers he brings shocking charges of brutality cruelty and negligence the Yankee seamen who were captured during the war were first consigned to receiving prisons at the British naval stations in America. Sometimes these places of temporary detention were moldering hulks moored in bays or rivers, sometimes huge sheds hastily put together, and in which the prisoners were kept only by the unceasing vigilance of armed guards. The prison at Halifax, writes Waterhouse, erected solely for the safekeeping of prisoners of war, resembles a horse stable with stalls or stanchions for keeping the cattle from each other. It is to a contrivance of this sort that they attach the cords that support those canvas bags or cradles called hammocks. Four tiers of these hanging nests were made to hang one above the other, between these stalls or stanchions. The general hum and confused noise from almost every hammock was at first very distressing. Some would be lamenting their hard fate at being shut up like negro slaves in a guinea ship, or like fowls in a hen coop for no crime, but for fighting the battles of their country. Others, late at night, were relating their adventures to a new prisoner, others lamenting their aberrations from rectitude and disobedience to parents and headstrong willfulness that drove them to sea contrary to their parents' wish, while others of the younger class were sobbing out their lamentations at the thoughts of what their mothers and sisters suffered after knowing of their imprisonment not unfrequently the whole night was spent in this way and when about daybreak the weary prisoner fell into a doze he was waked from his slumber by the grinding noise of the locks and the unbarring of the doors with the cry of turn out all out when each man took down his hammock and lashed it up and slung it on his back and was ready to answer to the roll-call of the turnkey from prisons such as this the prisoners were conveyed in droves to england in the holds of men-of-war and transports poorly fed worse housed and suffering for lack of air and room their agony on the voyage was terrible when they were allowed a few hours time on deck they were sure to arouse the anger of the officers by turbulent conduct or imprudent retorts one morning, as the general and captain of the Regulus transport were walking as usual on the quarter-deck, one of our Yankee boys passed along the galley with his kid of burgoo. He rested it on the hatchway while he adjusted the rope ladder to descend with his swill. The thing attracted the attention of the general, who asked the man how many of his comrades ate of that quantity for their breakfast. 
Six, sir, said the man, but it is fit food only for our hogs. This answer affronted the captain, who asked the man, in an angry tone, what part of America he came from. Near to Bunker Hill, sir, if you ever heard of that place, was the answer. On another occasion, a Yankee and a slightly wounded British Marine got into a dispute and came to blows. The British captain saw the occurrence and accused the American of cowardice in striking a wounded man. "'I am no coward, sir,' said the Yankee. "'I was captain of a gun on board the Constitution when she captured the Guerriere, and afterward when she took the Java.' Had I been a coward, I should not have been there. On one occasion, the prisoners on the transport Crown Prince, lying in the River Medway, took an uncontrollable dislike to the commander of a second transport, lying close alongside. Their spite was gratified quickly and with great effect. The rations served out to the luckless captives of that time consisted of fish and cold potatoes the latter edible being of rather poor quality the prisoners reserved for missiles and the obnoxious officer could not pace his quarter-deck without being made a mark for a shower of potatoes vainly did he threaten to call up his marines and respond with powder and lead the americans were not to be kept down and for some days the harassed officer hardly dared to show himself upon deck the place of final detention for most of the prisoners taken in the war with America was Dartmoor Prison, a rambling collection of huge frame buildings surrounded by double walls of wood. The number of prisoners confined there, and the length of time which many of them had spent within its walls, gave this place many of the characteristics of a small state, with rulers and officials of its own. One of the strangest characters of the prison was King Dick, a gigantic negro, who ruled over the five or six hundred prisoners. He is six feet five inches in height, said one of the prisoners, and proportionally large. This black Hercules commands respect, and his subjects tremble in his presence. He goes the rounds every day and visits every berth to see if they are all kept clean. When he goes the rounds, he puts on a large bearskin cap and carries in his hand a huge club. If any of his men are dirty, drunken, or grossly negligent, he threatens them with a beating, and if they are saucy, they are sure to receive one. They have several times conspired against him, and attempted to dethrone him, but he has always conquered the rebels. One night several attacked him while asleep in his hammock. He sprang up and seized the smallest by his feet, and thumped another with him. The poor negro, who has thus been made a beetle of, was carried the next day to the hospital, sadly bruised, and provokingly laughed at. King Dick, to further uphold his dignity as a monarch, had his private chaplain, who followed his royal master about, and on Sundays preached rude but vigorous sermons to his majesty's court. On weekdays the court was far from being a dignified gathering. King Dick was a famous athlete, and in the cockloft over which he reigned was to be seen fine boxing and fencing. Gambling, too, was not ruled out of the royal lists of amusements, and the cries of the players mingled with the singing of the negroes, and the sounds of the musical instruments upon which they played made that section of the prison a veritable pandemonium. But, although some few incidents occurred to brighten momentarily the dull monotony of the prisoner's lot, the life of these unfortunate men, while thus imprisoned, was miserable and hateful to them. Months passed, and even years, but there seemed to be no hope for release. At last came the news of the declaration of peace. How great, then, was the rejoicing! 
thoughts of home of friends and kindred flooded the minds of all and even strong men whom the hardships of prison life had not broken down seemed to give way all at once to tears of joy but the delays of official action red tape and the sluggishness of travel in that day kept the poor fellows pent up for months after the treaty of peace had been announced to them nor were they to escape without suffering yet more severely at the hands of their jailers three months had passed since peace had been declared and the long delay so irritated the prisoners that they chafed under prison restraint and showed evidences of a mutinous spirit the guards to whom was entrusted the difficult task of keeping in subjection six thousand impatient and desperate men grew nervous fearing that at any moment the horde of prisoners would rise and sweep away all before them an outbreak was imminent and the prisoners were like a magazine of gunpowder needing but a spark of provocation to explode on April 6, 1815, matters reached a crisis. The soldiers, losing all presence of mind, fired on the defenseless Americans, killing five men and wounding thirty-four. Thus, the last bloodshed in the War of 1812 was the blood of unarmed prisoners. But the massacre, horrible and inexcusable as it was, had the effect of hastening the release of the survivors, and soon the last of the captives was on his way home. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 44, The Horse Marines of 1814, by John Back McMaster. During the latter part of the War of 1812, the British maintained a rigorous blockade of the Atlantic coast. The Editor The interruption of the coasting trade was indeed a very serious affair. For years past, that trade had given occupation to thousands of coasters and tens of thousands of sailors. The shoes made at Lynn, the Yankee notions of Connecticut, the cotton cards, the domestic cottons, the playing cards produced in New England, the flower of the Middle States, the East India goods brought in from abroad, had found a ready market at Charleston, Savannah, and Augusta, whence great quantities of rice and cotton were brought north. On the arrival of the British fleet, this trade, no longer to be carried on in safety by water, began of necessity to be carried on by land. At first some merchants at Boston, having chartered a few wagons, dispatched them with loads to Philadelphia, and even to Baltimore. This was enough. The hint was taken. A new industry sprang up, and by the early summer the roads leading southward exhibited one continuous stream of huge, canvas-covered wagons, tugged along by double and triple teams of horses or of oxen. No distance was then too great, and hundreds of them wound their way from Salem and Boston to Augusta and Savannah. An estimate made toward the close of the year places the number of wagons thus employed at 4,000, and the number of cattle, horses, and oxen at 20,000. Nor does this seem excessive, for a traveler who drove from New York to Richmond declares that he passed 260 wagons on the way. Such was the stream that the good people of the New England towns along the post road from Boston to New York, scandalized at the wagons that went creaking through their streets every Sabbath, cried out that the tithing men must do their duty. Since the days of the turnpike and quick packet stage, the laws against traveling on the Sabbath had, even in Connecticut, been suffered to go unenforced. Here and there, indeed, a tithing man of the old school would quiet his conscience by calling out, Sunday after Sunday, to the driver of the regular four-horse Boston packet, as, 
loaded with passengers and with steeds at full gallop, it came clattering down the main streets of his native village. But no driver was foolish enough to heed him, and the matter was forgotten by the time the cloud of dust raised by the coach had settled. His inability to cope, single-handed, with a coach and four at full speed, satisfied the town that he had done his utmost to enforce the law. But no such excuse applied to a heavily loaded wagon drawn by six oxen, driven by one man on foot, and the law began to be rigorously applied. In Fairfield and Weathersfield that was especially the case, and these two towns soon became the dread of every wagoneer whom fate brought to them on Sunday. Delays of this sort, coupled with the more serious detentions caused by the unfitness of the wretched ferry boats on the great rivers to do the work that they were thus suddenly called upon to perform, did much to prolong the journey, which must at best have been slow. Even at New York, which now boasted of a steam ferry boat to Paulus Hook, as many as eight and fifteen wagons were often to be seen drawn up in line at the ferry waiting a chance to cross. On several occasions, the wagons stood for three days in the street, and so obstructed travel that the teamsters were arrested and fined ten dollars each for blocking the highways. During the summer, when the roads were at their best, the trip from Boston to Baltimore was made in twenty-six days, from Baltimore to Richmond in ten days, and from Baltimore to Augusta in thirty-three days. Two months were thus consumed on the road between Boston and Augusta. From New York to Augusta, the journey was usually made in fifty days, and from Philadelphia in forty-five. That merchants, whose cargoes of boots and shoes, whose boxes of India goods, cotton goods, tinware, hardware and fancy goods were thus entrusted to the honesty of unknown wagoneers, should be most anxious to follow them in their slow progress southward, was most natural. It was seriously suggested, therefore, that the owners of the wagon should name them, as in the case of ships, keep a rough log in which to enter the names of other wagons met on the road, their destination and their condition, and report to the newspapers of each town and city they pass through. All this information should then be published, and copied by newspaper after newspaper for the benefit of shippers. This was done, and in a few weeks every wagon had a name, serious or humorous according to the temper of the owner. There was teaser and split log, commerce renewed and old times, Neptune metamorphosed, toe the mark, mud clipper, sailor's misery, Cleopatra, Tecumseh, Serval, Jefferson's pride, and don't give up the ship. Entering into the humor of the thing, others procured great streamers bearing the words free trade and teamsters' rights, free trade and oxen's rights, no impressment and hung them to the sides of their wagons. Taking up the jest, the newspapers now began to record the arrival and departure of the wagons in the columns once devoted to ship news, under the headings Horse Marine Intelligence, Horse and Ox Marine News, Jefferson Commerce. Every wagon team was a fleet of fast-sailing wagons, to be regularly cleared at each city on its route. Every teamster now became a captain, whose adventures on the way were duly published as a log in some such form as this. Port of Salem. Arrived the three-horse ship Drognaught. Captain David Allen, sixteen days from New York. Spoke in the latitude of Weathersfield, the Crispin. Friend Alley Master, from New York. Bound home to Lynn, but detained in waiting trial for breach of the Sabbath. The late Northeaster has laid an embargo on many wagons. Saw several scudding under bare poles. Sunday, 17th instant, at 11 a.m., Weatherfield Meeting House bearing west, northerly twenty rods, the graves just under our lee, was boarded from a government cutter called the Tithing Man, who put a prize master on board and ordered us to the first tavern. There, notwithstanding the law that free gigs made free passengers, was detained till midnight, when, upon paying the innkeeper's fees, was released. Others contain accounts of boardings and overhaulings and searchings by custom house officers, who are invariably called douaniers by the Federalist Prince. If the cargo was not of English make and smuggled, the teamster would submit with a good grace and perhaps even court investigation. Thus the story was told of a wagoneer who, when stopped and asked, What are you loaded with? replied, Quintals of Pollock, casks of oil, and dry goods from Eastport. Dry goods from Eastport? exclaimed the Donier, they must be smuggled. The wagoneer protested that they were of American make, but the boxes were broken open, 
and were found to contain not Yorkshire broadcloth and Irish linens, but dried herrings. That all these things should go unnoticed by the verse makers and ballad writers of the day was impossible. Indeed, they seized upon the opportunity with eagerness, and provided the new captains with as fine a set of catches as had ever belonged to their brethren of the sea. The favorite was a parody of that stirring hymn of Campbell which begins, Ye mariners of England that guard our native seas. Ye wagoners of freedom, whose charges chew the cud, whose wheels have braved a dozen years the gravel and the mud, your glorious hawbucks yoke again to take another jag, and scud through the mud where the heavy wheels do drag. Where the wagon creek is long and low and the jaded oxen lag, Columbia needs no wooden walls, nor ships where billows swell. Her march is like a terrapin's, her home is in her shell. To guard her trade and sailor's rights, in woods she spreads her flag. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Todd. Section 45 of The United States. Read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 6. A Period of Growth and Expansion. Historical Note. The purchase of the Louisiana Territory had aroused much interest in the West, and as time passed, thousands of settlers made their way thither and also to the Southwest. The ideal farm was, of course, situated on a river, that produce might be carried by boat, the only easy way of transportation in the early days. The Mississippi was a great avenue of trade, and into it there came from the Ohio, the Missouri, the Tennessee, and the Cumberland watercraft of all sorts, from rafts to steamboats, and all on their way to New Orleans to dispose of their cargoes. Very little of this great amount of trade with the West came to the eastern states for lack of water communication, and at length it was decided to dig a canal from the Hudson River to Lake Erie. This canal, which was completed in 1825, greatly stimulated the growth of the West and made New York the commercial center of the United States. An invention that was destined to do even more than the canals and steamboats toward opening up the West was the steam engine. In 1830, there were 23 miles of railroad in the United States. In 1840, there were 2,818, and during the next two decades, the mileage was doubled every five years. The little group of colonies that had clung to the Atlantic coast was fast becoming a mighty nation that would soon stretch from shore to shore. End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The Opening of the Erie Canal by John Bark McMaster. After eight years of persistent labor, the big ditch, so constantly the subject of ridicule, was finished, and in June the gates at Black Rock were opened and the waters of Lake Erie for the first time were admitted into the Western Division. Later in the month the capstone of that splendid chain of locks at Lockport was laid with Masonic ceremonies, but it was not until October that the canal from end to end was thrown open to the public. The celebrations of the opening began at Buffalo, where, on the 26th of the month, a procession of citizens and militia escorted the orator and the invited guests to a gaily decorated fleet lying in wait on the canal. On the Seneca chief, which headed the line, were two painted kegs full of water from Lake Erie. Behind it were the Superior, the Commodore Perry, the Buffalo, and the Lion of the West, a veritable Noah's Ark, containing a bear, two eagles, two fawns, two Indian boys, birds, and fish, all typical of the products of the West before the advent of the white man. When the address had been made, the signal was given, and the Seneca chief, drawn by four grey horses, started eastward on a most memorable journey. 
as the fleet moved slowly along the canal, saluted by music, musketry, and the cheers of the crowd on the bank, the news was carried to the metropolis by the reports of a continuous line of cannon placed along the canal to Albany and down the Hudson to New York. When the last gun had fired at the battery, the forts in the harbour returned the salute, and the news that New York had heard the tidings was sent back to Buffalo by a second cannonade. The progress of the little fleet was one continuous ovation, as town after town along the route vied with each other in manifestations of delight. From Albany an escort of gaily dressed steamboats accompanied the fleet down the river to New York, where the entire population, increased by 30,000 strangers, turned out to receive it and whence thousands, boarding every kind of craft, went down the bay to Sandy Hook. There Governor Clinton, lifting the kegs from the deck of the Seneca chief, poured their contents into the sea, saying as he did so, This solemnity at this place, on the first arrival of vessels from Lake Erie, is intended to indicate and commemorate the navigable communication which has been accomplished between our Mediterranean seas and the Atlantic Ocean, in about eight years, to the extent of more than 425 miles, by the public spirit and energy of the people of the state of New York and may the god of the heavens and the earth smile propitiously on this work and render it subservient to the best interests of the human race this ceremony over and a grand salute fired the boats returned to the city where a fine industrial parade to which each trade society furnished a float with artisans at work closed the day at night there were balls parties dinners and illuminations End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd. The Guest of the Nation by Daniel Webster. In 1824-25, Lafayette was the guest of the United States. He visited every state and was welcomed wherever he went as the friend of the nation. Congress presented him with $200,000 and 24,000 acres of fertile land. June 17, 1825, on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill, the cornerstone of the monument was laid. Daniel Webster was the orator of the day, and as he spoke the following words, Lafayette rose and remained standing until they were ended. The Editor Sir, we are assembled to commemorate the establishment of great public principles of liberty, and to do honor to the distinguished dead. The occasion is too severe for eulogy of the living, but, sir, your interesting relation to this country, the peculiar circumstances which surround you and surround us, call on me to express the happiness which we derive from your presence and aid in this solemn commemoration. Fortunate, fortunate man! With what measure of devotion will you not thank God for the circumstances of your extraordinary life? You are connected with both hemispheres and with two generations. Heaven saw fit to ordain that the electric spark of liberty should be conducted through you from the new world to the old. And we who are now here to perform this duty of patriotism, have all of us long ago received it in charge from our fathers to cherish your name and your virtues. You will account it an instance of your good fortune, sir, that you cross the seas to visit us at a time which enables you to be present at this solemnity. You now behold a field, the renown of which reached you in the heart of France and caused a thrill in your ardent bosom. You see the lines of the little redoubt thrown up by the incredible diligence of Prescott, defended to the last extremity by his lion-hearted valor, and within which the cornerstone of our monument had now taken his position. You see where Warren fell, and where Parker, Gardner, McCleary, Moore, and other early patriots fell with him. Those who survived that day, 
and whose lives have been prolonged to the present hour, are now around you. Some of them you have known in the trying scenes of the war. Behold, they now stretch forth their feeble arms to embrace you. Behold, they raise their trembling voices to invoke the blessing of God on you and yours for ever. Sir, you have assisted us in laying the foundation of this structure. You have heard us rehearse, with our feeble commendation, the names of departed patriots. Monument and eulogy belong to the dead. We give them this day to Warren and his associates. On other occasions, they have been given to your more immediate companions in arms, to Washington, to Green, to Gates, to Sullivan, and to Lincoln. We have become reluctant to grant these, our highest and last honors, further. We would gladly hold them yet back from the little remnant of that immortal band. Ceres and Chalem Redis. Illustrious as are your merits, yet far, oh very far distant, be the day when any inscription shall bear your name, or any tongue pronounce its eulogy. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States, edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 48. The Highest Peak of the Rocky Mountains. By John Charles Fremont. In 1842, John Charles Fremont was sent by the government to explore the Rocky Mountains. On this journey, his great feat was the ascent of the highest peak of the range, afterwards called Fremont's Peak, 13,570 feet above sea level. The Editor I determined to leave our animals here and make the rest of our way on foot. The peak appeared so near that there was no doubt of our returning before night and a few men were left in charge of the mules, with our provisions and blankets. We took with us nothing but our arms and instruments, and, as the day had become warm, the greater part left their coats. Having made an early dinner, we started again. We were soon involved in the most ragged precipices, nearing the central chain very slowly, and rising but little. The first ridge had a succession of others, and when, with great fatigue and difficulty, we had climbed up five hundred feet, it was but to make an equal descent on the other side. All these intervening places were filled with small, deep lakes, which met the eye in every direction, descending from one level to another, sometimes under bridges formed by huge fragments of granite, beneath which was heard the roar of the water. These constantly obstructed our path, forcing us to make long detours, frequently obliged to retrace our steps, and frequently falling among the rocks. Maxwell was precipitated toward the face of a precipice, and saved himself from going over by throwing himself flat on the ground. We clambered on, always expecting with every ridge that we crossed to reach the foot of the peaks, and always disappointed, until about four o'clock, when, pretty well worn out, we reached the shore of a little lake in which there was a rocky island. We remained here a short time to rest, and continued on around the lake, which had in some places a beach of white sand, and in others was bound with rocks, over which the way was difficult and dangerous, as the water from innumerable springs made them very slippery. By the time we had reached the farther side of the lake, we found ourselves all exceedingly fatigued, and much to the satisfaction of the whole party, we encamped. The spot we had chosen was a broad, flat rock, in some measure protected from the winds by the surrounding crags, and the trunks of fallen pines afforded us bright fires. Nearby was a foaming torrent, which tumbled into the little lake about 150 feet below us, and which, by way of distinction, we have called Island Lake. We had reached the upper limit of the piney region, as above this point no tree was to be seen and patches of snow lay everywhere around us on the cold sides of the rocks. The flora of the region we had traversed since leaving our mules was extremely rich, and among the characteristic plants the scarlet flowers of the Dodecatheon tentatum 
everywhere met the eye in great abundance. A small green ravine, on the edge of which we were encamped, was filled with a profusion of alpine plants in brilliant bloom. From barometrical observations made during our three days' sojourn at this place, its elevation above the Gulf of Mexico is 10,000 feet. During the day we heard what was supposed to be the bleat of a young goat, which we searched for with hungry activity, and found to proceed from a small animal of a grey colour, with short ears and no tail, probably the Siberian squirrel. We saw a considerable number of them, and with the exception of a small bird like a sparrow, it is the only inhabitant of this elevated part of the mountains. On our return we saw below this lake large flocks of the mountain goat. We had nothing to eat tonight. La Junesse with several others took their guns and sallied out in search of a goat, but returned unsuccessful. At sunset the barometer stood at 20.522. The attached thermometer, 50 degrees. Here we had the misfortune to break our thermometer, having now only that attached to the barometer. I was taken ill shortly after we had encamped, and continued so until late in the night, with violent headache and vomiting. This was probably caused by the excessive fatigue I had undergone and want of food, and perhaps also in some measure by the rarity of the air. The night was cold, as a violent gale from the north had sprung up at sunset, which entirely blew away the heat of the fires. The cold and our granite beds had not been favorable to sleep and we were glad to see the face of the sun in the morning. Not being delayed by any preparation for breakfast, we set out immediately. On every side as we advanced was heard the roar of waters and of a torrent, which we followed up a short distance until it expended into a lake about one mile in length. On the northern side of the lake was a bank of ice, or rather of snow, covered with a crust of ice. Carson had been our guide into the mountains, and agreeably to his advice, we left this little valley and took to the ridges again, which we found extremely broken, and where we were again involved among precipices. Here were ice fields, among which we were all dispersed, seeking each the best path to ascend the peak. Mr. Pruce attempted to walk along the upper edge of one of these fields, which sloped away at an angle of about twenty degrees but his feet slipped from under him and he went plunging down the plain. A few hundred feet below, at the bottom, were some fragments of sharp rock, on which he landed, and though he turned a couple of somersaults, fortunately received no injury beyond a few bruises. Two of the men, Clement Lambert and Decotou, had been taken ill, and lay down on the rocks a short distance below, and at this point I was attacked with headache and giddiness, "'accompanied by vomiting, as on the day before. "'Finding myself unable to proceed, "'I sent the barometer over to Mr. Pruce, "'who was in a gap two or three hundred yards distant, "'desiring him to reach the peak if possible "'and take an observation there. "'He found himself unable to proceed farther in that direction "'and took an observation where the barometer stood "'at 19.401, a touch thermometer 50 degrees in the gap. Carson, who had gone over to him, succeeded in reaching one of the snowy summits of the main ridge, whence he saw the peak toward which all our efforts had been directed towering eight or ten hundred feet into the air above him. In the meantime, finding myself grow rather worse than better, and doubtful how far my strength would carry me, I sent Basil Lajeunesse with four men back to the place where the mules had been left. We were now better acquainted with the topography of the country and I directed him to bring back with him, if it were in any way possible, four or five mules with provisions and blankets. With me were Maxwell and Eyre, and after we had remained nearly an hour on the rock, it became so unpleasantly cold, though the day was bright, that we set out on our return to the camp, at which we all arrived safely, straggling in one after the other. I continued ill during the afternoon, but became better toward sundown, when my recovery was completed by the appearance of Basil and four men, all mounted. The men who had gone with him had been too much fatigued to return, and were relieved by those in charge of the horses. But in his powers of endurance, Basil resembled more a mountain goat than a man. They brought blankets and provisions, 
and we enjoyed well our dried meat and a cup of good coffee. We rolled ourselves up in our blankets, and with our feet turned to a blazing fire, slept soundly until morning. August 15th. It had been supposed that we had finished with the mountains, and the evening before it had been arranged that Carson should set out at daylight and return to breakfast at the camp of the mules, taking with him all but four or five men, who were to stay with me and bring back the mules and instruments. Accordingly, at the break of day they set out. With Mr. Pruce and myself remained Basil Lajeunesse, Clement Lambert, Janice, and Decotou. When we had secured strength for the day by a hearty breakfast, we covered what remained, which was enough for one meal, with rocks, in order that it might be safe from any marauding bird, and saddling our mules, turned our faces once more towards the peaks. This time we determined to proceed quietly and cautiously, deliberately resolved to accomplish our object, if it were within the compass of human means. We were of opinion that a long defile which lay to the left of yesterday's route would lead us to the foot of the main peak. Our mules had been refreshed by the fine grass in the little ravine at the island camp, and we intended to ride up the defile as far as possible, in order to husband our strength for the main ascent. Though this was a fine passage, still it was a defile of the most rugged mountains known, and we had many a rough and steep slippery place to cross before reaching the end. In this place the sun rarely shone. Snow lay along the border of the small stream which flowed through it, and occasional icy passages made the footing of the mules very insecure, and the rocks and ground were moist with the trickling waters in this spring of mighty rivers. We soon had the satisfaction to find ourselves riding along the huge wall which forms the central summits of the chain. There at last it rose by our side, a nearly perpendicular wall of granite, terminating two to three thousand feet above our heads, in a serrated line of broken, jagged cones. We rode on until we came almost immediately below the main peak, which I denominated the Snow Peak, as it exhibited more snow to the eye than any of the neighboring summits. Here were three small lakes of a green color, each of perhaps a thousand yards in diameter, and apparently very deep. These lay in a kind of chasm, and according to the barometer, we had attained but a few hundred feet above the island lake. The barometer here stood at 20.450, attach thermometer 70 degrees. We managed to get our mules up to a little bench about a hundred feet above the lakes, where there was a patch of good grass, and turned them loose to graze. During our rough ride to this place, they had exhibited a wonderful sure-footedness. Parts of the defile were filled with angular, sharp fragments of rock, three or four and eight or ten feet cube, and among these they had worked their way, leaping from one narrow point to another, rarely making a false step, and giving us no occasion to dismount. Having divested ourselves of every unnecessary encumbrance, we commenced the ascent. This time, like experienced travelers, we did not press ourselves, but climbed leisurely, sitting down so soon as we found breath beginning to fail. At intervals we reached places where a number of springs gushed from the rocks, and about eighteen hundred feet above the lakes came to the snow line. From this point our progress was uninterrupted climbing. Hitherto I had worn a pair of thick moccasins, with soles of parflesh, but here I put on a light, thin pair which I had brought for the purpose as now the use of our toes became necessary to a farther advance. I availed myself of a sort of comb of the mountain, which stood against the wall like a buttress, and which the wind and the solar radiation, joined to the steepness of the smooth rock, had kept almost entirely free from snow. Up this I made my way rapidly. Our cautious method of advancing in the outset had spared my strength, and with the exception of a slight disposition to headache, I felt no remains of yesterday's illness. In a few minutes we reached a point where the buttress was overhanging, and there was no other way of surmounting the difficulty than by passing around one side of it, which was the face of a vertical precipice of several hundred feet. Putting hands and feet in the crevices between the blocks, I succeeded in getting over it, and when I reached the top, 
found my companions in a small valley below. Descending to them, we continued climbing, and in a short time reached the crest. I sprang upon the summit, and another step would have precipitated me into an immense snowfield five hundred feet below. To this edge of the field was a sheer icy precipice, and then, with a gradual fall, the field sloped off for about a mile, until it struck the foot of another lower ridge. I stood on a narrow crest, about three feet in width, with an inclination of about twenty degrees north, fifty-one east. As soon as I had gratified the first feelings of curiosity, I descended, and each man ascended in his turn, for I would allow only one at a time to mount the unstable and precarious slab, which it seemed a breath would hurl into the abyss below. We mounted the barometer in the snow of the summit, and fixing a ramrod in a crevice, unfurled the national flag to wave in the breeze where never flag waved before. End of section 48《Section 49 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 49 the first telegram by r m evans the announcement of the invention the telegraph and its astonishing capacity was for a long time the most prominent theme of public and private discussion admiration being largely mingled with blank incredulity and not a little ridicule even in congress in the application of professor morse for government aid to enable him to demonstrate the value of his invention by constructing a line between washington and baltimore in eighteen thirty eight there were not wanting learned legislators who treated the idea as a mere chimera it was the same congress of which espy the storm king was asking assistance to test his favorite theory then so prominently discussed both morse and espy says a writer of that time and the event became the butt of ridicule the target of merciless arrows of wit they were voted downright bores and the idea of giving them money was pronounced farcical they were considered monomaniacs and as such were laughed at punned upon and made the standing staple for jokes one morning however a gentleman rose from his seat in the house quite to the astonishment of everybody for he had never been known to speak before unless it was to vote or to address the speaker and said i hold in my hand a resolution which i respectfully offer for the consideration of the house in a moment a page was at his desk and the resolution was transferred to the speaker and by him delivered to the clerk who read as follows resolved that the committee of ways and means be instructed to inquire into the expediency of appropriating thirty thousand dollars to enable Professor Morse to establish a line of telegraph between Washington and Baltimore. The gentleman who offered it was Mr. Ferris, one of the New York representatives, a man of wealth and learning, but modest, retiring, and diffident. This being merely a resolution of inquiry, it passed without opposition, and out of regard to the mover, without comment. In time, it came before the committee, all the members of which had, by their public services and brilliant talents, acquired a national reputation. The clerk of the committee read the resolution. The chairman, Mr. Fillmore, in a clear, distinct voice, said, Gentlemen, what disposition shall be made of it? There was a dead pause around the table. No one seemed inclined to take the initiative. It was expected that, inasmuch as the mover of the resolution in the House was a Democrat, the democratic side of the committee would stand godfather to it there but not a bit of it they felt that the whole thing was preposterous and deserving of no countenance at length one on the other side broke the ominous silence by moving that the committee instruct the chairman to report a bill to the house 
appropriating thirty thousand dollars for the purpose named in the resolution this movement motion brought them all upstanding no speeches were made the question was called for the yeas and nays were taken alphabetically and as four had voted on the affirmative side and four on the negative it fell to the lot of governor wallace of indiana whose name came last on the list to decide the question he however had paid no attention to the matter and like the majority of people considered it a great humbug he had not the faintest idea of the importance to his country of the vote he was to cast but as fortune would have it the thought came to mind that mr morse was even then experimenting to the capital with the new-fangled invention having stretched a wire from the basement story to the interim of the senate chamber it was therefore in governor wallace's power to satisfy himself at once in regard to the question of feasibility and he determined to try it he asked leave to consider his vote this was granted he immediately went to the antechamber which he found crowded with representatives and strangers governor wallace requested permission to put a question to the madman morse at the other end of the wire it was granted immediately he wrote the question and handed it to the telegrapher the crowd cried read read in a very short time the answer was received when written out by the operator the same cry of read it read it went up from the crowd to his utter astonishment governor wallace found that the madman at the end of the wire had more wit and force than the congressman at the other the laugh was turned completely upon the committee man but as western men are rarely satisfied with one fall not less than two failures out of three attempts forcing from them any acknowledgment of defeat the governor put a second question and there came a second answer if the first raised a laugh at his expense the second converted that laugh into a roar and a shout he was more than satisfied picking up his hat he bowed himself out of the crowd the good-natured shout following him as he passed along the passages and halls of the capitol as a matter of course governor wallace voted in the affirmative of the motion then pending before the committee and it prevailed the chairman reported the bill the house and senate concurred in its passage and thus was professor morse successful in this his last struggle to demonstrate the practicability of as it has proved the most amazing invention of the age the electromagnetic telegraph if the committee had ignored the proposition there is no telling what would have been the result that the experiment would have been finally made no one can entertain a doubt but when or by whom is the question it is not within the range of ordinary individual fortune to make it and if it was none but professor morse would have hazarded it it appears however that professor morse came to the last stage of discouragement in the prosecution of his appeal to congress before light finally broke in upon him on the very last day of the session the bill relating to his case was the one hundred and twentieth on the senate docket to be acted upon in course concerning this scene a writer in harper's monthly states that during the day professor morse watched the course of legislation from the gallery with nervous trepidation and the deepest anxiety at length worn out by the interminable discussion of some senator who seemed to be speaking against time and overcome by his prolonged watching he left the gallery at a late hour and went to his lodgings under the belief that it was not possible his bill could be reached and that he must again turn his attention to those labors of the brush and easel by means of which he might be enabled to prosecute appeals to congress at a future time he accordingly made his preparations to return to new york on the following morning and retiring to rest sank into a profound slumber from which he did not awake until a late hour on the following morning but a short time after while seated at the breakfast table the servant announced that a lady desired to see him upon entering the parlor he found miss annie ellsworth the daughter of the commissioner of patents whose face was all aglow with pleasure i have come to congratulate you she remarked as he entered the room and approached to shake hands with her to congratulate me replied mr morse and for what why upon the passage of your bill to be sure she replied 
you must surely be mistaken for i left at a late hour and its fate seemed inevitable indeed i am not mistaken she rejoined father remained until the close of the session and your bill was the very last that was acted on and i begged permission to carry to you the news i am so happy that i am the first to tell you so the feelings of professor morse may be better imagined than described he grasped his young companion warmly by the hand and thanked her over and over again for the joyful intelligence saying as reward for being the first bearer of this news you shall send over the telegraph the first message it conveys i will hold you to that promise replied she remember remember responded professor morse and they parted the plans of mr morse were now altogether changed his journey homeward was abandoned and he set to work to carry out the project of establishing the line of electrotelegraph between washington and baltimore authorized by the bill his first idea was to convey the wires enclosed in a leaden tube beneath the ground he had already arranged a plan by which the wires insulated by a covering of cotton saturated in gum shellac were to be inserted into leaden pipes in the process of casting but after the expenditure of several thousand dollars and much delay this plan was given up and the one now in use of extending them on poles adopted by the month of may eighteen forty four the whole line was laid and magnets and recording instruments were attached to the ends of the wires at mount clair depot baltimore and at the supreme court chamber in the capitol at washington when the circuit was complete and the signal at the one end of the line was responded to by the operator at the other mr morse sent a messenger to miss ellsworth to inform her that the telegraph awaited her message she speedily responded to this and sent for transmission the following which was the first formal dispatch ever sent through a telegraphic wire connecting remote places with each other what hath god wrought the original of the message is now in the archives of the historical society at hartford connecticut the practicability and utility of the invention were now clearly and firmly established end of section forty nine this recording is in the public domain section fifty of the united states this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 50 A Little Scotch Pioneer in Wisconsin The First Half of the Nineteenth Century By John Muir the thought of striking out into the wilderness to make a home has certain fascination, but whoever attempts it must look forward to years of hard labor before he can see much fruit of his toil. The following account of the first years on a new farm has been chosen as presenting a typical picture of pioneer life in its struggle to transform forests and prairies into the fertile farms that have been the chief source of the nation's wealth. The Editor I was put to the plow at the age of twelve, when my hand first reached but little above the handles, and for many years I had to do the greater part of the plowing. It was hard work for so small a boy. Nevertheless, as good plowing was exacted from me as if I were a man, and very soon I had to become a good plowman, or rather plow boy. None could draw a straighter furrow. For well, the first few years, the work was particularly hard on account of the tree stumps that had to be dodged. Later, the stumps were all dug and chopped out to make way for the McCormick Reaper, and because I proved to be the best chopper and stump digger, I had nearly all of it to myself. It was dull, hard work leaning over on my knees all day, chopping out those tough oak and hickory stumps deep down below the crowns of the big roots. Some, though fortunately not many, or two feet or more in diameter. And as I was the eldest boy, the greatest part of all the other work of the farm quite naturally fell to me. I had to split rails for long lines of zigzag fences. The trees that were tall enough and straight enough to afford one or two logs ten feet long were used for rails. The others, too knotty or cross-grained, 
were disposed of in log and cordwood fences. Making rails was hard work and required no little skill. I used to cut and split a hundred a day from our short, knotty oak timber, swinging the axe and heavy mallet, often with sore hands from early morning to night. Father was not successful as a rail splitter. After trying the work with me a day or two, he, in despair, left it all to me. I rather liked it, for I was proud of my skill, and tried to believe that I was as tough as the timber I mauled, though this and other heavy jobs stopped my growth, and earned me the title Runt of the Family. In those early days, long before the great labor-saving machines came to our help, almost everything connected with wheat raising abounded in trying work, cradling in the long, sweaty dog days, raking and binding, stacking, thrashing, and it often seemed to me that our fierce, over-industrious way of getting the grain from the ground was too closely connected with grave-digging. The staff of life, naturally beautiful, oft-times suggested the grave-digger's spade. Men and boys, and in those days even women and girls, were cut down while cutting the wheat. The fat folk grew lean and the lean leaner, while the rosy cheeks brought from Scotland and other cool countries across the sea faded to yellow like the wheat. We were all made slaves through the vice of over-industry. The same was in great part true in making hay to keep the cattle and horses through the long winters. We were called in the morning at four o'clock and seldom got to bed before nine, making a broiling, seething day seventeen hours long, loaded with hard work, while I was only a small stunted boy. And a few years later my brothers David and Daniel and my older sisters had to endure about as much as I did. In the harvest dog days and dog nights and dog mornings, when we arose from our clammy beds, our cotton shirts clung to our backs as wet with sweat as the bathing suits of swimmers, and remained so all the long, sweltering days. In the mowing and cradling, the most exhausting of all the farm work, I made matters worse by foolish ambition to keep ahead of the hired men. Never a warning word was spoken of the dangers of overwork. On the contrary, even when sick, we were held to our tasks as long as we could stand. Once in a harvest time I had the mumps, and was unable to swallow any food except milk, but this was not allowed to make any difference, while I staggered with weakness and sometimes fell headlong among the sheaves. Only once was I allowed to leave the harvest field, when I was stricken down with pneumonia. I lay gasping for weeks, but the scotch are hard to kill, and I pulled through. No physician was called, for father was an enthusiast, and always said and believed that God and hard work were by far the best doctors. None of our neighbors were so excessively industrious as father, though nearly all of the Scotch, English, and Irish worked too hard, trying to make good homes and to lay up money enough for comfortable independence. Excepting small garden patches, few of them had owned land in the old country. Here their craving land hunger was satisfied, and they were naturally proud of their farms, and tried to keep them as neat and clean and well tilled as gardens. To accomplish this without the means for hiring help was impossible. Flowers were planted about the neatly kept log or frame houses. Barnyards, granaries, etc. were kept in about as neat order as the homes, and the fences and corn rows were rigidly straight. But every uncut weed distressed them. So also did every ungathered ear of grain, and all that was lost by birds and gophers and this over-carefulness bred endless work and worry. As for money, for many a year there was precious little of it in the country for anybody. Eggs sold at six cents a dozen in trade, and five-cent calico was exchanged at twenty-five cents a yard. Wheat brought fifty cents a bushel in trade. To get cash for it before the ported railway was built, it had to be hauled to Milwaukee, a hundred miles away. On the other hand, food was abundant. Eggs, chickens, pigs, cattle, wheat, corn, potatoes, garden vegetables of the best, and wonderful melons as luxuries. No other wild country I have ever known extended a kinder welcome to poor immigrants. On the arrival in the spring, a log house could be built, a few acres plowed, the virgin sod planted with corn, potatoes, etc., and enough raised to keep a family comfortably the very first year, and wild hay for cows and oxen grew in abundance on the numerous meadows. The American settlers were wisely content with smaller fields and less of everything, kept indoors during excessive hot or cold weather, rested when tired, went off fishing and hunting at the most favorable times and seasons of the day and year, gathered nuts and berries, and in general tranquility accepted all the good things the fertile wilderness offered. 
After eight years of this dreary work of clearing the Fountain Lake farm, fencing it and getting it in perfect order, building a frame house and the necessary outbuildings for the cattle and horses, after all this had been victoriously accomplished and we had made out to escape with life, father bought a half section of wild land about four or five miles to the eastward and began all over again to clear and fence and break up other fields for a new farm, doubling all the stunting, heartbreaking, chopping, grubbing, stump digging, rail splitting, fence building, barn building, house building, and so forth. By this time I had learned to run the breaking plow. Most of these plows were very large, turning furrows from eighteen inches to two feet wide, and were drawn by four or five yoke of oxen. They were used only for the first plowing, in breaking up the wild sod woven into a tough mass, chiefly by the cord-like roots of perennial grasses, reinforced by the tap roots of oak and hickory bushes, called grubs, some of which were more than a century old and four or five inches in diameter. In the hardest plowing on the most difficult grounds, the grubs were said to be as thick as the hair on a dog's back. If in good trim, the plow cut through and turned over these grubs as if the centuries-old wood were soft like the flesh of carrots or turnips. But if not in good trim, the grubs promptly tossed the plow out of the ground. A stout Highland Scot, our neighbor, whose plow was in bad order and who did not know how to trim it, was vainly trying to keep it in the ground by main strength, while his son, who was driving and merrily whipping up the cattle, would cry encouragingly, All her in, fire! All her in! But who in the devil can I haul her in when she won't stop in? His perspiring father would reply, gasping for breath between each word. On the contrary, with the share and coulter sharp and nicely adjusted, the plow, instead of shying at every grub and jumping out, ran straight ahead without need of steering or holding, and gripped the ground so firmly that it could hardly be thrown out at the end of the furrow. Our breaker turned a furrow two feet wide, and on our best land, where the sod was toughest, held so firm a grip that at the end of the field my brother, who was driving the oxen, had to come to my assistance in throwing it over on its side to be drawn around the end of the landing, and it was all I could do to set it up again. But I learned to keep that plow in such trim that after I got started on a new furrow, I used to ride on the crossbar between the handles with my feet resting comfortably on the beam, without having to steady or steer it in any way on the whole length of the field, unless we had to go round a stump, for it sawed through the biggest grubs without flinching. The growth of these grubs was interesting to me. When an acorn or hickory nut had set up its first season sprout a few inches long, it was burned off in the autumn grass fires, but the root continued to hold on to life, formed a callus over the wound, and sent up one or more shoots the next spring. Next autumn, these new shoots were burned off, but the root and calloused head, about level with the surface of the ground, continued to grow and send up more shoots, and so on almost every year until very old, probably far more than a century, while the tops, which would naturally have become tall, broad-headed trees, were only mere sprouts seldom more than two years old. Thus the ground was kept open like a prairie, with only five or six trees to the acre, which had escaped the fire by having the good fortune to grow on a bare spot at the door of a fox or badger den, or between straggling grass tufts wide apart on the porous sandy soil. The uniformly rich soil of the Illinois and Wisconsin prairies produced so close and tall a growth of grasses for fires that no tree could live on it. Had there been no fires, these fine prairies, so marked a feature of the country, would have been covered with the heaviest forests. As soon as the oak openings in our neighborhood were settled, and the farmers had prevented running grass fires, the grubs grew up into trees and formed tall thickets so dense that it was difficult to walk through them, and every trace of the sunny openings vanished. We called our second farm Hickory Hill, from its many fine hickory trees and the long, gentle slope leading up to it. Compared with Fountain Lake Farm, it lay high and dry. The land was better, but it had no living water, no spring or stream or meadow or lake. A well ninety feet deep had to be dug, all except the first ten feet or so in fine-grained sandstone. When the sandstone was struck, my father, on the advice of a man who had worked in mines, tried to blast the rock, but from lack of skill the blasting went on very slowly, and father decided to have me do all the work with mason's chisels, a long, hard job, with a good deal of danger in it. I had to sit, cramp in a space about three feet in diameter, and wearily chip, chip, with heavy hammer and chisels from early morning until dark, day after day, for weeks and months. In the morning, 
Father and David lowered me in a wooden bucket by a windlass, hauled up what chips were left from the night before, then went away to the farm work and left me until noon, when they hoisted me out for dinner. After dinner, I was promptly lowered again. The forenoon's accumulation of chips hoisted out of the way, and I was left until night. One morning, after the dreary bore was about eighty feet deep, my life was all but lost in deadly choke damp, carbonic acid gas that had settled at the bottom during the night. Instead of clearing away the chips as usual when I was lowered to the bottom, I swayed back and forth and began to sink under the poison. Father, alarmed that I did not make any noise, shouted, What's keeping you so still? To which he got no reply. Just as I was setting down against the side of the wall, I happened to catch a glimpse of the branch of a burr oak tree which leaned out over the mouth of the shaft. This suddenly awakened me, and to father's excited shouting I feebly murmured, Take me out! But when he began to hoist, he found I was not in the bucket, and in wild alarm shouted, Get in! Get in the bucket and hold on! Hold on! Somehow I managed to get into the bucket, and that is all I remembered until I was dragged out, violently gasping for breath. One of our near neighbors, a stonemason and miner by the name of William Duncan, came to see me, and after hearing the particulars of the accident, he solemnly said, Well, Johnny, it's God's mercy that you're alive. Many a companion of mine have I seen dead with choke damp, but none that I ever saw or heard of was so near to death in it as you were, and escaped without help. Mr. Duncan taught father to throw water down the shaft to absorb the gas, and also to drop a bundle of brush or hay attached to a light rope, dropping it again and again to carry down pure air and stir up the poison. When, after a day or two, I had recovered from the shock, father lowered me again to my work, after taking the precaution to test the air with a candle and stir it up well with a brush and hay bundle. The weary hammer and chisel chipping went on as before, only more slowly, until ninety feet down when I at last struck a fine hardy gush of water. Constant dropping wears away stone, so does constant chipping, while at the same time wearing away the chipper. End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Todd. Section 51 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org. The United States, Volume 2, Part 7. The Mexican War. Historical Note. In 1821, Mexico became independent of Spain and forthwith invited immigration. During the first half of the 19th century, more than 20,000 people from the United States accepted this invitation and settled in Texas, the northern province of Mexico. They found Mexican law and treatment unsatisfactory, and in 1836 these Texans fought their way to freedom, founded the Republic of Texas, and asked to join the Union as a state. As slavery existed in Texas, the anti-slavery party objected to its admission, and there was a long delay. At length, the pro-slavery party triumphed, and in 1845, Texas was admitted. Mexico not only refused to acknowledge the independence of Texas, but also declared that in any case, the river Nueces was her own northern boundary, while Texas claimed to be bounded by the Rio Grande. The disputed territory was occupied by an American army, and when the Mexicans attempted to drive it out, the United States formally declared war. General Taylor invaded northern Mexico and won battle after battle along the Rio Grande. Kearney took possession of New Mexico and Arizona, and Fremont occupied California. The main army under General Winfield Scott landed at Veracruz, and after several hard-fought battles against superior forces, captured the city of Mexico. This ended the war. By the Treaty of Peace, the United States gained a territory equal in extent to the combined areas of Germany, France, and Spain. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 52. 
Remember the Alamo by Cyrus Townsend Brady. The Alamo is an ancient Spanish mission in the present city of San Antonio. Here in 1836, during the Texas struggle for freedom, a band of 180 Americans and Texans, including David Crockett, the famous scout, and James Bowie, inventor of the Bowie knife, were attacked by a Mexican army under General Santa Anna. The Editor On the 23rd of February, 1836, Santa Anna in person appeared before the fort with the advance of his army and demanded its surrender. He had led some 5,000 men of the Mexican regular army, with many camp followers and women, a forced march of 180 leagues from Monclova to San Antonio, across a desert country in the depth of a Texas winter, with its extremes of heat and cold and blasting storm. Only after incredible hardships and great losses had the terrible march been completed. That Santa Anna could do this is no small evidence of his capacity as a leader, and his ability to inspire his men to heroic action. His arrival was a complete surprise to the Texans. Many of them were scattered through the town at a fandango at the time. When the alarm was given, they repaired to the Alamo, and Travis met the demand for a surrender by a shot from his battery, at the same time hoisting his flag. This was the white, red, and green banner of the Mexican Republic, with two stars, Texas Coahuila, in the center in place of the familiar eagle and serpent. The lone star flag had not then been adopted. Santa Anna displayed a red ensign, signifying that no quarter would be given, and began erecting batteries with which he opened fire, the Texans replying with good effect. The Mexicans, while greatly outnumbering the garrison, were not yet in sufficient force completely to invest the works, although their numbers were increasing as the different regiments followed the advance guard, and the Texans might easily have escaped. Travis, however, had no thought of retreating. Not he. He immediately dispatched the following appeal for assistance. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world. Commandancy of the Alamo. Bear, February 24th, 1836. Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment for twenty-four hours and have not lost a man. The enemy have demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison is to be put to the sword if the place is taken. I have answered the summons with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call upon you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and of everything dear to the American character, to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy are receiving reinforcements daily, and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. Though this call may be neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. W. Barrett Travis, Lieutenant Colonel, Commanding. P.S. The Lord is on our side. When the army appeared in sight, we had not three bushels of corn. We have since found in deserted houses eighty or ninety bushels and got into the walls twenty or thirty beeves. Brave Travis. Other ringing sentences from his subsequent letters are worth quoting. I shall continue to hold the Alamo until I get relief from my countrymen, or I perish in its defense. Take care of my little boy. If the country should be saved, I may make him a splendid fortune. But if the country should be lost and I should perish, he would have nothing but the proud recollection that he is the son of a man who died for his country. The thought of that little boy adds a touch of pathos to the story of the dauntless cavalier and his devoted band facing fearful odds for liberty and honor, God and Texas, victory or death. Travis also dispatched messengers invoking assistance from adjacent garrisons. Colonel James Butler Bonham, a young South Carolina volunteer, broke through the Mexican lines and rode post-haste to Colonel Fannin at Goliad, some two hundred miles to the southeast. Fennin promptly started out with three hundred men and four guns. But his ammunition wagons broke down, his transportation failed him, his provisions gave out, he could not get his artillery over the rivers, and he was reluctantly forced to turn back. He tried in vain to keep Bonham with him. 
"'I will report to Travis or die in the attempt,' returned the chivalric Carolinian, who had been a schoolboy friend of Travis, as he started back to the fort. At one o'clock in the morning of March 3rd, he succeeded in reaching the fort through the beleaguering army, after a long and dangerous ride, in which he literally took his life in his hands. So far as anyone could see, he came back to certain death with his friends. Honor to him. Travis had received a valuable reinforcement of thirty-two heroic fellows from Gonzales, who dashed through the lines on horses, cutting their way into the Alamo at three in the morning of March 1st. Captain J. W. Smith led them, and they came cheerfully, although they divined what their fate would be if the place was stormed. For eleven days, the siege continued. The Mexicans lost heavily whenever they came within rifle range. On one occasion they tried to bridge the aqueduct, and thirty of them were instantly killed. Sorties were made by the besieged at first, but were soon given over. The bombardment of the works was continuous, but strange to say, no Texan was killed, although the whole garrison was completely worn out by the strain of ceaseless watching and continual fighting. There is no question but they could have cut their way out and escaped at almost any time, but no one dreamed of such a thing. They were there to stay until the end, whatever it might be. Santa Anna would undoubtedly get the fort eventually. Well, he might have it by paying the price. So they reasoned. But that price would be one, in the words of a later revolutionist, that would stagger humanity. Knowing Santa Anna, they could have no doubt of his intentions toward them, especially as he had made no secret of his purpose to put them all to death, unless they surrendered at discretion. The calm courage with which they face this appalling certainty is as noteworthy as the high heroism of their last defense. The last of Santa Anna's army arrived at Bear on the 2nd of March. He allowed them three days for recuperation, and on the 5th held a council of war to decide upon the course to be pursued. The council, like every other, was divided, with a preponderance of opinion in favor of waiting for siege guns to breach or batter down the walls. Santa Anna, however, determined upon an immediate assault, to be delivered at daybreak the next morning. Twenty-five hundred picked men in four columns, commanded respectively by General Duque, Romero, and Morales, were detailed to make the attack. They were provided with scaling ladders, axes, and crowbars in addition to their weapons, and the cavalry of the army was disposed at strategic points to prevent escape, should any of the hundred and eighty defenders succeed in breaking through the assaulting columns. Or possibly their function was to cut down any panic-stricken Mexican who might wish to withdraw from before the death-dealing Texas rifles. Colonel Duque was to lead the main assault on the north side while a simultaneous attack was to be made on the east and west sides, and at the redoubt covering the sally port from the convent yard. No attack appears to have been contemplated on the stockade on the south wall at first. Accounts of what happened differ widely. It is to be remembered that no American lived to tell the tale, and it is hard to get at the absolute truth from Mexican testimony and the frightened recollections of two dazed women and two servants. Each narrator must build his own account by considering all the testimony and weighing the evidence. This that follows seems to me to be what happened. About four o'clock on Sunday morning, March 6th, the notes of a bugle calling the Mexican troops to arms rang over the quiet plain, across which the first gray light, precursor of the dawn, was already stealing. Bugles all about caught up the shrill refrain, Lights appeared in the circling camps, the trampling feet of hurrying men, neighing of the horses, all apprised the weary garrison that the moment they had expected was at hand. They were instantly assembled. What happened as they fell in on the plaza before they went to their several stations? Tradition has it that Travis paraded them, briefly addressed them, pointed out their certain fate, as he had sworn never to surrender and bade any who desired to do so to leave him freely and escape while there was yet time. Not a man availed himself of the permission. "'We will stay and die with you,' they cried unanimously, as they repaired to their stations on the outer wall. Cool, calm, and resolute, they waited the breaking of the battle-storm. 
undaunted by the prospect, unshaken by the fearful odds before them. America has produced no better soldiers. Even the dozen sick men in the long room of the hospital with buoy were provided with arms, of which fortunately they had a good supply, and they too shared the same heroic resolution. Ill and well were equally determined. It was early morning when all the dispositions were made on both sides, and the day was breaking clear, cool, and beautiful, a sweet day indeed in which to die for home and country and liberty in the great cause of human freedom. So they may have thought as they looked towards the eastward light for the last time. The quiet watchers on the walls presently detected movements in the dark rank of the besiegers. They were coming then. Music, too, was there. All the bands of the Mexican army stationed with Santa Anna on the battery in front of the plaza were playing a ghastly air called De Guello, Cutthroat. That and the red flag, speaking of no quarter, pointed out a deadly purpose. Well, the Texans needed none of these things to nerve their arms. Rifles were lifted and sighted. The lock strings of the carefully pointed cannon were tightened. They could not afford to throw away any shots. There was no hurry, no confusion. The Mexicans were nearer now. The bugles rang charge. The close-ordered ranks broke into a run. From the east, the west, the north they came, cheering and yelling madly. A shot burst from the plaza. The crack of the rifles broke on the air. A fusillade ran along the walls on every side. The cannon roared out, hurling into the faces of the Mexicans bags filled with hideous missiles. The advancing lines hesitated, paused, halted, fled. The first assault was beaten off. The ground was covered with dead and wounded. Comparative stillness supervened. Well done, brave Texans. Look to your arms again. Snatch a cup of water. Enjoy your moment of respite. They are coming again. The east and west columns had been driven to the north. Colonel Duquet, gallant soul, reformed them on his own brigade. There was a small breach in the north wall. He hurled the mass at it, himself in the lead. The Americans ran to the point threatened, again the withering rifle fire. Duquet fell, desperately wounded. Mortal man could not face that deadly discharge. The soldiers gave way once more, repulsed a second time. Would they dare come on again? Far off on the east side, the roar of battle still surged around the redoubt covering the convent yard. How went the battle there, thought the triumphant defenders of the plaza, as they gazed on their flying foemen. It was a critical moment for the Mexicans. Santa Anna recognized it, and galloped on the field, leading a reinforcement. He noted that the west wall had been denuded of most of its defenders, and with soldierly decision threw his fresh troops against it, leading them in person, some accounts say. Oh, for a thousand brave hearts and true to man the long lines! The hundred and eighty could not be everywhere. The few at the point of impact died, and the Mexicans entered the plaza at last. At the same time, the officers drove the men up to the third assault on the north wall. Under the eye of Santa Anna, they advanced for a last desperate attempt. Honor to those Mexicans for their bravery, too. In this attack, a bullet pierces Travis's brain. The little boy has only the heritage of an honored and heroic name, then. He falls dead on the trail of a cannon. Bonham is killed serving a gun. The north wall is taken. The redoubt to the east is gained. The stockade is attacked. Other soldiers swarm up to the south wall, break through the gate. They come in on every side. The Texans are surrounded by fire and steel. Some of them run back while there is yet time, and rally in the convent where Bowie lies. Others follow Crockett, now in chief command, to the church to die with him there. The whole Mexican army is upon them now, the nine score against the five thousand at last. The old convent is divided into little cell-like rooms, each with a door opening into the yard or plaza but with no connection between the rooms. A few Texans hold each chamber, and into each smoke-filled enclosure the infuriated troops pour their gunfire and then rush the rooms to writhe and struggle over the bloody pavements until all the defenders are killed. No quarter, indeed. What of the invalids in the hospital fighting from their beds? 
Forty Mexicans fall dead before the door of the long room, before they think to bring a cannon and blow the defenders into eternity. Bowie lies alone in his room, waiting with grim resolution for what is coming, pain from injuries forgotten, fevered pulse beating higher. His bed is covered with pistols, and near his hand lies his trusty knife. A brown, fierce face peers in the door. Another and another. The room is filled with smoke. Yells and curses and groans rise from the floor, where a trail of stricken soldiers reaches from the door to the bedside. And one bolder than his fellows lies on Bowie's breast with that awful American knife buried deep in his heart. And Bowie has died as he had lived, sword in hand. The only fight left now is in the churchyard. A little handful, bloody, powder-stained, desperate, are backed up against the wall. It is hand-to-hand -hand work now on both sides, no time to reload, bayonet thrust against rifle butt in berserker fury. Hope is lost, but they are dying in high fashion, faces to the foe, striking while they have a heartbeat left. Fire the magazine, says Crockett to Major Evans, the only remaining officer. The man runs towards the church where the powder is stored and is stricken down on the threshold. The Mexicans rush upon Crockett and his remnant. The keen death-dealing Betsy has spoken for the last time. The old frontiersman has clasped it by the barrel now. Swinging this iron war club, he stands at bay, disdaining surrender. The Mexicans are piled before him in heaps. But numbers tell. They swarm about him. They leap upon him like hounds upon a great stag. They pull him down, bury their bayonets in his great heart, spurn him, trample upon him, spit upon him. So he makes a fine end. It is over. Gunner Walker, the last man in arms, is shot and stabbed, tossed aloft on bayonets, in fact. The flag is down. No one is left to defend it longer. Five wounded, helpless prisoners are dragged before Santa Anna, and at his command butchered where they lie or stand, some of the Mexican officers, to their credit be it said, vainly protesting. Six people who were in the fort at the beginning were left alive by the Mexicans. Two women, two children, and two servants. One a Negro slave, the other a Mexican. One hour. One short hour filled with such sublime struggle as has not been witnessed often in the brief compass of sixty minutes. The sun is shining. The plaza is filled with light, the light of morning, the light of heroic death of self-sacrifice absolute, and the day breaks, a day of eternal remembrance. Wherever men live to love the hero, these will not be forgotten. By the defense of that old deserted Spanish house of prayer, it was consecrated anew to the service of God, through the sufferings of men. Their sacrifice had not been in vain, for the cry that swept Texas to freedom, that drove the Mexican beyond the Rio Grande, was, Remember the Alamo. One scene remains of the splendid story. By Santa Anna's orders, the dead Texans, to the number of 182, were gathered together and arranged in a huge pyramid, a layer of wood, a layer of dead, and so on, and the torch applied. A not unfitting end. As the dead demigod of Homeric days was laid upon his funeral pyre, as the dead Viking of later time was burned with his ship, so these modern heroes... The wind scattered their ashes on the spot their defense had immortalized, and made it forever a hallowed ground. The hundred and eighty had done well. Each one had accounted for more than four of the enemy, for the Spanish casualties are estimated as between six hundred and a thousand, and most was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Texan-Americans had done their best and given their all. Honor to their valor and their courage. On the monument erected at the state capitol at Austin, to commemorate their unparalleled achievement, is graven this significant line. Thermopylae had its messenger of defeat. The Alamo had none. End of section 52section 53 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by The Story Girl The Importance of One Vote by W. H. Vale 
in DeKalb County, Indiana, when the election day arrived, there was a man who was in doubt whether to go to the mill or to the polls. Finally, after a certain amount of coaxing, he decided that he would exercise his right of franchise and vote. He voted the Democratic ticket, and a Democratic member of the legislature was elected from his district by a majority of only one vote. That legislature elected a United States senator, and by the vote of the one member from that district, Mr. Hannigan was chosen. Mr. Hannigan took his seat in the Senate and was president of the Senate pro tem when the vote was taken for the annexation of Texas. On the floor, the vote was a tie, and Mr. Hannigan's casting vote decided the question in favor of annexation. And this action brought on the Mexican War, which has so shaped the subsequent history of our country. This illustration certainly brings before us an extreme case. But who knows when another instance may occur proving the same value of one vote. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Section 54 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World Story, 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 54. The Storming of Chapel Tepec. 1847, by James Barnes. When General Scott arrived before the city of Mexico with his little army, he found the city defended by a double line of fortifications strengthened by lakes and marshes. On August the 20th, the outer works were carried by four desperate assaults. After a futile endeavour to arrange terms of peace, the forts of Molino del Rey were stormed and captured in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle, and nothing remained to carry but the almost impregnable castle of Chapel Tepec, the editor. There was no sleep that night for the general or his staff. They had taken the first step to Chapel Tepec. They were on the lower stair, but they would have to fight their way to the very top, and if this day's battle was an earnest of the one that was to follow, there would be between five and six thousand men only left him to enter a city that had comprised among its population nearly eighty thousand men of fighting age. Whether the city would resist his entering, if Chapel Tepec should fall, he could not tell. He was led to suppose it would not. At all events, there was no time to hesitate. Action was necessary. Scott said to one of his officers, if I had ten times the number of men that I now have, I could use them, so every man must fight as if he was ten himself. And that is exactly what they did. By all rules of the game of war that were ever printed, written, or learned, Scott was defeated and repulsed. In fact, he should have been annihilated, if not at Molino del Rey, the first thing on the following morning after this costly victory. The Mexicans might have poured out like an avalanche from the cliffs above and swept the little blue-coated army out of existence, but such a thought never entered the American private's mind. The general had carried him through tight places before, and he would do it again. There was nothing to prevent him entering the city proper at this very minute. All he had to do was to batter down one of the gates and rush through into the streets that were filled with the terror-stricken inhabitants. But with Chapel Tepec in the Mexicans' hands, his sojourn in Mexico would have been short. He might have entered, but he would never have left again. It was necessary to pause before delivering the final attack. Scott determined to divert attention by pretending that the city was his destination. So on the 12th of September, a battery, well supported, 
was sent forward to begin hammering at the gate. Four large batteries were planted within easy distance of the castle walls, with orders to begin firing as soon as daylight was sufficient for ranges to be found. Long before the sun had shone above the horizon, the grim, grey dawn was saluted by the red gashes of flame from the cannon's mouths. The shells raising their fiery arches from the burning fuses, the thundering discharges of the Mexican guns that soon replied, almost shook the solid rock. From daylight till it was pitch dark, the artillery duel went on. The Mexicans, though firing from above, displayed, luckily, little accuracy, and the American gunners soon got the range to a dot, and hardly a shot went wild. By nightfall it was evident the fortress was severely shaken, and by the morning of the 13th the storming party were in position. The plan was to advance in two columns. Pillow was to come forward from the west, and Quitman from the southeast. Ahead of the main columns on each side were 250 picked men. Worth's division was to act as a reserve, and Twiggs was to keep up his attack on the gates of the city. The Mexicans had mined the first line of defences, and it was the intention to blow up the Americans if they should ever cross the ramparts, but so keen were the troops, and so swift was the advance, that the picked vanguard reached the first wall and surmounted it alone. They shot down the men who had been left to fire the mines, and were stamping out some of the burning fire trains that led to them as the main division, shouting and cheering, came tumbling over the escarpment. The firing now broke out all along the surface of the hill. Here and there little bands of five or six men could be seen, climbing along like goats, helping with hand and shoulder their comrades above and beneath them. Resistlessly they pushed up, the Mexicans watching from the cathedral spires and the city walls saw the star and stripes, flag after flag, appear as point after point was taken. But for some time from the topmost pinnacle floated the Mexican banner, and then at last it waved, fluttered, and came down. A detachment of the New York Volunteers, led by Lieutenant Reed, and another of the Second Infantry, led by the brave Lieutenant Steele, were the first to gain the inner walls of the citadel. Young Steele was badly wounded, but with the assistance of two men on either side of him, he kept moving upward, and when at last he reached the top, it was his own hand that lowered the last Mexican banner. As its folds fluttered about him, he fell fainting to the ground. Scott, with great difficulty owing to his tremendous size and weight, at last reached the crest and saw the retreating Mexicans streaming away on all sides, and hanging on their flanks pursuing them were bodies of American troops, mad with the desire to kill and to have revenge for the slaughter of their comrades at Molino del Rey. Scott sent orders, ordering the recall of the pursuers. To those about him he raised his voice, almost in supplication, Be humane and generous, my boys, as you are victorious, and I will get down on my bended knee to God for you tonight. It was a long time, however, before the officers could call off their men from the pursuit. The hillsides and plain and the meadow beyond were crowded with dead and wounded Mexicans. In the afternoon a small battery was carried before the gates, and at four o'clock on the next morning, September the 14th, a deputation from the city council waited upon General Scott and informed him that the government and all the troops had fled from the capital, and that the citizens themselves wished to surrender the city. Scott refused to sign any capitulation, claiming that the city was already in his possession, and about daylight Worth and Quitman advanced, and, practically unmolested, reached the great plaza and hoisted the colours of the United States on the National Palace. There was some rioting that lasted twenty-four hours, for many soldiers had thrown aside their uniforms, and joining the liberated convicts, carried on desultory firing from the housetops. But with the assistance of the municipal authorities, 
who apparently were glad to see the American army in possession, they were at last driven out and punished. Guards were posted everywhere, and within four days the city was tranquil and cheerful, and the American soldiers everywhere winning their way, not now by force of arms, but by strict maintenance of law and order, and by the magnanimity of their conduct. End of section 54 This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The United States, Volume 2, Part 8 California Historical Note the Spaniards first visited California in 1533, and a few years later some little exploring was done under Caprillo. Sir Francis Drake came to the country in 1579 and named it New Albion. Two hundred years later, the erection of missions by the Franciscan monks began. The Indians were taught Christianity and also how to carry on farming and to live in settled communities. In 1826, American immigration from the East took place. After 1840, it was plain that California would eventually become independent of Mexico, and the question of future government arose. Some of the settlers thought it would be best to establish a British protectorate. Others favored annexation to the United States. John C. Fremont, the Pathfinder, headed an exploring expedition to California, and in 1846, with the aid of some of the inhabitants, he seized the town of Sonoma and proclaimed the independence of the country. This was just at the outbreak of the Mexican War, and by orders from the United States government, other parts of the country were seized, so that when General Kearney made his way thither after capturing Santa Fe, the conquest was already nearly completed. In August 1846, California was made a territory of the United States. The discovery of gold in 1848 aroused in all parts of the world a frantic immigration to the western coast. It is estimated that 100,000 persons came during the first year. In 1850, California was admitted to the Union as a state. End of section 55. This recording is in the public domain. Section 56 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 56. When the English Discovered California, 1577-1579, to by Edward Everett Hale. In 1577, Sir Francis Drake set out on a voyage to America. He rounded Cape Horn and sailed fearlessly up the western coast of the continent, sacking a Spanish town or capturing a Spanish treasure ship now and then by way of pastime. He went to the north, hoping to find a passage to the Atlantic, but was driven back by the intense cold. At either the harbor of San Francisco or some bay not far from there, he stopped to refit his ships and then crossed the Pacific on his homeward voyage. The Editor the day after they entered this harbor, an Indian came out to them in a canoe. He made tokens of respect and submission. He threw into the ship a little basket made of rushes containing an herb called toba. Drake wished to recompense him, but he would take nothing but a hat which was thrown into the water. The company of the pelican supposed then and always that the natives considered and reverenced them as gods. In preparation for repairing the ship, Drake landed his stores. A large company of Indians approached as he landed, and friendly relations were maintained between them and the Englishmen during the whole of their stay. Drake received them cautiously but kindly. He set up tents and built a fort for his defense. The natives, watching the English with amazement, still regarded them as gods. One is tempted to connect this superstition with the direct claim which Alarcon had made of a divine origin in presence of these tribes a generation before, though at a point five hundred miles away. Fletcher's description of their houses is precisely like the Spaniard's account of the winter houses of the tribes he met. Quote, Those houses are digged round within the earth, 
and have from the uppermost brims of the circle clefts of wood set up and joined close together at the top like our spires on the steeple of a church which being covered with earth suffer no water to enter and are very warm the door in the most part of them performs the office also of a chimney to let out the smoke it's made in bigness and fashion like to an ordinary scuttle in a ship and standing slopewise at the end of two days an immense assembly called together from all parts of the country gathered to see the strangers they brought with them feathers and bags of tobacco for presents or for sacrifices arrived at the top of the hill their chief made a long address wearying his english hearers and himself when he had concluded the rest bowing their bodies in a dreamy manner quote unquote, and long producing of the same cried oh giving their consent to all that had been spoken this reminds one of the who of the indians of the tison the women meanwhile tore their cheeks with their nails and flung themselves on the ground as if for a personal bloody sacrifice drake met this worship not as alarson had done but by calling his company to prayer the men lifted their eyes and hands to heaven to signify that god was above and besought god quote, to open their blinded eyes to the knowledge of him and of jesus christ the salvation of the gentiles end quote through these prayers the singing of psalms and reading certain chapters of the bible fletcher who was the chaplain says they sat very attentively they observed every pause and cried oh with one voice greatly enjoying our exercises they thus showed a more catholic spirit than the whites had shown who were wearied by the length of the address of the savages drake made them presents which at the departure of the english they returned saying that they were sufficiently rewarded by their visit the fame of this visit extended so far that at the end of three days more on the twenty sixth of june a larger company assembled this time the king himself with a bodyguard of one hundred warriors was with them they called him their hioch he approached the english preceded by a mace-bearer who carried two feather crowns with three chains of bone of marvellous length often doubled such chains were of the highest estimation and only a few persons were permitted to wear them the number of chains indeed marked the rank of the highest nobility some of whom wore as many as twenty next to the mace-bearer came the king himself on his head was a knit crown somewhat like those which were borne before him he wore a coat of the skins of conies coming to his waist his guards wore similar coats and some of them wore coals upon their heads covered with a certain vegetable down almost sacred and used only by the highest ranks the common people followed naked but with feathers every one pleasing himself with his own device the last part of the company were women and children each woman brought a well-made basket of rushes some of these were so tight that they would hold water they were adorned with pearl shells and with bits of the bone chains in the baskets they had bags of tobah and roots called petah which they ate cooked or raw drake meanwhile held his men in military array the mace-bearer then pronounced a long speech which was dictated to him in a low voice by another all parties except the children approached the fort and the mace-bearer began a song with a dance to the time in which all the men joined the women danced without singing drake saw that they were peaceable and permitted them to enter his palisade the women showed signs of the wounds which they had made before coming by way of preparing for the solemnity at the request of the chief drake then sat down the king and others made to him several orations or quote, indeed supplications that he would take province and kingdom into his hand and become their king and patron end quote. with one consent they sang a song placed one of the crowns upon his head hung their chains upon his neck and honoured him as their hyo drake did not think he should refuse this gift quote, in the name and to the use of queen elizabeth he took the sceptre crown and dignity of the country into his hand end quote he only wished says the historian that he could as easily transport the riches and treasures wherewith in the upland it abounds to the enriching of her kingdom at home had drake had any real knowledge of the golden gravel over which the streams of the upland flowed 
it may well be that the history of California would have been changed. From this time, through several weeks, while Drake remained there, the multitude also remained. At first they brought offerings every three days as sacrifices, until they learned that this displeases their English king. Like other sovereigns who have had much to do with this race, he found that he had to feed his red retainers, but he had muscles, seals, quote unquote, and such like, in quantity sufficient for their rations. Drake made a journey into the country. He saw, quote unquote, infinite company of fat deer in a herd of thousands. He found a multitude of strange, quote unquote, conies in large numbers, with long tails and with a bag under the chin in which to carry food either for future supply or for their children. Drake erected on the shore a post, on which he placed a plate of brass. Here he engraved the queen's name, the date of his landing, the gift of the country by the people, and left her majesty's portrait and arms. The last were not designed by his artists, as some historians have carelessly supposed, but were on a silver piece of sixpence, quote, showing through a hole made of purpose in the plate, end quote. When the people saw that Drake could not remain, they could not conceal their grief. At last they stole on the English unawares with a sacrifice which, quote-unquote, they set on fire, thus burning a chain and bunch of feathers. The English could not dissuade them till they fell to prayers and singing of psalms, when the sad natives let their fire go out, and left the sacrifice unconsumed. On the 23rd of July the friends parted, the English for the shores of Asia, the savages to the hills, where they built fires as long as the pelican was in sight. Thus did England take possession of the region which, after near three hundred years, proved to be the richest gold-bearing country in the world. Drake gave to the country the name of New Albion, and it bore that name on the maps for centuries. End of section 56section fifty seven of the united states this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by colleen mcmahon the world's story volume thirteen the united states edited by eva march tappan section fifty seven on the california coast in the thirties by richard henry dana jr when Richard Henry Dana, Jr. was a student at Harvard, his eyes became so seriously affected that it was necessary for him to leave college for a time. A trip abroad was planned for him, but he preferred to make a voyage to California by way of Cape Horn in the capacity of a sailor. His notebook developed into the famous Two Years Before the Mast, from which the following extract is taken. The Editor we were turned to early and began taking off the hatches, overhauling the cargo, and getting everything ready for inspection. At eight, the officers of the customs, five in number, came on board and began examining the cargo, manifest, etc. The Mexican revenue laws are very strict and require the whole cargo to be landed, examined, and taken on board again. But our agent had succeeded in compounding for the last two vessels and saving the trouble of taking the cargo ashore. The officers were dressed in the costume which we found prevailed through the country, broad-brimmed hat, usually of a black or dark brown color, with a gilt or figured band round the crown, and lined under the rim with silk, a short jacket of silk or figured calico, the European skirted coat is never worn, the shirt open in the neck, rich waistcoat if any, pantaloons open at the sides below the knees, laced with gilt, usually of velveteen or broadcloth or else short breeches and white stockings. They wear the deerskin shoe, which is of a dark brown color, and, being made by Indians, usually a good deal ornamented. They have no suspenders, but always wear a sash round the waist, which is generally red, and varying in quality with the means of the wearer. Add to this the never-failing poncho, or the serapa, and you have the dress of the Californian. This last garment is always a mark of the rank and wealth of the owner. The gente de raison, or better sort of people, wear cloaks of black or dark blue broadcloth, with as much velvet and trimmings as may be, and from this they go down to the blanket of the Indian, the middle classes wearing a poncho, something like a large square cloth with a hole in the middle for the head to go through. This is often as coarse as a blanket, 
but being beautifully woven with various colors, is quite showy at a distance. Among the Mexicans there's no working class, the Indians being practically serfs and doing all the hard work, and every rich man looks like a grandee, and every poor scamp like a broken-down gentleman. I have often seen a man with a fine figure and courteous manners, dressed in broadcloth and velvet, with a noble horse, completely covered with trappings, without a real in his pockets, and absolutely suffering for something to eat. The next day, the cargo having been entered in due form, we began trading. The trade room was fitted up in the steerage, and furnished out with the lighter goods, and with specimens of the rest of the cargo. And Mellis, a young man who came out from Boston with us before the mast, was taken out of the forecastle and made supercargo's clerk. He was well qualified for this business, having been clerk in a counting house in Boston, but he had been troubled for some time with rheumatism, which unfitted him for the wet and exposed duty of a sailor on the coast. For a week or ten days all was life on board. The people came to look and to buy, men, women, and children, and we were continually going in the boats carrying goods and passengers, for they have no boats of their own. Everything must dress itself and come aboard and see the new vessel, if it were only to buy a paper of pins. The agent and his clerk managed the sails while we were busy in the hold or in the boats. Our cargo was an assorted one, that is, it consisted of everything under the sun. We had spirits of all kinds sold by the cask, teas, coffee, sugars, spices, raisins, molasses, hardware, crockery ware, tinware, cutlery, clothing of all kinds, boots and shoes from Lynn, calicoes and cotton from Lowell, crepes, silks, also shawls, scarfs, necklaces, jewelry and combs for the women, furniture, and in fact everything that can be imagined, from Chinese fireworks to English cartwheels, of which we had a dozen pairs with their iron tires on. The Californians are an idle, thriftless people, and can make nothing for themselves. The country abounds in grapes, yet they buy, at a great price, bad wine made in Boston, and brought round by us, and retail it among themselves at a real, twelve and a half cents, by the small wine glass. Their hides, too, which they value at two dollars in money, they barter for something which costs seventy-five cents in Boston, and buy shoes, as like as not, made of their own hides which have been carried twice round Cape Horn, at three and four dollars, and chicken skin boots at fifteen dollars a pair. Things sell, on an average, at an advance of nearly 300% upon the Boston prices. This is partly owing to the heavy duties, which the government, in its wisdom, with an idea, no doubt, of keeping the silver in the country, has laid upon imports. These duties, and the enormous expenses of so long a voyage, keep all merchants but those of heavy capital from engaging in the trade. Nearly two-thirds of all the articles imported into the country from round Cape Horn for the last six years have been by the single house of Bryant, Sturgis, and Company, to whom our vessel belonged. This kind of business was new to us, and we liked it very well for a few days, though we were hard at work every minute from daylight to dark, and sometimes even later. By being thus continually engaged in transporting passengers with their goods to and fro, we gained considerable knowledge of the character, dress, and language of the people. The dress of the men was as I have before described it. The women wore gowns of various texture, silks, crepe, calico, etc., made after the European style, except that the sleeves were short, leaving the arm bare, and that they were loose about the waist, corsets not being in use. They wore shoes of kid or satin, sashes or belts of bright colors, and almost always a necklace and earrings. Bonnets they had none. I saw only one on the coast, and that belonged to the wife of an American sea captain who had settled in San Diego and had imported the chaotic mass of straw and ribbon as a choice present to his new wife. They wear their hair, which is almost invariably black or a very dark brown, long in their necks, sometimes loose, and sometimes in long braids, though the married women often do it up on a high comb. Their only protection against the sun and the weather is a large mantle which they put over their heads, drawing it close round their faces when they go out of doors, which is generally only in pleasant weather. When in the house, or sitting out in front of it, which they often do in fine weather, they usually wear a small scarf or neckerchief of a rich pattern. A band also about the top of the head, with a cross, star, or other ornament, is common. Their complexions are various, depending, as well as their dress and manner, upon the amount of Spanish blood they can lay claim to, which also settles their social rank. Those who are of pure Spanish blood 
having never intermarried with the aborigines have clear brunette complexions and sometimes even as fair as those of english women there are but few of these families in california being mostly those in official stations or who on the expiration of their terms of office have settled here upon property they have acquired and others who have been banished for state offenses these form the upper class intermarrying and keeping up an exclusive system in every respect they can be distinguished not only by their complexion dress and manners but also by their speech for calling themselves castilians they are very ambitious of speaking the pure castilian while all spanish is spoken in a somewhat corrupted dialect by the lower classes from this upper class they go down by regular shades growing more and more dark and muddy until you come to the pure indian who runs about with nothing upon him but a small piece of cloth kept up by a wide leather strap drawn round his waist generally speaking each person's caste is decided by the quality of the blood which shows itself too plainly to be concealed at first sight yet the least drop of spanish blood if it be only of quadroon or octoroon is sufficient to raise one from the position of a serf and entitle him to wear a suit of clothes boots hat cloak spurs long knife all complete though coarse and dirty as may be and to call himself espanol and to hold property if he can get any the fondness for dress among the women is excessive and is sometimes their ruin a present of a fine mantle or of a necklace or pair of earrings gains the favor of the greater part nothing is more common than to see a woman living in a house of only two rooms with the ground for a floor dressed in spangled satin shoes silk gown high comb and gilt if not gold earrings and necklace if their husbands do not dress them well enough they will soon receive presents from others they used to spend whole days on board our vessel examining the fine clothes and ornaments and frequently making purchases at a rate which have made a seamstress or a waiting maid in boston open her eyes next to the love of dress i was most struck with the fineness of the voices and beauty of the intonations of both sexes every common ruffian-looking fellow with a slouched hat blanket cloak dirty underdress and soiled leather leggings appeared to me to be speaking elegant spanish it was a pleasure simply to listen to the sound of the language before i could attach any meaning to it they have a good deal of the creole drawl but it is varied by an occasional extreme rapidity of utterance in which they seem to skip from consonant to consonant until lighting upon a broad open vowel they rest upon that to restore the balance of sound the women carry this peculiarity of speaking to a much greater extreme than the men who have more evenness and stateliness of utterance a common bullock driver on horseback delivering a message seemed to speak like an ambassador at a royal audience in fact they sometimes appeared to me to be a people on whom a curse had fallen and stripped them of everything but their pride their manners and their voices another thing that surprised me was the quantity of silver in circulation i never in my life saw so much silver at one time as during the week that we were at monterey the truth is they have no credit system no banks and no way of investing money but in cattle besides silver they have no circulating medium but hides which the sailors call california banknotes everything that they buy they must pay for by one or the other of these means the hides they bring down dried and doubled in clumsy ox carts or upon mules backs and the money they carry tied up in a handkerchief fifty or a hundred dollars and half dollars monterey as far as my observation goes is decidedly the pleasantest and most civilized looking place in california in the center of it is an open square surrounded by four lines of one-story buildings with half a dozen cannon in the center some mounted and others not this is the presidio or fort every town has a presidio in its center or rather every presidio has a town built round it for the forts were first built by the mexican government and then the people built near them for protection the presidio here was entirely open and unfortified there were several officers with long titles and about eighty soldiers but they were poorly paid fed clothed and disciplined the governor-general or as he is commonly called the general lives here which makes it the seat of government he is appointed by the central government at mexico and is the chief civil and military officer in addition to him each town has a commandant who is its chief officer 
and has charge of the fort and of all transactions with foreigners and foreign vessels, while two or three alcaldes and corregidores elected by the inhabitants are the civil officers. Courts strictly of law with a system of jurisprudence they have not. Small municipal matters are regulated by the alcaldes and corregidores, and everything relating to the general government, to the military, and to foreigners, by the commandants, acting under the governor-general. Capital cases are decided by the latter upon personal inspection, if near, or upon minutes sent him by the proper officers, if the offender is at a distant place. No Protestant has any political rights, nor can he hold property, or, indeed, remain more than a few weeks on shore, unless he belong to a foreign vessel. Consequently, Americans and English who intend to reside here become papists, the current phrase among them being, a man must leave his conscience at Cape Horn. But to return to Monterey, the houses here, as everywhere else in California, are of one story, built of adobes, that is, clay made into large bricks about a foot and a half square, and three or four inches thick, and hardened in the sun. These are joined together by a cement of the same material, and the whole are of a common dirt color. The floors are generally of earth, the windows grated and without glass, and the doors, which are seldom shut, open directly into the common room, there being no entries. Some of the more wealthy inhabitants have glass to their windows and board floors, and in Monterey nearly all the houses are whitewashed on the outside. The better houses, too, have red tiles upon the roofs. The common houses have two or three rooms which open into each other, and are furnished with a bed or two, a few chairs and tables, a looking-glass, a crucifix, and small daubs of paintings enclosed in glass, representing some miracle or martyrdom. They have no chimneys or fireplaces in the houses, the climate being such as to make a fire unnecessary, and all their cooking is done in a small kitchen separated from the house. The Indians, as I have said before, do all the hard work, two or three being attached to the better houses, and the poorest persons are able to keep one at least, for they have only to feed them and give them a small piece of coarse cloth and a belt for the men, and a coarse gown without shoes or stockings for the women. In Monterey there are a number of English and Americans, English or Ingles, all are called who speak the English language, who have married Californians, become united to the Roman Church, and acquired considerable property. Having more industry, frugality, and enterprise than the natives, they soon get nearly all the trade into their hands. They usually keep shops, in which they retail the goods purchased in larger quantities from our vessels, and also send a good deal into the interior, taking hides in pay, which they again barter with our ships. In every town on the coast there are foreigners engaged in this kind of trade, while I recollect but two shops kept by natives. The people are naturally suspicious of foreigners, and they would not be allowed to remain, were it not that they conform to the church, and by marrying natives and bringing up their children as Roman Catholics and Mexicans, and not teaching them the English language, they quiet suspicion, and even become popular and leading men. The chief alcaldes in Monterey and Santa Barbara were Yankees by birth. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon.